registration to receive your badge. It must be visibly worn at all times. And don't forget, you'll need it to ride the IO shuttles and to enter the after hours activities at the end of days one and two. Throughout the event, make sure to visit google.com slash IO or download the IO mobile app for the most up-to-date schedules and comments.
build you up when you think you're alone And no one picks up the phone for God's skin and bones Oh, oh yeah, I'll take you home Fill your body with chrome Build a castle to hold Cause you build me up you up when you think you're alone and no one picks up the phone for God's skin and bones oh, oh, oh yeah I'll take you home fill your body with chrome build a castle to hold cause you build me up oh, 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 oh and you never let go Hi everyone, my name is Alicia Pinko, and this is Alex Faborg, and we're user experience designers for virtual and augmented reality at Google. We're here to talk to you today about designing AR applications. So Google has a long history in designing for AR. We've been doing mobile AR for the past four years and working on other augmented reality projects before that. What's changed most recently is that mobile AR is really starting to take off. And Google's AR core makes it possible for anybody to create quality AR content. So I'll share some fun facts about AR core. 
The first thing is that we released 1.0 at the end of February, and that made AR content available to more than 100 million devices. And we're already seeing rapid growth with more than 300 apps already available in the Google Play Store. So you're here because you want to learn how to design for AR. And what we found is that once you understand your users and the type of experience you're trying to create, design principles for getting started fall into five different categories, which we call the pillars of AR design. First, you want to understand your user's environment. Where will the users be experiencing your app? Think about the surfaces that are available and how your app can adapt to different environmental constraints. Then you want to consider the user's movement and how much the space the user will need in order to experience your app. And when it comes to initialization and onboarding, you want to make the onboarding process as clear as possible so that users understand exactly what to do in this entirely new medium. When it comes to object interactions, design natural object interactions that convey the affordances and also the feedback so that users understand how these digital objects fit in the context of your real physical space. And when you're thinking about user interfaces, balance on-screen UI with volumetric inter interface design so that you're able to create an experience that is meaningful and usable for your users. So we have some examples that showcase the di different guidelines within each of these pillars. And the thing that we want to point out is that this framework can help anybody get started with AR content creation. So throughout our talk, we're going to show you some different demos that you'll be able to play with very soon through an app we're launching on the Google Play Store called AR Core Elements. And many of the core interaction patterns you'll see in this talk are already available in scene form or will be available for Unity later this summer. All right, so let's start out talking about the user's environment, the, the first pillar of AR design. So AR Core is a relatively new technology. So just to begin, let's talk about what AR Core can actually do. So it does lots of things. Um, I think the first thing that everyone's familiar with is surface plane detection, where it can understand surfaces, tables, floors, those types of things. It can also do walls, um, vertical surfaces. And then, of course, what's, what's better than horizontal and vertical surfaces? It can also do angled surfaces with oriented points, uh, being able to place an object um, on any, any angle. Air Core does light estimation. Uh, this is really important for having objects look realistic in a scene. Um, and there's also some other fun things you can do with that that we'll get into. And announced uh, just at I.O. yesterday, uh, Cloud Anchors, which is available now uh, for AR Core both on Android and also on iOS, which lets you do multiplayer experiences in AR with two people viewing the same thing. And also announced yesterday, Augmented Edges, the ability to recognize an image, but then also not just recognize it, but use that image to get 3D pose data off of it so you know where it is in space. So that's the, the current set of AR Core capabilities. And this is, of course, growing over time. And what we found is the more your app integrates with the user's environment, really the game. What we found is there's really no reason you have to use one surface. You could use and at moments when you have surfaces, those can be really kind of like breaking moments in your game where it feels very even something like say you're you know you're playing a, a physics based game and you just you know, castle or something and the bricks fall on moment when you see the items on the floor it can be can Um, we have fake plants uh, and one real plant, although I think it's t actually a real fake plant. Um, and we have uh, Unlit, uh, which is the most basic uh, we can do. Then dynamic bake.
flood invasions could be occurring in this area. Uh, you can see where we are right now. Uh, and especially as, as the scene gets darker, you start to see that the amount So it's really important that you're using the APIs that they are for. The other thing you can do is you can actually change something. In this example, uh, when you turn the, the light switch off in the room, this actually glows and it responds to that change. And this can really feel great and magical for users where you imagine you're playing you know, sort of a city simulation game um, and it's having these kind of you know, significant meaningful changes based off the environmental light. All right, oriented points. This is really a very of the more basic ones, I think this one is attaching Androids. Uh, and you can see that you can stick to exactly that point at the, the angle of where the branch is. Cloud Anchors uh, announced yesterday. Uh, here's an example of, of that being used. Uh, here, both players um, see the same game board in exactly the same place. Uh, um, really tremendous fun. You can actually box uh, if you want to stop by later today. Works with both Android. All right, augmented images. Uh, a lot of different ways you can use this um, demo that we have in the sandbox that you can go check out. Exhibit that was using augmented images. So we're really excited about what you can do if, with augmented images. And there's really lots of possibilities uh, from artwork to even something like you know, just having a, a toy uh, sort of come to life, um, you know, the surface of a, a product box, um, where you can you know, see sort of 3D models of, of what you're about to play with. All right, so now that we've gone over some sort of you know, basics on the core capabilities of AR Core, let's talk about um, how you'd actually start to design an app for AR. Uh, so one of the first things you're thinking is, OK, where do I actually start? You know, blank page. I'm ready to start having you know, brainstorming and, and you know, new ideas for AR. And one of the things I'd want you to first focus on is AR exists outside of the phone. So your design work should really exist outside of the phone as well. So uh, something I found with a lot of people have done you know, tremendous amounts of mobile design is they, they tend to be very attached to sort of the phone frame and sort of flows of screens. And you know, they've been doing that for, for so long that one of the first things you need to do when you're starting to think about AR is to actually you know, put away all of those you know, 2D UI stencils. Um, and don't really think about the phone at all. Instead, what you want to do is you want to sketch the actual environment that the user's in. So you should be sketching living rooms and, and tables and um, you know, outdoor spaces. And then as you sketch the user's environment, then you start to sketch you know, the various AR objects that they're going to be interacting with in that environment. Uh, in many ways, uh, you can sort of think of AR as uh, in many ways, uh, you can sort of think of AR as having a lot of the same challenges as responsive design uh, for the web in terms of different window sizes, but it's even more complicated because now you have responsive design for 3D spaces that are you know, the user's actual living room. So you want to sketch the user for scale to get a sense of um, how you're going to start crafting this experience. Uh, the user could be very large relative to the AR objects or very small. And then you want to start thinking about how that user is going to move around in that environment. And that brings us to user movement. So now that we understand how to design for the environment, let's think about how to design for user movement. And as Alex mentioned, it's completely OK to design beyond the bounds of the screen. And what we found is that in many ways, this can make the experience feel more delightful and even more immersive. Because when you have an object that begins on screen and also extends beyond the boundaries of the phone to move port, it can make the user feel like the object is really there. And beyond that, it can also motivate a user to organically begin moving the phone around their environment so that they can appreciate the full scale of these digital objects in their physical space. And that brings us to our next observation. 
because users are more familiar with 2D mobile applications that don't typically require user movement as a form of interaction, it can be very challenging to help convey to users that they're able to move around. So many of users don't because it just doesn't feel natural based on how we've used 2D apps in the past. But what we realized is that characters, animations, or objects that convey visual interest on screen and then move off screen can be a natural way to motivate users to move. So here we have a bird, and it, it appears in the middle of the screen. And when it flies off screen, it's replaced with a marker that moves around and slides along the edge to help users understand the bird's location in relation to the user. Another major thing that you want to think about is that whenever you have an experience that requires a user to move, you also want to think about how much space a user needs. So we found that experiences fall into three different sizes. There's table scale, there's room scale, and there's also world scale. And when it comes to table scale, what we found is that your experience is able to scale to the smallest of surfaces so that many, maybe many users are able to enjoy your experience. And with room scale, it expands the impact of AR so that content will start to feel life-sized, and you're able to do a lot more with the space that's available. And world scale has no limits. It allows users to appreciate AR in whatever area they see fit. And this is an area we're particularly excited about because what it means for procedurally generated content in world scale. So no matter what size your experience ends up being, just remember to set the, users, set the right expectation for users so they have an understanding of how much space they will need because it can be a very frustrating part of the experience if the user is playing a game, and in the middle of the game, they realize they don't have enough space to enjoy it. And when it comes to how much, how much movement your experience requires, there's no one-size-fits-all solution. It really depends on the experience that you're trying to create. For example, if you have a game that requires user movement as a core part of interaction, that can be a very delightful experience. You can use proximity or distance to trigger different actions so that as a user gets closer to this frog, it can leap behind the mushroom, or maybe the mushroom can disappear. And that can be really cool to see. However, if you have a utility app where the core purpose of the app is to help users understand very complex data and information, then requiring users to move might be a really bad experience. Because what it means is that users who have different movement or environment limitations won't be able to get the complete app experience. So allowing users to manipulate the object, to rotate it, to move it around in a space that's more appropriate will ensure that all users have easy access to the data that they seek. All right, because there is relatively new, um, the actual process for users to flow from 2D parts of your app into 3D can be uh, at times a bit awkward. Uh, and we're just starting to create some sort of standards around that. So we'll talk about initializing into AR. Uh, one of the first things you can do is you can leverage a standard view in AR material icon. Uh, so users, when they see that, they, they know that when they hit this icon, they're going to be going into AR. Uh, you can use this in sort of you know, all the normal places that uh, icons appear, like a um, you know, floating action button or on top of cards, um, as the indicator that you can actually view this object in 3D in, the, in your environment. Uh, one of the next things you'll see um, if you've been playing with lots of AR apps um, is uh, it's something that you might not initially understand. I want to talk about the concept of how understanding depth actually requires some movement. So you'll see these types of animations where it's trying to get the user to, to move their phone around. Um, so why, why is that actually happening? Um, basically, uh, we, you know, we perceive depth because we have two eyes, but we actually get a lot of our depth information by actually sort of moving our head around and being in the scene. And for the case of AR Core, um, current, most current phones on the market only have a single camera on the back, so the device only has one eye. Um, and if it hasn't moved yet, it doesn't necessarily know what's going on. So if this is the first thing the phone sees, um, it's going to say, all right, well, that's that's interesting, but I, I don't totally have a sense of you know, where these objects are yet. And once you just move just a little bit, then it becomes clear. Uh, as soon as you bring in a little bit of movement, then you have enough of that data on different angles onto the scene that it can start to build up a model of what it's seeing. So that's why um, we have these animations uh, at the start of the app to try to get that movement, to try to get AirCore to 
have enough information to recognize the scene. Next thing you want to think about is um, deciding if users are able to uh, easily move the objects after they've been placed, or if these are really more permanent objects. And there's, again, no, like no right answer here. Um, so a you know, more persistent object might be like a, a game board or something that itself takes input. Um, but we want to recommend that you use um, these sort of standard icons to set expectations for users so they know as they're placing that object if that object is going to move around later on as they swipe on it. So some examples of that, um, let's say you're placing um, you know, like a city game. And here, you know, as you're swiping on the city, you're actually going to be interacting with the game itself. Um, so we recommend using an anchor icon for these more sort of persistent uh, object placements. Um, and you still want to enable the user to move the, the you know, game board later, perhaps through a menu screen or some type of re-anchoring flow. But to set expectations ahead of time that the city actually is going to be sort of stuck to the ground there for a while as you interact with the game. Versus you know, something like, say, you're shopping for furniture, and you're just placing a chair in the scene. Here, the chair itself isn't interactive, so you can actually map swipe gestures onto the chair and just easily move it around. So using the plus icon to kind of set expectations ahead of time that um, you know, you're not really committing to exactly where you're placing this object. All right, so now that we're talking about object interactions, there's actually quite a bit of details there. So now that we understand how to onboard users, let's start thinking about how users can interact with objects in their space. One of the things that we challenge you to think about as designers and developers in the community is thinking about how to solve problem solve for user behavior, even when it's unintentional. So one of the things that we recommend is giving users feedback on object collisions. And this solves a huge problem that we see in mobile AR, where a user will be moving the device around. And once the device collides with an object in AR, that object might disappear. And the user has no feedback in terms of how to fix it. So what we recommend is we recommend providing feedback in the form of camera filters or special effects that helps users understand when object collision is not an intended interaction. And this tends to work really well. The other thing that you want to think about is how to give users the right type of feedback on object placement. And it's really important in this case to think of each stage of the user journey, even as it relates to surface feedback. So surface feedback in AR is very important because it helps users understand how AR core understands the environment. It gives the users a sense of, uh, a sense of the surfaces that are available, the range of the surfaces that are available. So we recommend including feedback on the surfaces when the user is placing objects in the scene. The other thing that we recommend is maintaining the height of the tallest surface as a user drags an object from one surface to another. And once, a, once an object is suspended in the air, make sure that you're always communicating a visual feedback on the drop point. That way, it's very clear to the user at all times where the object is going to land. And once an object is placed into the scene, we also recommend providing feedback in the form of a visual feedback on the surface or even on the object itself just to communicate the object's entry into the physical environment. So now that we know how to play with objects in your scene, let's think about how an object might get there. We recommend using gallery interfaces in order to communicate user to users how they can take objects that live on screen and drag it out into their real world. So here, you see we have a gallery strip at the bottom bar. And as a user selects an object, they're able to drag it onto their space. And not only that, we're able to support both selection states and also very familiar gestures that allow users to manipulate the objects. So you can use pinch to scale, twist to rotate, and even drag to move. And you've seen many examples in our talk of how dragging objects is a very common and expected behavior. But another alternative for object selection and object movement is through a reticle. So reticle selection is also very effective in that it allows users to manipulate objects in their scene without covering too much of the user's view. So we have an example here where reticle selection is being used to select a rock. And that's triggered via the action button in the bottom right. But what it allows users to do it is that it allows users to see the many surfaces that are available. 
And as you can imagine, if a user is selecting an object with their finger and dragging it across the, the screen, you don't have as much screen real estate to see all of the surfaces that the user might want to place the object on. So reticle selection is very, uh, very impactful here. The other thing that you get with radical selection are ray casts. So ray casts are very effective in helping the user get a sense of the virtual weights applied to each of these objects. So here we have another example where the user is able to pick up a feather. And once the feather is picked up, you'll notice that the ray cast has ve very little movement and very little bend on it. And for the most part, it remains straight. However, when the user picks up the rock, you're able to see a more dramatic bend applied to the ray cast that signifies the larger amount of mass, the heavier weight of this object in relation to the feather. All right, so let's move on to the final pillar, which is volumetric interface design. I think one of the, the first things you want to consider here is that the phone is the user's viewport. They're actually using the phone to look out into the scene and, and see the application. And because of that, you don't actually want to place a lot of 2D UI on the screen that's actually going to obscure the user's view onto your application. So to show you a know, sort of quick example, it's, it's obviously a lot nicer to have you know, a limited set of controls. Um, as soon as you start to clutter the screen, it really gets in the way of the user's ability to enjoy the AR app. And the sort of counterintuitive thing that we've even found is that users are so focused on the app out in the world that uh, often designers will place uh, a control on a screen level because they, they want to draw attention to that control. But it's actually having the opposite effect, that users are actually more focused out in the scene. So they'll actually just miss controls that are drawn on the surface, just kind of tune those out. Um, so really, you want to be very mindful of when you're making decisions on if you're going to put a control up on the screen versus out into the scene itself for not just you know, obscuring the view, but also for discoverability of them, them finding that. And that's not to say that you should never put a control up onto the screen, but you want to be you know, considering a, a few different metrics on it. So uh, our recommendations is that you only really leverage on-screen surface UI for things like you know, controls that have a very high frequency of use or controls that require very fast access. So uh, like a camera shutter button is kind of the perfect example of something that you know, hits both criteria, where you know, in a camera, you're obviously taking lots of pictures, and um, also you want to take pictures very quickly. But imagine if you're like playing a game and there's you know, some ability to like fire or something, that would be um, you know, a good candidate for an on-screen control because you're you know, both hitting that button a lot and also you need to get to that button very quickly. So we talked about using the view and AR icon to get people into the experience and transition from 2D into AR. But you also want to be very careful about the opposite of when users are now in AR and they're actually transitioning back to a 2D experience. And one thing we found is uh, if the user is not initiating that action to, to go back into a 2D experience, it can actually be pretty obnoxious because they're so focused out in the scene. So the user's you know, viewing the application, and then suddenly a 2D UI shows up and blocks the entire viewport. That can be pretty annoying. Um, so you're really, you know, depending on uh, even if the user is you know, exiting or they're you know, customizing an item in the scene or you know, whatever the use case is, you want that flow back to 2D screen level UI that's covering most of the screen to be something that the user is actively doing and not something that happens by surprise. So you also, you know, common common thing with mobile application design is you want to maintain you know, touch targets that are about the size of the user's finger. Uh, for 3D, this is, of course, a bit harder because the object could be any distance away from the user. So quick example of um, some things you can do here. Uh, here we have two tennis balls. Um, and when you tap on the tennis ball, confetti fires out of it because in AR, AR you can do whatever you want. Um, and we're showing the, the touch target size with the dotted line. So one of these tennis balls is actually maintaining a reasonable touch target size as it gets farther away, uh, whereas the other one is not. It's just mapping to the, the virtual size of the object. Um, and of course, it's a lot easier to interact with the one that is maintaining a large target size. Uh, we've also found for interfaces where you're manipulating objects, if you're not doing uh, tricks to kind of maintain target size, you often get these problems where you swipe an object to very far away. And then it's actually hard to bring the object back because it's now at such a small target. So you have to actually walk over to the object to get it, which is a little bit frustrating. Uh, maybe you could say it's very immersive, but um, either way, it's nicer to be able to actually bring the objects back as well. So on the whole, you want to be thinking about 
um, you know, what controls are going to be on the screen versus what controls are going to be out in the scene. And kind of a, a mantra that the team has had is to say, you know, scene over screen. Um, obviously, we talked about some, you know, sort of boundary cases of when you'd want to put something on a screen level. But I found it's, it's many people's initial reaction to design everything for the screen level, because that's you know, the type of design work we've been doing for 2D applications. But you really want to start thinking more about volumetric UI and having your, your UI out into the scene itself. So to give a quick example of this, um, this is actually one of the demos the ships have seen for them. Um, it's a solar system simulator. Um, loads of fun. Also, it's missing a planet right now. We did fix that for the public release, in case you noticed that in the video. Um, but imagine um, now you need to design the, the UI for this. Uh, so you know, a lot of people would initially think, oh, I'll have you know, a gear menu up in the corner um, that will you know, throw something up on the screen. You know, the problem there is then you're not going to be able to sort of be as immersed in the simulation itself as you're interacting with it. So you know, an alternative way of doing that is to actually leverage these objects you know, on the scene itself. So as you're tapping on planets, um, you'll get feedback on what planet that is, um, which is you know, kind of nice for educational use cases. And then in this particular demo, when you tap on the sun, um, that's how you start to control the entire solar system. So here are the users tapping on the sun. And that brings up a panel. Uh, this is actually an Android view. Uh, so in scene form, you can map just standard Android views uh, into AR. And here you have controls like you know, changing the, the orbit speed or the rotational speed of the planets themselves. And it's really nice to be able to interact with these objects in the scene and not to have that sort of sudden loss of being able to see things and being sort of taken out of the experience. And that kind of brings me to the final point, which is um, this idea of AR presence. So we'd, we'd actually seen this coming up in, in user research studies where uh, people would be looking through a phone, uh, and then they would kind of step outside of the you know, look outside of the phone to like see that you know something was placed correctly, and then you know of course we're recording it, so they laugh and they're like, oh yeah, right, of course you know I can only see it through the phone, um, and you know we always laughed when we saw this happen, uh, and then I was uh, testing out an app, um, it was these sort of you know plastic interlocking bricks, and I had an instructions of what I was building, and I was playing it for a long time. And uh, one moment, I looked over to the instruction book, and it wasn't there. And I like, you know, had the reaction that you normally have of like an object just disappears in real life. And of course, then immediately, I'm like, oh, that's silly. You know, like, yeah, it's AR. But I was so immersed in the experience and the application, and I've been playing it for so long, that I was no longer kind of mentally tracking like, what was real and which was, what was virtual. And I was just sort of buying that the experience was happening. And you're going to start to have this experience as well as you're interacting with these applications. And I'd say that's the moment when your application is performing really, really well, because it means that the user is just completely immersed and engrossed in the application. So if you ever have these moments where people are you know, looking at a vase and, you know, through their phone, and then they look down and it disappears and they react, that's good. That means the app is, is performing great. All right, so we've gone through the five pillars of, in, of AR design, which, again, include understanding the user's environment, planning for user's movement, onboarding users by initializing smoothly, designing natural object interactions, and balancing on-screen and volumetric interface design. And again, this framework, we believe, will help anybody get started with creating apps that everybody can enjoy. So we have a quick video for you, some amazing content that many designers and developers like yourselves from the community have created. We hope you enjoy.
So with that, we're very happy to share with you everything that we had today, and we look forward to seeing what you create. Please fill out our survey and check out our resources online. Thank you. Thanks so much. Nice job. Thank you for joining.
Good morning and welcome back to day two of our developer festival. It's a gorgeous morning here at the Shoreline Amphitheater, the backyard of our Google Mountain View campus. During each of the session breaks will be our conversations with special guests like the visionary production designer for Black Panther and the astronomer who is using AI to uncover the origins of our solar system. We'll also take you to the sandbox for some playtime. And when we're not in the sandbox, we'll be taking you around the festival to enjoy everything that's happening here at Shoreline. During your first session break, I'll be speaking with Jeff Dean, head of AI at Google.
All right, well, good morning, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the second day of Google I.O. 2018. My name is Doug Stevenson. I'm a developer advocate with the Firebase team. And I'm Sarah Allen. I'm an engineering manager at Google. And I'm super excited. I actually got a chance to code on some of the technology that we'll be talking about today. So planetary scale apps with Firebase is planetary scale is what we're talking about today. And that means huge data sets, billions of people across the planet using your app. This talk is really for two kinds of people. Some of you maybe already have a planet scale app. And you're thinking, I have so much going on. How could I possibly use the new technology? It's very hard, even though everybody wants to do that. With some of the technologies we're talking about today, there's an opportunity to reduce the ops burden and, and add features more quickly, increasing your velocity. The other kind of person, and I think this speaks to every one of us, we have in the back of our minds or our forefront of our minds a world-changing idea, something that is a small app now or a small idea wanting to be an app that aspires to be a planet scale app. And I'm really excited to share some of the technologies that can let you build small and grow big. So specifically, what do I mean by planetary scale? So this is the technology that will help you reach every person on the planet, uh, potentially connecting to 4 billion people that are now connected to the internet with lots of data. So anytime you have a lot of users, you have a lot of data. Sometimes you have fewer users and a lot of data. And it's too big to fit on one hard drive. <laughs> it's complicated sometimes to design queries to get the data you want that is responsive and quick. And you want your data to be close to the edge. So wherever on the planet your users are, the data gets to them quickly. So. I've described some of the challenges, but the good news is with a mobile or web app, no matter what technology you're using, you only need to fetch the amount of data as fits on a screen or maybe a few screens. And so this is a hard problem to get right, but it's a totally solvable problem because it's constrained by the amount of data a human can see um, on a screen. So in this talk, we'll show two examples of planetary scale apps. One is a real world use case, so an app that maybe you use, uh, you maybe already used it today. And there's an app that we built. Uh, we're we're going to demo it for you today. When did we finish this demo? Um, I think we were still working on moments, it as we were walking here. Moments ago, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> hopefully the demo gods are shining on us right now. Uh, and we'll open source that later so you can explore it uh, on your own at your own time. So the tool that we used, well, that, that both the other app that we'll show you later and our app both use, they both have in common, is Cloud Firestore. So Cloud Firestore is a massively scalable NoSQL database. It's cloud hosted, so all your data lives in the cloud if you're uh, using Firestore. And uh, how is it scalable? Well, what, what does it mean by massively scalable? Well, the idea is that when you query it, you want to query the data that you get out of it. The uh, performance is based on the size of your result set. So the, what you query out of it determines the performance. So what does that mean? So say you have 50 documents in a day, or say you have 1,000 documents in a database, and you query for 50. That's not a very hard problem to solve, but the performance is based on the 50 that you query for. Now, what if you have 100,000 items in your, in your database? Well, as long as you're still querying for 50, the performance is at exactly the same. And what about 100 million? Well, still, with Firestore, it scales such that if you're querying for 50 documents within that 100 million, you're still getting the same performance. It, it scales massively, uh, not with the size of your entire data, but with the size of your result set for your query. And it's effortless. There's no sharding. There's no maintenance. You just write the queries. Populate the database, of course, then write queries on top of that. So I'm really excited to share with you our first use case, which is Evernote. With their hundreds of thousands of users, they currently support a lot of infrastructure. They were looking for a way to increase their velocity, lower their ops burden, 
and deliver new features to their customers all at the same time. When we met with them, they mentioned the, some of the primary reasons for choosing Firestore. These aren't the same ones that everybody picks, and I thought they, this was really insightful. They um, are really excited about the offline support. So the client SDKs allow for writing when you're disconnected and then automatically syncing to the server when you get back online. Also, there's notification of change across multiple devices. And the consistent APIs across the client SDKs um, really, really speed development, and they're super excited about that. So in addition to sharing notes, Evernote users often use multiple devices. They might use their desktop app and their mobile app at the same time, or maybe they use their desktop app at work, and then at home they use their tablet. And they, people more and more expect this kind of seamless experience, but particularly with this app where everybody's keeping their, their really important personal data and observations on the world. So before we dive into that, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about Firebase rules. And this is really a key part of makes, what makes Firestore and all of the Firebase accessible data storage options really work well. Normally, you need a server in between your client and your server-side data because you can't just like have those queries open to the world. You have to do some authorization. You have to you do some validation. There's a whole bunch of things that you just normally have to do. They're not fancy. They're just stuff that is important. And so with uh, Firebase, Firebase rules is um, a simple declarative syntax that you just upload to the server, and that says which of your data paths are accessible. So only authorized users can read and write certain documents. You can also have public data. You can have data that's not accessible at all, except on the server side. You can also do validation where you limit the length of a string or you know, make sure um, integers are within a valid range. So Doug, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Firestore? I will do that. <laughs> So Firestore data modeling is kind of uh, particular. So uh, it's derived from what we learned from users of Firebase Real-Time Database. So for those of you who have already used that, you know it's also a cloud-hosted NoSQL database. And what we did is we observed what developers were doing with it. Uh, we we uh, found some patterns, some uh, best practices. And what we did is we tried to code that into the structuring of Firestore. So uh, what, what you'll see is that it, comments, or it, it mirrors the most common use cases. So what you have is at the very top level of your Firebase, you have collections. And these collections are containers for documents. You have to organize your documents into collections. Uh, a document is the lowest level uh, unit of data. So there is nothing really smaller than a document. But a document can have fields in it, and those fields can have type values. So when you read a document, you're getting all those fields, all those data types, all in one query. Now, within a collection, documents can be ordered, and they can be filtered based on the content. So if you have fields in there that you want to use to uh, narrow down your search or order by, say, date or some count or something like that, you can perform queries like that. And uh, like I said, that scales with the size of your result set. So I'm really excited that Evernote decided that they were willing to share a bit about how their data is modeled. And they're, um, they're, they're doing some common patterns. So this um, can give you a sense of how Firestore data modeling works. So you have a top level connect collection of all the users. When somebody logs in, then um, they, the client will write this data, whatever you, user data that they signed up with. And, um, and then you, you have your basic profile information. From then on, that's cached locally on the device. And when you reconnect, it listens for changes from the server so that if you, got that, if you connected on a different device and changed your profile, it would automatically sync. So then they organize data in uh, your notes in notebooks and spaces. And um, those you also listen to from the client side. And there's another top level coll collection of all your notes. So this is a common pattern for how Firestore organizes these data. You have these top level collections with, which can have a huge number of documents, but the individual user is only getting a small subset of them. And therefore, you can have that result set be small and your queries be fast. 
So the, the client listens to the notes that they have access to, and then when they change, it automatically is synced across devices and between users. And then Firebase Rules works on the server side to make sure that people can only access what they're supposed to have access to, keeping user data safe. Now, you might be wondering, what did we build? Well, our use case is a little bit different than Evernote. Uh, it's actually just a web app. Um, we're calling it Friendly Shop. And the idea here is, and this is totally fictional, of course, uh, that companies all over the world can upload images with inspirational quotes. Uh, so you can think of it kind of like a shop. And the idea is that you can go and browse them and maybe buy them. Uh, what's common between the Evernote case and our case is that we don't need to show all the documents. We don't need to show all the items together. We only need to show what can fit on the screen. Or in this case, we're showing 50 items per query. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll dive into this a little bit. Um, the idea is what our, our hope was, we wanted to put a million documents in there. We were targeting a million. But how many did we actually get to, unfortunately? We got about 260,000. 260,000. We'll demo to you 260,000 items today. If I say million, that's just because we were planning on a million. We didn't quite get there. I'll get into a little bit of detail about some of the, the gotchas we ran into. Not a limitation of the scale of Google Storage or anything like that. Yeah, that was just our lack of planning, really. <laughs> we put in a lot of stuff at the last minute. our excitement and enthusiasm for adding features at the last minute. Yes, and uh, Sarah will talk more about how we, how we actually populated the database. Uh, so what did, we, what did we use to build it? Well, obviously, we used Firestore, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, but we used a variety of Firebase and cloud products to build this out. And what we didn't have to do here is stand up a server, configure it, log into it. We didn't have to scale it. It all just happened automatically. So first, we want to tell you about, um, or second, because we've already talked about Firestore, Firebase hosting. Whenever you, for a web app, this is, of course, essential. But whenever you have a mobile app, typically you'll have at least a few screens that you want to deliver on the web. And you want to be able to easily serve up all your static assets, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and images. And, and then you also want to be able to do this globally and have those accessible close to the edge. And Firebase hosting is a global content delivery network with physical edges all over the world. So mat no matter where users are, they get, op they get low latency, which turns into speed for the user experience. So it's like planetary by definition, almost. Exactly. <laughs> the other component we used is Firebase authentication. We used just a, just a tiny sliver of it. But what Firebase authentication does is it helps you get your users logged into your mobile application. And it supports Google login, Facebook, Twitter, and more. Uh, if that's not enough to suit your own planetary scale needs, you can write your own plugin. So if you have your own authentication provider, your own users, your own uh, OAuth system, you can plug that in yourself, and that's fine. So cloud storage, each poster has its own image. And we need a massively scalable data storage place to put them. We actually don't need something quite as massive as cloud storage, but it's good to know it's there. Um, so the images can actually get pretty big. Uh, and there's room to have extra thumbnails and variants across the devices. And let me tell you a little bit about how big Google Cloud Storage is. It's exabytes of data. Had to look up what an exabyte <laughs> is. It's, it's big. It's Let's really big. <laughs> <laughs> it's a number of bytes with 18 zeros after it and roughly a million terabytes. And I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember when we had to worry about physical disks. And if things were too, like we, we, we get bigger and bigger disks, and that was like really exciting. And then if your stuff had to go on multiple disks, that's a lot of work. And it's so lovely not to have to worry about that and not to have to plan for that to be in the future. And um, so, so with our, our poster app, even if we were storing a really high res image that was like 10 megabytes, I could store trillions of those. And that's really delightful. And I think that it'll work for our friendly shop, even if we get to planet scale with our user base. That's right. 
All right, and the last component that we use to kind of wrap all these different products up is called Cloud Functions. So with Cloud Functions, what we have is a serverless backend compute container, and it's built on top of Node.js. It's a managed Node.js uh, environment. So all you do is write Node, write JavaScript, deploy it to Cloud Functions, and it runs in response to events that happen in your system. Now, what are those events that happen? Um, well, for example, what we could do in our app is when a new user signs up, we can automatically turn around, write some code, and create a user record for them. Or any time a new doc is, a, is added, so like someone uploads a new poster, what we can do is automatically kick off some process to generate thumbnails that are appropriately sized for our web app. Or if... Um, um, Oh, I don't have a third case. <laughs> but the point, the point is, we, we, all you do is write and deploy that code. You don't manage any servers. You don't log into anything. Um, and best of all, you don't scale it up or down. It automatically scales up to meet the demand of your system and automatically scales down to zero if all of your demand goes away. So you only pay for what you use. You don't have all these servers, hundreds of servers, fired up, paying for them all the time. You only pay for the compute resources that you actually use with Cloud Functions. Um, and in this product, I'll actually live add one new function that will add some functionality to our app without having to deploy a new version of the web app. So I'm excited to show you that, if it works. <laughs> so this is a truly serverless experience, which significantly sim simplifies both your development and your operations. There, the, this sort of illustrates how these all work together to power our friendly shop app. There's no servers, no VMs to manage. You can do capacity planning on a napkin. And um, having this fully managed infrastructure means that we can focus more on our application features. And that is really what drives the business value for our friendly shop. <laughs> One place that we do need to do some careful thinking, as we mentioned before, is how our data, data is modeled. It's not auto magic. You have to think about your use case and, and how you're going to put that data together. And Firestore is structured to help you think through that and organize your data for scale. Mm -hmm. So I want to dive into the Firestore experience. This is an image of, um, from, our, from the data console in the Firebase UI from our friendly shop data, store, um, data structures. And I'll just walk you through the interface, which also walks you through um, our data structure. So um, if, the, if the app were more real, you would probably have more connections, co collections. On the, the first panel on the left, you'll see items. So that will show a list of collections. Normally, you'd have items, users, whatnot. And you can also add collections direct in the interface. So being able to direct ads in the, in the interface sometimes means that you can get started on the view of your app without, um, before you build all of the interaction into your app. The next column is a list of documents for the selected collection. And um, here we have you know, 260,000 plus documents. And you could actually scroll through all of those. You can also snap to a particular ID and pick an, a, a particular document. Uh, and then when you select the document, its content show up on the right. And here is um, some of the data, or all of the data for our, um, all the metadata for uh, each of the posters in our shop. And you can also, our app doesn't do this, but if you want to structure your data um, more and deeper, you can control how much you access at a time by creating sub-collections. So you can see there that you can add a collection as well. Although our app has a fairly simple but flexible data model with just a top-level collection. You hold on to that one. <laughs> so here is how you query the database. It's just a simple few lines of JavaScript. If you go and view the source, you'll get something like this, although it's a little bit broken out. Uh, but what we do here is we're using the Firebase SDK, JavaScript SDK. We're reaching into the Firestore product for that. So Firebase has a bunch of different products bundled into it. We're just interested in Firestore right here. And we're going to reach into the items collection. And then we're going to order all those items, all 260,000 of them, by price, descending. So we'll get the most expensive one first and the least expensive ones last. 
and then we're going to limit by the first 50, the top 50, uh, again, based on the ordering. Then we're going to get, that's asynchronous, and once we get those 50 results, we'll render them to the screen. This is actually how we populate the home screen for our app. So why don't I, uh, let's see, let's jump into a demo. Advance the slide, we'll jump into the demo. OK, so it actually, if you want to uh, view this demo live, see that short link up there, that bit.ly link? Go ahead and copy that into your mobile browser or your, desk or, or your laptop or whatever, and you can actually follow along with me. So what I'll do is I'll copy this and paste it into the browser. And it loads up. And we have results. So here's 50-some, the top 50 sorted by price. So we have all the expensive ones here. Everything here is $25.99. I can actually turn around and reverse that sort if I want. And now we have the cheap ones. I'm a budget shopper, so I'm going to keep it on the, on, on the cheapest ones first. Uh, so that's how we populate the home screen. Pretty straightforward. Could we go back to the slides, please? So when we want to add an additional query, because we want to add filters, we can specify another where clause. So in this case, we, are, we want to filter by topic. So we can say where a topic equals whatever the user has picked in the interface. And then um, compared to the, the, the prior query is in gray, and the, the new part is highlighted. And the, this is just um, another option in the query builder that lets us filter the results. So let's go back to the demo and see what that looks like in the app. OK, so what I'll do now is uh, let's choose a topic. And these topics are all randomly generated. We used a, uh, a node module called Faker. And Faker generated all this sort of like businessy sounding thing. So it's all sort of tongue in cheek kind of humorous. Anyway, uh, I'm going to filter on a topic. I, I'm totally into e business. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do e business. And then the results come in. And notice that the queries are just as fast as all the others. Adding, an, adding a where clause didn't actually impact the performance of this. But now we can see that we have all e, e business posters. And I can go in there and uh, change that again. I'm, I'm also totally into platforms. How about platforms? I'll do that. These are and inspirational the... posters <laughs> for businesses all over the world. That's right. And so now we have all platforms. And again, the, the query is exactly the same no matter how many where clauses we add. So I'm going to go back to these slides. So now we want to add another filter. We do it in an intuitive way by adding another where clause. So these um, particular poster images have a range of colors, and so we can choose st the top 50 posters sorted by price, starting with the most expensive. And then um, for a particular topic and a particular color, we can see the result set. Yeah, so, the, so let's go to the demo again. All right, so you saw on the last page that bit of code. Those two where clauses, they're being logically anded together. So if I want to look for posters that uh, are on the topic platforms and are in, uh, let's do orange, because that's the closest thing to Firebase. So let's look at all the ones that are orange. And again, we get now, oh, that's actually really uh, attractive. So again, you notice we made the query more complex by adding another where clause. But again, the query took just the same amount of time, because it's the same 50 uh, size result set. Remember, queries scale based on the size of the result set, not on the source data set. Oh, and I, sh I should have added, uh, or I should have mentioned earlier, we actually have a script over here that's constantly adding new. Oh, now you can see it added a new one. So this is actually simulating what users might actually be doing. Imagine there's users all over the world constantly adding new documents. That's what this script back here is, is doing. So the result set that you see on screen or that you're seeing in your mobile app could actually change over time. So this isn't just a static result set. This is a constantly changing result set. And this becomes significant later on. Uh, so let's switch back to the slides. So. Um, you can keep doing this. And we could go through another one and another one and another one and keep making up variations of our posters. Um, but we, we think you get the idea by now. Um, so the only requirement is that when you're doing these um, composite indexes, that um, you create a composite queries that you get a, uh, you create a composite index. And so that um, allows you to support all the combinations of filters and ordering that you need. Mm -hmm. So we have another demo. Oh, no, no. We're, uh, we're talking about indexes now. Oh. So, uh, so yeah, you can keep adding where clauses to your heart's content, 
but the only constraint here is that you have to add indexes for them. So what you see here is a screenshot of what it looks like in the Firebase console for the indexes we've added. So you can see we've got all the combinations of things we want to uh, filter and order by. As long as all these indexes exist, your, your queries will be fast, right? Um, and there's nothing you have to do. When you create an index, it'll just go off and, and do it. You can also put these in a configuration file and deploy them with your app, so you don't have to manually create in, any one of these. Uh, but the interesting thing here is that if you, don't, if you forget to create an index and you try to query on it, Firebase, or I'm sorry, Firestore will say, uh, well, I'm not going to do that query because it doesn't scale. I only do scalable things. But what it will do is give you a very interesting error message in the console. So this is an actual error message of what Firestore SDK is showing you. It says uh, the, require, the, the query requires an index. You can create it here. And it gives you a link to go create that index. You don't have to like, know any sort of magical incantations. You just click the link. It takes you to the Firebase console and makes that index for you. So during development, if you forget to think of all the different combinations of things you want to query on, you can just create one ad hoc. And I think that's really amazing. This is maybe the most actionable error message you will ever see in an SDK. It's literally telling you how to fix. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We, we hope Firebase is easy to use. <laughs> so just uh, wrapping up the scalable queries, as Doug has just demonstrated, indexing made easy. Uh, all of your individual field, fields are indexed by default. So if you're just doing a very simple query on a single property, you don't have to do anything. And then for compound queries, we have a little helper there. So I think you've seen lots of different demonstrations of how performance is based on the result set. And we have um, a lot of great documentation on how to structure your data. We've gone through some really common patterns today. And um, once you get a feel for it, then you can put together um, it, these, app, these really scalable apps. So we can also expand our app on the server side in a different way with Cloud Functions. So we talked about two different data storage ways to sc scale your app with Firestore and with Cloud, with, um, cloud Storage. And with Cloud Functions, you can provide server-side code. You can do a lot with Firebase with only client-side code, but server-side code can be helpful for, we have three things shown on the slide, which is like some data wrangling. You might, when you're creating your profile, want to like get some stuff from like social sharing sites or figure out who people's friends are. Um, you might have some business logic to drive user growth with a shopping frenzy. Um, and you often have to do a whole bunch of media wrangling, um, creating thumbnails and, and variants on images. The other kinds of things that people do with Cloud Functions is put code on the server rather than client to, in order to make fair decisions, in order to be really careful with that business logic and protect that so it's not kind of in the wild in an untrusted client, but um, secure on the server side. And then it's also a great way to do uh, multi-party interactions, to create a bot, to coordinate many users at the same time. So Cloud Functions has support for a bunch of different event providers within the Google infrastructure. So uh, you've already seen Firestore and Real-Time Database. Actually, we haven't seen it yet. We've, we've mentioned Firestore and Real-Time Database. What you can do with Cloud Functions is write triggers that respond to changes within your database. So in Firestore, if a document is created or changed or deleted, you can write code to respond to that. Same thing with Real-Time Database. If something changes anywhere within the hierarchy that matches a pattern that, that, you, um, that you define, you can again write some code. So this is good for doing things like data sanitization. If you want to uh, change a value that's invalid at the time of insertion, Insertion, you can do that with a cloud function. With Firebase authentication triggers, you can write code that, uh, that uh, runs when someone new enters into your system. So if there's a new account created, you could go off and create a profile for them. Or if that account is deleted, you can clean up all their data so you're not paying for a lot extra storage for a user that no longer exists. For analytics triggers, you can write code that triggers in response to conversion events. So a typical conversion event is if someone buys something or if someone performs some sort of high profile action within your app. You can write some code to respond to that uh, and keep track of it on the back end. 
Cloud Storage Triggers lets you write code that responds to when files are uploaded or changed within your Cloud Storage bucket. So in our app, if a poster was uploaded, we could write some code that creates the uh, thumbnails of various sizes that are appropriate, and all in response to the upload. We don't have to know anything else. It just happens automatically. You can also use Cloud PubSub. So whenever a message is published on a PubSub topic, you can write some code to respond to that. Uh, also, you can use Crashlytics. So if you're using Crashlytics in your iOS or Android app, those events can get triggered through Cloud Functions as well. So you can get what's called velocity alerts to know if an error happens and how severe it is among all of your users for your apps. And lastly, there's HTTP triggers. So you can write code that's basically a, an API endpoint, a web hook of some sort. Uh, so you can use this to create bots, uh, as Sarah said. You can use this to create REST APIs for your app or anything, or even if you just want to do something like populate a database, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So let's switch to the demo again. OK, so remember before there was that script that was populating the database. And this has been going on about every minute or so. It adds a new poster. Now, um, this is simulating what users might do. Of course, it's not the real thing. But let's say I want uh, to drive traffic to my website by cr uh, creating a trigger that responds to when a new poster is uploaded. What I want to do is tweet that out to everyone. It's broadcast to the world, look at our new poster. So I can do that without changing any of the web app code. So what I'll do is fire up my editor here, and this is my Cloud Functions code. And I already have in my copy buffer a, uh, a oop, that's not it. <laughs> How about this one? I'm always prepared. All right. So this is our new function. Uh, I will walk through a sort of redacted version of it. So if we could, oh, actually, nope, let's not switch just yet. What I'm going to do is deploy it. And while that's deploying, maybe it will pick up one of the posters that's being created by the script. So if we could switch back to the slides now. So this is kind of a stripped down version of what basically this function is doing. We're using three SDKs in this. We're using the functions SDK. We're using the Firebase admin SDK, which gives you programmatic access to all of your Firebase features. And we're using a Twitter SDK as well. And of course, we're going to go through, initialize the admin SDK, initialize the Twitter SDK. Uh, and then in the body of the function, we're going to define a new function. So we're going to call it tweet new items, and we're going to say, hey, functions SDK, I want to create a Firestore trigger, and I want to pay attention to documents in the items collection with some wildcard ID. That's what the curly braces around the ID are saying. And whenever a document that matches that pattern is created, my anonymous function here is going to get invoked with a snapshot of that document and some context surrounding the request. So I'm going to reach into the context, get the ID of the document, reach into the snapshot, get the raw data. So this is like a JavaScript object representing all the data that was, that was in the document that was created. And I'm going to build a reference to a path in, or a reference to a location in cloud storage where the poster was uploaded. So this is now, uh, for those of you who know cloud storage, a GS URL. Or actually, no, no, it's a, it's a path within uh, the box. Um, we're going to generate a URL that's going, you want to go back? Just that one line. Yeah, so we're going to generate the actual URL to that poster in the web, so in the, uh, web shop. So what I want to do now is advance the slide. And what we'll do is download that file from storage. So we'll download it locally in the instance that's running cloud, in Cloud Functions. And we're going to use the Twitter API to upload that image once it's downloaded. And once we have the media ID string for the upload, we're going to turn around build a message. So we're going to tweet a message that says, take a look at our latest poster, the, the, the name of the poster, and the URL so the user can click on it and go to the store. And then we'll attach the media ID to it so you'll get, you'll get to see the poster along with the tweet. So let's go back to the demo and see what happened here. So here we are in Twitter. Let's see if we reload this page. Oh, we have some tweets. So these two things actually happened. So we had Unleash granular web readiness, which is something I've always wanted to do. Uh, if we click the link, we go to the, go to the store, and, and we see the poster there. So it works. So we had a, a Firestore trigger that triggered in response to a new poster being added, and it automatically generates social media to drive traffic to our store. So I think that's pretty cool. Very cool. So um, Can we go back to the slides, please. Thank you. Now I'm going to just give you a whirlwind tour of how we generated the images. Um, so this is kind of, you can imagine lots of batch jobs where this would work. We, um, I use this amazing, fun library called Fractastic to generate fractals. It turns out to be um, one of the great ways to create a lot of random images. 
and um, I'll just go through the code a little bit. So this is an HTTP function. So we created an add fake poster function so that we could just curl that URL. And uh, I create a little class that makes the that generates the fractal image, one base image in um, grayscale, and then uh, optionally the script takes a parameter which can or the lack of a parameter will parameter will tint this a whole bunch of colors and this uses image magic that's built into that ships with cloud functions on the um, environment that you've got there. So then um, it creates a random image using the the faker module. So we decide to use the um, company noun as a topic, and we get a verb and an adjective so that we put those together into an inspirational message. And then um, we take the um, images that we created earlier and we generate a unique path based on a document ID because then we can make sure that each of these posters has um, a unique storage path and we upload the poster to a bucket. Of course, this is happening multiple times for each color. And um, we finally get a download URL. So this can be a public URL, which is really important for the tweeting. And then we put it all together. This is kind of a subset of the data. But it just shows you, you know, we're, we're putting together a document. And we call um, set on our document reference. And that um, changes the data in Firestore. So we're updating both Firestore and storage in this Google Cloud function. So and then you end up with a JSON blob like this. And so there's a couple of configuration options that we ended up using. Timeout. This can take, depending on the complexity of the flat fractal, you know, two minutes or so. So we extended the time out. I actually increased the memory because I, I found out that sometimes it ended up using a lot of memory. And then that was causing things to fail occasionally. And um, you can also adjust your quota. So. Um, it turned out one of the challenges we came up, we ran into in the last 24 hours is we decided that we wanted to have a nice URL for our friendly shop. So we recreated the app, because that's easy. And I forgot to turn on billing. So you, you get a lot of free executions um, without even setting up billing. But if you want to make a million images, in fact, if you want to make 42,000, <laughs> you'll get, um, in, a, in a very short amount of time, you'll get a quota exceeded. So you can see that I got a spike of errors there. I also had a bug where um, I forgot to do something with my file, and I didn't have the Twitter set up. So it's, um, this is the health tab in the Firebase console for functions. It's really super handy for figuring out what's going on. So the, also, the local disk turned out to be one of the reasons that I was having um, things fail because of memory. Um, I uh, dug, actually pointed out in our documentation <laughs> that um, something I didn't really, I hadn't practiced that much with Google Cloud Functions, so I didn't realize this. It turns out to be handy, um, but it can also be a gotcha. So normally, the file system is read-only. You can put whatever you want in your functions directory, and when you deploy all your functions, all of those files are available to you. You can access them locally. But if you want to write, you can write in the temp directory. But you want to use platform independent paths so that you can still test locally and on the server, even, on, even if you have Windows locally. And, um, and it's just kind of a good idea. So normally, you create a temp file like this. And then um, you also need to be careful to know that the local files might be there next time. Or they might not. So they're good for like caching something. But if you don't need them, you should delete them. Because it's an in-memory file system, so it'll chew up your memory. Like it's super fast, and that's great, but you want to clean them up. So you want to make sure that after whatever you do, you delete the file, unless you really want to keep it there for you know, because you're going to reuse it next time. <laughs> so um, in summary, Cloud Functions is server-side code without servers. We love it for that. Most people use it for core app logic, or you know, most of the things we've talked about today. Um, it's also um, like our user driving user growth example. You can, you can easily add features when your app's in motion. Without and publishing your app again. That's such a headache, right? Without publishing your whole <laughs> app. It's fabulous. Mm -hmm. And then it's also great for back-end jobs. So 
Yeah, so that's how we built our app. We used a total of five Firebase and cloud features. Firebase hosting for content, authentication for login, Firestore for data and searching, cloud storage for all of our images, and cloud functions to do things on the back end in response to events that happen in our system. This is pretty easy. This is pretty standard uh, application architecture for what I would consider development of, an, of a mobile app in 2018. This is, I think, the way things uh, will go for a lot of developers. If you're building a mobile app or a web app, I would encourage you to consider an architecture like this. It's entirely serverless. You only pay for what you use. You don't stand up servers. You don't log into servers. You don't have passwords. You don't have configurations. You just write and deploy your code, focus on your app logic. And that's all you have to do to build an app these days. So that's all the content we have. We will be in the tent, if you want to ask questions, we'll be in the tent across the way over the wooden structure, and we'll see you over there soon. Thanks. Hello and welcome to IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'm standing here with Jeff Dean, the head of AI at Google. Hi Tim, thanks. <laughs> Hi Jeff. All right, let's start with a background of Google's work in AI. So we've been using machine learning and AI for the last 20 years in some of our products, but in the last five or six years, we've really sort of dramatically accel accelerated our use of machine learning and AI into more and more of our products. We've really used it to make our products more intelligent, to make them sort of more accessible, to really improve the product and build products that we couldn't build any other way. 
what's new with uh, the technology that we're making available, say, the last year and at I.O.? In the last year, uh, for example, we've made really great strides in, in improving TensorFlow, our open source machine learning system. Uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is the TensorFlow.js uh, release, which essentially allows TensorFlow programs to be run in the browser just as normal web pages with uh, sort of machine learning embedded code in them. And it, it's really easy for people to create really interesting new machine learning applications and then people to run them by just loading up a web page. It's, it's pretty fantastic. And, uh, and TPUs? So we released, uh, announced the third version of our TPU uh, processor line, it's custom machine learning accelerators. Uh, the TPU V3 is really, really exciting. It's, it's uh, quite hot. So it actually is our first liquid cooled processor that's in our data center. Um, and the pods uh, are actually larger scale than the TPU pods that we announced last year, so they're eight times as powerful, more than 100 petaflops of compute, which is just an unbelievable amount of compute. And the really exciting thing is that allows us to make sort of more accurate models, machine learning models that can um, train on more data, that can train more powerful and more accurate models, and then we can use that to improve our products. I think one of the things that makes me most excited about the technology that we're making available it is it's that whole spectrum, all the way from TensorFlow.js, which is a very accessible way to get into machine learning, and AutoML, all the way up to TPUs, so like our advanced users have all that compute to do cool stuff with. Yeah, I mean, I think you, there's going to be a lot of different uh, levels of expertise and experience in using machine learning. We want to make all of them able to use machine learning to improve their, their products and lives. All right, so let's talk about what people are doing with machine learning as we're getting there. Uh, what are some things that people are, out, are doing in the world with machine learning that you're the most excited about? Yeah, so there's like lots of different applications. I, one that I'm really passionate about is the use of machine learning to improve healthcare. I think there's a real opportunity there um, for both kind of medical imaging related problems. We've been doing a lot of work on diabetic retinopathy and other kinds of medical imaging problems, but also in how uh, patients' uh, lives are affected, how doctors are able to care for patients with making better decisions, a lot of advances there, it's gonna be great. Okay, so there's these big problems that we're tackling with machine learning. What about everyday problems? Is there something that you encounter every day that you would love somebody to apply AI to? Yeah, I mean, I think as you start to have a machine learning lens as you walk around the world, <laughs> uh, you can see things that, that could be better. Uh, for example, when I pull up to a stoplight and it's red and it's, there's no cars coming the other direction, that's just silly. Right? We should have computer vision based stoplights that just uh, allow people to go when it's safe to go. And that, that would be like a simple improvement in the world that would uh, improve lots of people's lives. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. And thank you for watching IO Live. To learn more about what Google is doing in AI and ML, head on over to google.ai. And to catch more videos like this, head on over to g.co slash IO slash guide. Cassava is a really important crop. It provides for over 500 million Africans every day. When all other crops fail, farmers know that they can rely on their cassava plants to provide them food. There are several diseases that affect cassava, and these diseases make the roots unedible. It is very crucial to actually control and manage these diseases. So we're trying to use machine learning to respond to those diseases. And TensorFlow is the best foundation for our solutions. The app that we've designed can diagnose multiple diseases. It's called Nuru, Swahili for light. The light that farmers can use to see their problems and find solutions. You wave your phone over a specific leaf, look at it, and if it has a symptom, a box will pop up saying you have this problem. When you get a diagnosis, we have an option for you to get advice and learn about the best management practices. The object detection that we use through TensorFlow relies upon our team annotating images. We've collected over 5,000 high quality images of different cassava diseases for this project. We use a single shot detector model on a mobile net architecture. It's able to make predictions in less than one second. Instead of having to implement thousands of lines of code, TensorFlow provides a library of functions that allow us to build architectures in much less time. We need something that can be deployed on a phone without any connection. TensorFlow is able to shrink these neural networks to be able to fit on your mobile device. The human input is absolutely critical. We're really building something that augments your experience and makes you better at your job. So with AI tools and machine learning, you can improve the yields, 
you can protect your crops and you can have a much more reliable source of food. AI offers the prospect to fundamentally transform the life of hundreds of millions of farms around the world. You can see a product that can actually make someone's life better. This is kind of revolutionary. So the whole point of the AI projects team at Google is to build um, artificial intelligence kits that let makers take the cool parts of Google intelligence and put them into their builds. Last year, we released the voice kit. Train fast. Uh, which was a kit that lets you um, record your voice and analyze it and get the text back from what you said. This year, we're releasing the vision kit. It does not need an internet connection. It does not need the cloud. You program it with the neural network model, and the kit then gives you back uh, data on what it sees. So if I give it a face, the light will come on. And then as I get happier, the light will change from blue to yellow. So this is our mobile nets neural network. This is an object classifier, and it's got a 1,000 different common objects in it. We have a banana, and let's see, a screwdriver. Yeah, it's got that pretty good. It's got an apple, not just an apple. It's got the type of apple as well, and even a water bottle, which is tricky because it is a clear thing, so it's not really a thing. It's just reflecting other things. So learning how to use these things and how to make it detect what you want to detect is going to be part of the fun. Our face detector code tells us not only that there is a face in the image, but it also tells us where the face is. It gives us the geometry about the face. So we can use that to build a tracker that can follow me wherever I go. We've shown you face detection, object recognition, and face tracking with the Google AIY Vision Kit. But this is just the beginning. Click on the link below to learn more. We're really looking forward to seeing what you build with this kit.
Hello and welcome to IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'm standing here with Jeff Dean, the head of AI at Google. Hi, Tim. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. All right, let's start with a background of Google's work in AI. So we've been using machine learning and AI for the last 20 years in some of our products, but in the last five or six years, we've really sort of dramatically accel accelerated our use of machine learning and AI into more and more of our products. We've really used it to make our products more intelligent, to make them sort of more accessible, to really improve the product and build products that we couldn't build any other way. What's new with uh, the technology that we're making available, say, the last year and at I.O.? In the last year, uh, for example, we've made really great strides in, in improving TensorFlow, our open source machine learning system. Uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is the TensorFlow.js uh, release, which essentially allows TensorFlow programs to be run in the browser just as normal web pages with uh, sort of machine learning embedded code in them. And it, it's really easy for people to create really interesting new machine learning applications and then people to run them by just loading up a web page. It's, it's pretty fantastic. And, uh, and TPUs? So we released, uh, announced the third version of our TPU uh, processor line, it's custom machine learning accelerators. Uh, the TPU V3 is really, really exciting. It's, it's uh, quite hot. So it actually is our first liquid cooled processor that's in our data center. Um, and the pods uh, are actually larger scale than the TPU pods that we announced last year. So they're eight times as powerful, more than 100 petaflops of compute, which is just an unbelievable amount of compute. And the really exciting thing is that allows us to make sort of more accurate models, machine learning models that can um, train on more data, that can train more powerful and more accurate models. And then we can use that to improve our products. I think one of the things that makes me most excited about the technology that we're making available, it is, it's that whole spectrum. All the way from TensorFlow.js, which is a very accessible way to get into machine learning, and AutoML, all the way up to TPUs, so like our advanced users have all that compute to do cool stuff with. Yeah, I mean, I think you, there's going to be a lot of different uh, levels of expertise and experience in using machine learning. We want to make all of them able to use machine learning to improve their, their products and lives. All right, so let's talk about what people are doing with machine learning, because we're getting there. Uh, what are some things that people are, out, are doing in the world of machine learning that you're the most excited about? Yeah, so there's like lots of different applications. I, one that I'm really passionate about is the use of machine learning to improve healthcare. I think there's a real opportunity there um, for both kind of medical imaging related problems. We've been doing a lot of work on diabetic retinopathy and other kinds of medical imaging problems, but also in how uh, patients' uh, lives are affected, how doctors are able to care for patients with making better decisions, a lot of advances there, it's gonna be great. Okay, so there's these big problems that we're tackling with machine learning, what about everyday problems? Is there something that you encounter every day that you would love somebody to apply AI to? Yeah, I mean, I think as you start to have a machine learning lens as you walk around the world, <laughs> uh, you can see things that, that could be better. Uh, for example, when I pull up to a stoplight and it's red and it's, there's no cars coming the other direction, that's just silly. Right? We should have computer vision based stoplights that just uh, allow people to go when it's safe to go. And that, that would be like a simple improvement in the world that would uh, improve lots of people's lives. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. And thank you for watching IO Live. To learn more about what Google is doing in AI and ML, head on over to google.ai. And to catch more videos. Well, welcome to Google IO. My name is Eitan Marder Epstein, and I am an engineering manager here at Google and I work on augmented reality. And I'm going to take a few polls throughout this talk. Um, and the first one is, how many of you are familiar with augmented reality in general? OK. Every time I give a talk like this, more hands go up, which is a really, really great thing. And today, what I'm going to do is give a quick refresher about augmented reality for those of you who maybe aren't quite as familiar with it and especially how augmented reality relates to smartphones, which is something that we're really, really excited about here at Google. And then I'm going to talk about some of the things that we're doing at Google to improve our uh, platform for augmented reality and the capabilities that we give to some of these devices. All right, so I need my clicker, so I'm actually going to go over here to get the presentation started. But off we go. So smartphone AR kind of stems from this observation that over the last decade, our phones have gotten immensely more powerful. CPUs and GPUs have improved a lot. But the ability of phones to see and understand their environments and really make sense of the world around them until very recently was largely unchanged and limited. So if you pointed your phone at this table, 
It would allow you to take a picture of the table or even a video of your friend climbing over the table. But your phone wouldn't really have an understanding of the geometry of the table, of its position relative to the table as it moves through space. And so what augmented reality seeks to do on smartphones is to take all of this amazing advancement in computing power and leverage it to bring new capabilities to your phone and to take your phone from beyond just the screen, beyond its own little box, to expand it to understanding the world around it. So now when my phone looks at this table, it can see that there's a surface there, that there are chairs next to it. And as I move through the environment, my phone can actually track its position as it moves. And we think at Google that augmented reality is really exciting. And we've been excited to see some of the stuff that you've built. And we've kind of categorized it into two main buckets where we think augmented reality can be really, really great for applications. So the first bucket is we think that augmented reality can be useful on smartphones. So recently, I was remodeling my kitchen. All right, another poll. How many of you have remodeled anything in, in a house? All right. So if you've done that, you know that measurement is a real pain. And what I needed to do was measure for a backsplash. We were buying some subway tile for our kitchen. And I, instead of taking a tape measure out, actually pulled out my phone, went to my counter, and measured from point A to B to C. And I did all of that without moving any of my appliances where I would have normally had to move in order to get an accurate measurement with my tape measure. So AR can be useful in that way just from providing a better geometric understanding about your environment. AR can also be useful for shopping applications. So recently, uh, we had some very old chairs at my house. And my partner and I were looking to replace them, kind of like these chairs here. And we were getting into a debate over which chairs we liked more. And so with augmented reality, we were able to take a 3D model of a chair, place it in the environment, see the exact size and scale and color. And we could have our arguments about, inevitably, what kind of chair we would have at home rather than exposing everyone to it at the store, and be more targeted about how we made our purchase and even buy this furniture online and feel much more comfortable with it. So that's how AR can just provide more utility in your daily life. But AR can also be fun. So imagine a character running across the floor, jumping onto this chair and jumping onto this table, or me sitting in one of these chairs and having the floor drop out from under me to create an ice fishing game. Ice fishing sounds a little bit boring, but I can tell you that in this game, it's actually a lot of fun. And AR can also be used for creative expression. So here, now in your pocket, you have a lot of ability to go out and create new things that were previously only capable uh, to be created by professionals. So you can generate computer-generated content on the go, on the fly. You can take your favorite character and put them into your scene and have your friend pose next to them. Or you can take pizza or hot dogs or your favorite food items, as we show here, and put them on the table in front of you. But now you have this amazing video editing capability in your pocket. And for those of you who have, who have seen our AR stickers application on the Google Pixel phone, you know what I'm talking about. And for those who haven't, please check it out. It's really, really cool to have this creation power in your pocket. All right, so that's great. Uh, AR can be useful, AR can be fun, but how do you actually build applications for AR? How do you get involved as developers? This is a developer conference. So how many of you are familiar with AR Core, when I say AR Core? All right, about half of you. So AR Core is Google's development platform for augmented reality. We want to make it easy for you to build applications that take advantage of these new capabilities that phones provide, of the ability of phones to see and understand their environments, and to build applications that actually react to this understanding. And AR Core was launched a few months ago, and it provides three main capabilities to allow you to do this. The first is something we call motion tracking. So here, consider the example of taking the scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz and wanting to place the scarecrow at a taco stand and make it seem like he's waiting in lines for tacos because everyone loves tacos. So here, if I look at the scarecrow with my phone, AR Core actually understands its position relative to a virtual object that I've placed in space. So as I move a meter forward, the phone knows that I've moved a meter in this direction. And as I turn left, the phone also knows that. It's able to track its motion as I move through space. 
And now, if I combine that with my desire to place the scarecrow a meter in front of me, I can put the scarecrow right here. And as I move my phone around, I can change where I'm rendering the scarecrow in the virtual scene to match my physical environment. So that allows you to register virtual objects to your physical scene in a very natural and intuitive way. The second capability that AR Core provides is something called lighting estimation. So here, continuing our Wizard of Oz theme, we've got the cowardly lion. And when you turn off the lights, say we want to make the lion afraid because it's cowardly. So here, AR Core is looking at the camera feed, and it is estimating the real world lighting of your environment. And with that estimate, AR Core can now light characters in a realistic fashion, helping you to build a more immersive experience that looks natural because the virtual objects that you're putting in your scene look correct. So you can see the tone on the lion change when it goes from light to dark. And you can even script interactions for your characters, in this case, making the lion afraid when the lights go off. And the third capability that AR Core provides is environment understanding. So here, as AirCore is moving around the world, and it's tracking its motion, and it's also estimating the lighting of the environment, AirCore is also trying to recognize surfaces. So AirCore might recognize this plane below me, which is the ground, or this surface here, which is the table, or even maybe this vertical surface behind me. And it allows you to place objects that are grounded to reality. So if we want to place the Android character on this table, I can detect the surface and actually place my virtual character on a physical object in the world. So those are three capabilities, motion tracking, lighting estimation, and environment understanding. And when you combine them together, it allows you to build these experiences that were previously impossible that bring the virtual and physical worlds together and meld them into a new reality that enables people to see and experience your application in a new and different light. And we're really excited about this and the opportunity to bring apps to uh, our ecosystem for it. And so we have worked really, really hard to expose support for AR Core on as many devices as possible. And with help from our partners in our Android OEM ecosystem, today AR Core is supported on over 100 million devices, and we're working to increase that number every single day. We believe that augmented reality is a next shift in computing, and that soon everyone will take for granted that this power is in their devices. So that's our scale, but we're also interested in scaling the capabilities of AR Core. We want to teach AR Core to do new and interesting things, and that's what the rest of the talk is going to be about. So today, we're announcing some new things in AR Core, and they fall broadly into two categories. The first is we're announcing some new capabilities for AR Core, improving what these devices can do. And those are augmented images and cloud anchors, and we'll talk about them in the talk today. And then we're also announcing some new tools for AR Core. One new tool is how you can use augmented reality on the web, which we think is really exciting. And you can check out a talk to that later today at 12.30 PM. And another is how you can more easily write 3D applications for Android and AR specifically, we've introduced our SceneForm library, which is a helper library for 3D rendering on Android. And we encourage you to check out that talk at 5.30 today. So enough about the preamble. We're now going to get into the meat of it and talk about what's new in AR Core. And I'm going to kick it off with our first feature, which are augmented images. So augmented images stem from your feedback. We've heard you, as you develop augmented reality applications, ask us, hey, AR is great. Wouldn't it be better if we could also trigger augmented reality experiences off of 2D images in our environment, like movie posters or textbooks? And so augmented images seek to do just that. Augmented images provide a mechanism to take a 2D texture in the world and make it more engaging by expanding it to a 3D uh, interactive object. And to show a concrete example of this, consider the case where we have a new children's toy. It's called a castle toy, I think. And we have told AR Core, hey, we want you to recognize the surface of this castle toy box. So now, as part of the product, you can hold up your phone to it, 
and you can actually have an immersive experience come out of that box, a more engaging experience for your product. So augmented images allow you to detect these kinds of textures and then script behaviors and take this 2D flat surface and turn it into 3D, which we think is really exciting, and it's based on your feedback. You told us that you wanted this feature, and now we have it. So that's the feature in a nutshell, but I want to tell you about how it works and also how you can use it in your applications. So augmented images fundamentally work in three major steps. The first step is you need to tell AR Core what images you're interested in. And there are two ways that you can do this. The first way to do this is to tell AR Core that you want to detect certain kinds of images in real time. So you could download an image from a server, you could have it bundled in your application, and you tell AR Core at runtime that, hey, please load this image, learn how to detect it in the scene, and tell me when you do. The second option is to tell AR Core in advance. So we've provided tools where you on your desktop computer can take up to 1,000 images and train AR Core on them in an offline fashion, saying, I would like you to be able to recognize any of these 1,000 images when I run my application on device. All right. So the next step is now that we've trained AR Core to recognize these images, we actually want to detect them on device. We want to show AR Core a scene and have it detect the images that we've trained. So now, when AR Core moves around the environment with your phone, uh, AR Core will also look for textures in the environment and try to match those to the textures that you trained on. And when it finds a match, AR Core provides you information on that match with the third step, which is it gives you a tracked object. So for those of you who are familiar with AR Core, tracked objects are a notion for the physical objects in space that AR Core knows about. To this point, that's been planes, like these surfaces, both horizontal and now vertical. Uh, but it also can give you points in the environment of interest that you can attach to. And now an augmented image is just another tracked object. So you use it just like you would use any plane or any point, and you can attach your virtual content to the detection of the physical object in the world. So that's it. Really simple. Three simple steps. Number one, tell, tell Air Core what you're looking for. Number two, have Air Core detect objects in the scene. And number three, attach your virtual content to these physical objects. And because this is a developer conference, I want to show you those same steps in code. We're going to go through them in Java really quick. Uh, but this is also the same for Unity and Unreal. The concepts apply across all of our development environments. So we'll go through the same exact steps again. Step number one is you need to add images to AR Core's memory. You need to tell it what images it's interested in. And so here, we're creating this new augmented images database and just adding an image to it. And we're doing this in real time on the phone. Now, this is a little bit expensive. You have to pay a cost computationally for each image you add. So a little bit later, I'll also show you, show you how to create it with the alternate flow on the computer. But once AR Core has a database of images that it can detect, we go to the second step. So the second step is AR Core is always looking for those images for you. And you can get it from the AR frame, each and every frame that AR, sees, or that AR Core sees in the world. So now you've got a list of all the augmented images in the scene. And you want to attach virtual content to it. So that brings me to the third step. So for step number three, you just take the augmented images that the augmented image that you want, and you create an anchor off of it. And then you can attach virtual content to that anchor. And it's the same as you would for any kind of plane detection uh, or point detection that you've been used to in the past. So that's it, three simple steps. And if you want to do the pre-computation on the computer. This is what you run. So there's a command called build db. And you can pass up to 1,000 images into this command. It'll build an image database in advance that you can then load in AR Core using this code. So this loads the database from file, pulls it in. Uh, it's computationally efficient because AR Core has already done the work that it needs to to be able to recognize these images later. And now you can go off and running with the same other two steps that we showed before, which is detecting the image and then placing content relative to it. All right, pretty simple. Now I want to show you a demo of this in action. So we're going to switch to the Pixel phone here. And we're going to run this 
augmented images demo. So here, we've actually trained AR Core to recognize this poster on the wall. And so when I look at the poster, you can see that it fades out, and it goes from 2D into 3D. And now as I move, the perspective that I see changes. So I've got a 3D object coming out of this 2D texture. Nothing's really changed in the world, but I can make it more engaging and immersive. All right, so that's the demo of augmented images. Pretty simple. And now I want to talk a little bit about some use cases. Posters are great for demos, but we think augmented images have a lot more potential as well. So the first use case that we're excited about is education. Imagine a textbook coming to life in front of you, or going into a museum tour where artwork on the wall jumps out at you and gives you more information about the artists or maybe their progression as they were sketching a painting. We think augmented images are useful for advertising. Advertising is all about engagement. Imagine being at a movie theater and holding your phone up to a movie poster and having content come out or telling you show times. Or imagine being at a bus stop with a little bit of time to kill and engaging with the ad that you have on the side of the bus stop station. We think augmented images can also be useful for the products that you're advertising. So here you can build products that meld the physical and digital worlds, that bring both together. It could be Castle Toy, where you have an experience that comes out of the box itself. Or it could be a how-to guide for your coffee machine as you try to make coffee for the first time with your expensive espresso machine and you have no idea what to do. So we think augmented images expand the capabilities and usefulness of AR in general. And we're really, really excited to see what you build with them. And we also are not done yet. We're going to talk about one more feature today. And for that, I'm going to bring up James Burney, who's a product manager who works with me. And he's going to talk to you about Cloud Anchors. I think you'll really enjoy it. Thanks very much. Cool. Come on up, James. So real quick, before we get started, you guys have been sitting for a while. And I really like doing this at the beginning of our things. We're going to do the wave real quick, going across the room. All right? You guys ready? Laptops, ready? All right, three, two, one, up, 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 up. Yay, AR core, woo hoo, woo. It worked. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. <laughs> All right, so like Aton mentioned, um, my name's James Burney. I'm a product manager on AR core and specifically on Cloud Anchors. Uh, raise your hand if you saw the Cloud Anchors announcement yesterday. All right, good. That's like slightly more than half. Awesome. So that's what we're going to cover in this section. Hopefully, you guys are going to be really excited by the time we get through talking with Cloud Anchors, and you're going to want to immediately start building. So before we hop into Cloud Anchors, it's really important to start with where AR is today. So could I get a quick hand if you've built an AR app before? All right, so that's roughly about half of you. So for the other half, what happens when Let's say that together we're going to build an app where we're going to place some dinosaurs. And so we're going to have a T Rex over here and maybe a Triceratops over here, and they're going to interact. The way that we would do that in an AR app today is we would plant an anchor, and then the T Rex and the Triceratops would be placed as relative offsets from, the, from those anchors. And that becomes your reference frame in your AR app. Now, let's say that. Aton were to come back up on stage. He's not going to come up because that's a long walk. But uh, Aton goes ahead and creates a separate dinosaur app over here. And he places, say, a bunch of pterodactyls. And again, he pl plants an anchor. And his pterodactyls are all placed relative to that anchor. Now, what's missing is Aton's app is running in a different reality, a different augmented reality than the app that we have over here. And the reason why is those two anchors can't talk to each other. So this is what Cloud Anchor solves, is we give you the ability to create a shared reference frame. So that reference frame I was mentioning before, where you have the anchor and you have the offsets to our T-Rex and to our pterodactyl, that now we can have a common anchor in the middle that, and all the AR content, so everything from pterodactyls to uh, T-Rexes, are able to then interact and play. And then you can create these really fun experiences where not only is my content interacting with Aton's content, but I can control Aton's content, he can control mine. That's pretty cool. So 
that's kind of an abstract thing where I'm like literally moving my hands around on stage. A more concrete example uh, would be our Just Align app, which, if you haven't seen it before, is an experimental app that we as Google built. It literally draws a single line in space. And what we added to it is the ability to do not just one artist, but multiple artists drawing in the same space. So I'm going to show you an extended version of the video they showed you really quickly yesterday, where you can see multiple artists drawing together. And hopefully you see from this video the powerful experience that you get out of this, where no longer is it where now you're able to interact with your friends and draw together. And what one person draws the line, you can build on top of that. So I'll give it a second here for the video to finish and for you guys to absorb what's going on, because that's a new concept. OK, so let's talk a little bit about how we create these cloud anchors. We've done an awful lot of work to make it very simple. So it's only a few steps. Let me walk you through them. So step one is let's take in this example and make our stick woman. Her name was going to be Alice. And Alice is going to place a cloud anchor. Now, the verb that we use to create a cloud anchor is called hosting. The reason why is we're going to host that native anchor up to the cloud. So when we host that cloud anchor, the features, which are the visual features in the environment. So let's say that Alice is standing here. And as Alice is looking at the table, she places a cloud anchor, or the app will place a cloud anchor for her on the stage right here next to our beautiful succulent. Do you guys like our succulent? OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate the one person. OK. So what the phone is going is to extract from the environment is all the points where these leaves come to what the phone will see as contrast points, where the colors change, where the lighting changes. So the edge of this table, the edge of this tablecloth, every point where the leaves kind of change, those are the visual features that get abstracted and then get uploaded to the cloud. That then gets saved and processed. And what Alice gets back in a couple seconds is that cloud anchor. Now, in that cloud anchor is a really important attribute. That attribute is the cloud anchor ID. So you can kind of think about the cloud anchor ID as you can think about cloud anchors as a, the same way you think about a file. So say you're just going to save a file to Google Drive. And when you save it, you need to create a file name, right? Well, with Cloud Anchors, we're going to create that, essentially that file name or that ID for you. And that ID is the way that you're going to reference it later. It'd be really hard to find the file without knowing the name, right? So that, the Cloud Anchor ID is the same concept. So how this comes into play is all Alice needs to do to get Bob, our stick man over there, to connect to Alice's Cloud Anchor is to, excuse me, is to send over that Cloud Anchor ID to Bob. And that's all she, needs, all she needs to send over to Bob. Once Bob has the Cloud Anchor ID, he then uses the Cloud Anchor ID to, and our verb here is resolve. And resolving will add the Cloud Anchor ID to Bob's reference frame. So let's say that Bob is standing right here as well. He looks at the same area, the visual features that will get uploaded to the cloud. And the cloud will match those visual features against the visual features that Alice had previously uploaded. And we will give Bob back a cloud anchor that will be relative to where his device is. So even though both devices are in different locations, we'll create the cloud anchor in a f consistent physical location. And that's the magic. Because they're in a consistent physical location, you then have a shared reference frame. And then at that point, we can place, again, let's use dinosaurs, because everybody loves dinosaurs, right? We can place our dinosaurs relative to that cloud anchor, and we can start our shared AR experience. Hopefully that makes sense. Oh, Cloud Anchor comes back. And then I'm going to tie it all together here. We created a very fancy visualization. The orange dots that come up, those are the visual features we were talking about. They go up to the cloud. Bob uploads his visual features up to the cloud. Uh, they get matched. And then the two of them create the same shared reference frame. And then once that shared reference frame is created, wait a second for the gift to loop around, you'll see that, uh, that spaceship show up. And then the two of them can follow the spaceship around the room. And once they're paired, then the devices can go anywhere in the room. And they're in the same reference frame, and they can interact together. All right, so let's keep on going one level deeper, like Inception. 
with some sample code. OK, so same format as before. But before we get to those two methods of hosting and resolving, it's really important that we, <laughs> that we enable the feature. So when you're working with AR Core, uh, interact with the uh, session.config and turn on our feature. You need to do this on all devices, um, but hopefully this is pretty straightforward. Then on the first device, so this is Alice's device, the one that creates the Cloud Anchor, the main method we need to call here is host Cloud Anchor. On host Cloud, and then with Cloud, excuse me, with host Cloud Anchor, you can feed in any pre existing native anchor. So, as Atom was mentioning before, uh, normally this is created from a horizontal plane or now from a vertical plane. And you can pass in that anchor into host Cloud Anchor asynchronously. That call will complete in a couple of seconds. And what comes back is your Cloud Anchor. Now, what did we talk about is the really important thing that comes from the Cloud Anchor? All right, Cloud Anchor ID, thank you. <laughs> so, and then uh, it is completely up to you what means of device to device communication you want to use. The demo that we're going to show you in a second uses Firebase. There's also two other demos in the sandboxes I'd encourage you to check out. Those also use Firebase as well. It's a great means to communicate between, but you can use any, any means you want. So, then on Bob's device, and it's a really important point here. This is not limited to just Bob. We could also have Bob, Jerry, um, Johnny, Aton. Um, and it can be as many users as we want. That all they need to do to join that Cloud Anchor is receive the Cloud Anchor ID. That's the one that Alice just sent over. And then we need to resolve that Cloud Anchor. In order to resolve the Cloud Anchor, it's dead simple. All you need to do is pass in the Cloud Anchor ID in the background under the hood, we will take those visual features from what the user is currently looking at. So it's important that the user is, again, currently looking where Alice was. And we'll upload those features and then give you that Cloud Anchor back. And then at that point, you're good to go. You can start placing assets relative to that Cloud Anchor. So quick question. What operating system were those devices in that code example running on? Anyone? All right. So the really important point here is Cloud Anchors work on both Android, which means any AR core enabled Android device, and any, I any iOS AR kit, uh, AR kit enabled device, which for today is going to be iPhones. And we believe this is a really important, this is incredibly important to making shared AR a reality. It's in, there's no reason that we should discriminate which of our friends can play a game with us based on which operating system they run on their phone. That's not really important to whether or not Aton and I are friends. If he has an iPhone, he should be able to play shared AR with me, right? So now I'm going to invite Aton up on stage. And we're going to give you guys a live demo, because it's one thing to show you. It's one thing to say that everything works cross-platform, but it's another thing to show you guys with a live demo. All right. So maybe one last poll just to get started. Who thinks I'm going to win this game? Raise your hand. Oh. Oh, it's tough. All right, who thinks James is going to win? That's the rest of you, right? <laughs> okay. So you guys are getting to know Aton better every minute. And it's really important to know Aton sandbags a lot. OK. I just got to join this room. OK. So okay. now I'm going to set up my board. And James, you set up yours. Yep. And so you, you want to get close to me, right? <laughs> you need that, yeah. that help. Well, I'm also showing off a little bit here. You can see as mine's moving around, the same state is being reflected in both at the same physical location. Yeah. So I'm going to press that. Here's our futuristic looking light boards. All right, here we go. All right. Uh, and we have people in the back that are organizing bets in case anybody wants to make money off of yeah. this. Yeah, so the goal here is to turn the other person's board your color. And I feel like James has been sandbagging me in all of our practice sessions because he's doing much better than uh, he has in the past. Let's see. Oh, no. That was oh. an error. Uh. Oh, so close. Hold on. All right. Kay. Just one more shot. One more shot. You'll notice that Aton and I oh, both no. can't multitask very well. All right. Let's. Did I get him? Oh. Okay. Oh. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, it worked. All right. 
And ju just to reiterate, so that was an iPhone that Atom was using. This is a Pixel 2. But this very well could have been any Android AR core, AR core enabled device. That could have been any AR kit enabled device. And there's my clicker. OK, so let's talk about use cases. There's, that was gaming. That was an example of gaming working really well. But there's, shared AR does not need to stop at gaming. We think there's a whole lot of other categories where shared AR can make a big difference in the world. Oops. Can you, Lance, help me? <laughs> can you go back a slide, please? Pretty, please? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK. So uh, four categories that briefly let's talk about. So one is in the education space. Uh, this is an example of, let me ask, let me phrase this as a question instead. So which would be, ra raise your hand after I say the two options. Option A, you can learn about what it's like to explore on Mars and the Mars missions from a textbook, option A. Option B, you can learn from an interactive 3D model of the rover that you can play with with your friends. Uh, all for option A. OK, option B. All right. <laughs> See, we're making improvements in how people learn. Uh, it, so the, and the demo that we're showing you here, this is an example that NASA built for us. The, this doesn't need to stop at space exploration, although like, that's a pretty big area to explore. You could do this as well in any sort of visual area, such as biology. Um, there's a couple cool demos where you can explore the human body together. Um, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> creative, let's hop on down to creative expression. So you saw our just a line example, which is where we draw the white line in space. But we can go beyond that. Uh, take, for example, this block building app that was built by Euphoria, uh, where you can build a full um, block building thing and then 3D print it later. Yeah, it's very, very cool. Um, and it, you can imagine what this would look like as well with the AR stickers. Ho uh, raise your hand if you played with AR stickers. Yeah. So you, know, you can imagine what this would look like if now, as you're placing stormtroopers or uh, help me, the Demogorgon. Uh, as you're placing Demogorgon, someone else can place L and have the fight be between your different phones. Right? That would be a very fun experience. Gaming. So now you can do ice fishing with your friends. Haven't you guys always wanted to do that? <laughs> I, I, um, believe me, it actually is an awful lot more fun than it sounds when you just say ice fishing with your friends. Um, it's particularly fun on a hot day in San Francisco to be able to uh, look down at the sidewalk and turn the sidewalk into a ice fishing pool. Beyond ice fishing, you could also play, you can imagine playing laser tag with your friends. can now be just with your phones. You don't need to buy special gear. You can just, you know, two people quickly pair, do host and resolve, and then you're off and going and playing laser tag with as many of your friends as possible because cloud anchors are not limited just to two devices. You can use n number of devices. And then shopping. So how many of you guys have bought something and then had your partner, when it actually showed up, uh, veto it, then you had to return it? Show of hands? Yeah, that's like a big pain, right? Then you have to go through, like, find the UPS store, the FedEx store, mail it back. That's not a good experience. It's a lot better if you can preview it with your partners. So now, with Cloud Anchors, if I'm placing a speaker system here, I can have my wife also look at that speaker system from her phone. And there's a, certain, there's a feeling of consistency and a feeling of trust that you built if you're the advertiser or, or the e-commerce site that if you have two users looking at it and it shows up consistently for both of them, you build this trust that the product I'm buying when I'm previewing it is actually going to look that way when it shows up because it's showing up on multiple devices. All right, so that's everything for Cloud Anchors. Now let's talk about getting started. So AirCore, no surprise, already supports Unity and Unreal, your standard game engines. And then obviously we support Android Studio for Android native development. As well, since Cloud Anchors are cross-platform, we, we provide a SDK uh, so that you can do your development in Xcode as well. All four of these environments are live as of yesterday at 1 PM. Thank you. So for the folks here at I.O., 
you guys have a bunch of resources, or you folks have a bunch of resources that you have at your disposal, please take advantage of them. There are three awesome demos in the sandbox. If you guys like playing light, Lightboard, and especially if you want to play Aton in Lightboard, our sandbox is right over there in the AR sandbox. Uh, Aton will be there up until somebody beats him. Right, Aton? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, we also have the Just Align demo over in the Experiment Sandbox. Please check that out. And then the demo that Aton showed with, the, with this picture frame, as well as two others, are available in the AR Sandbox. Uh, it's a really, really fun exhibit. Please go ahead and play around with it. I suspect it will give you a bunch of very cool ideas for what you can, what you can build. We, for Code Labs, we have over 80 workstations set up. Please play around with them. Every workstation is also paired with an Android device. So not only can you go through the code, but you can actually compile it onto the phone. And then you can, play with, you can see what the code you just built actually works like on a phone. And then we also have office hours. Please take advantage of that. We have some, guru, some incredibly intelligent guru staff to answer any questions you have. And then a quick shameless plug. Our, our team, the AR core team, is incredibly busy giving talks this week. Please take advantage of those. We've done, done an awful lot of work putting those into you to give you a very concise explanation. Uh, there's two more today and two more tomorrow. And then after I.O., or for the folks online, developers.com uh, slash AR, or developers.google.com slash AR, uh, has all the extra resources, plus all the code labs are also available on there. And again, all four of our SDKs are available as of yesterday. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. The sun comes out and it's a new day. I'm gonna make it on my own. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'm standing here with Hannah Beekler who is a production designer. You may know her from Black Panther. Hello. Hi, how are you today? <laughs> great, I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here. Me too. We're really glad that you came here to talk about your work and to talk about diversity and inclusion and how that's affected by representation in media. Absolutely. I mean, I think a big important part of that is if you don't see it, you can't be it. And so putting those things into our narrative work in films, which, you know, everybody finds the time to go see a good movie, as noted by Infinity War, and, you know, and to represent uh, a, a huge portion of the, you know, population in that way, I think when people see it, they realize, like, I can do that. I can have those same goals in life because it's not going to be impossible. And I think that that's such an, a huge important part of my work um, and my body of work over the last three years. Yeah, one of the things I, I think about a lot is that I was really lucky growing up wanting to be an engineer and seeing lots of engineers that looked for, like me. And that was inspiring and I really want that for everyone. Absolutely. I mean, I think inspiring the next generation of young scientists who are female, young kids of color um, who see a world where they have a sense of pride, where they have a sense of you know, reaching back and, and seeing their tradition and their culture and their ancestors and all those things, even being a part of their future. And I think walking away with a huge sense of themselves that they otherwise may not know or have had privy to or so it, it's it's lifting spirits that's so important um, when it comes to rep representation it's not only about getting into certain fields it's about who we're we're raising in the world for the for the future for because I know I'm gonna be relying on my young child to take care of me <laughs> and I want him to know some things so you know that's it's always on my mind and it's something that I I think I'm now more than ever driven to do and include as part of my design aesthetic. Yeah, it's almost like if you can see it, you can be it. Absolutely. Um, 
and I've been watching, you know, I watch all the videos on Twitter. People will send me stuff of teachers teaching um, about the sort of, you know, things that we did. You know, I, I did a deep dive, but it was sort of a, a lighter dive into uh, the technology in Black Panther and the science in Black Panther. And, and teachers are coming up with a way to teach their class using Black Panther as an example of sort of our, our vibranium and our, uh, you know, sound science that we use in the movie. And, and to see that being a, coming part of like a curriculum and kids getting excited about it because they see themselves and yeah, I can, I can do this is, I mean, you can't ask for anything more. And so, I, you know, I, I've always thought like, what can I do to better the world as one individual? And I didn't really know ever what that was until I think after Black Panther and I saw the response of um, young kids and it was all about the representation. And so, you know, that does become a design, a design choice. And uh, it's something that I think that I'm just gonna do now forever. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that a little bit more because uh, you're on record as saying that when you were working on Black Panther, you were just focusing on it being good, yeah. right? <laughs> and, but then afterwards, looking back on how big a deal this is for how many people? How has your perspective changed? I mean, it, it hugely, because it was just, you're kind of in it, you know, and you can't, like you were saying, see the forest through the trees. So you're just wanting to make sure it's good and it's right and that people are gonna be happy and proud and that, you know, you did the right thing, you made the right choices, because at the end of the day, it was a lot of responsibility in some aspects. So I, you know, and then after when I saw it, I was like, I mean, my eyes were, cause I did a little bit of the VFX. I was there for a little bit, but I didn't see the final, final edit. I saw one of the cuts. So when I was there in the theater with everybody else, I was blown away. I was like, this is insane. I can't believe I did this. <laughs> and, and seeing the response is, it's just on another level. It's just, you know, it's really hard to put into words or articulate in a way that others can understand because it really is it made me speechless in a sense. Um, there hasn't been the words made yet to describe what that's like, but it was certainly always about making a good movie with a great story and uh, hopefully everything else sort of fell in line. And then we had other great filmmakers, Ruth Carter, who is uh, Oscar nominated costume designer who I worked with really intensively to make sure that what we did matched up, you know, because a lot of what she did in the foreground on the characters defined who they were um, on screen. So that also gave back to the representation of powerful women who had their own agency about them and could make their own decisions and stand up for themselves and could think quick on their feet. That's a whole nother sense of representation and a social aspect for young kids, young girls, um, and the men who, you know, uh, treated them on this uh, equal playing field. There was no, uh, uh, like, oh, we need to make it easy for the girls. You know, you saw the door fight. You saw the king treat them as if they were, when they were the most powerful, uh, you know, guards in uh, in Wakanda. So it's it's all of those things mixed together. Then you talk about the technology on top of that. You're giving a, a new generation, old generations, my generation, a whole another narrative than the one that we've sort of heard for the last how many ever decades. Let's talk a little bit more about the technology, but not go away from the human aspects that you're talking about. And I think one of the things that's always really interested me in technology is not how to make tech just sort of better on its own um, and then teach people how to use it, but rather teach technology how to be better for people. Absolutely. And I, th and I think that you've really captured in this film um, an intersection with culture and people and technology. How did you approach that? Oh, that's heavy, man. <laughs> um, you know, very carefully, because it's really trying to understand community, what the needs of community are, and then how do we envelop the technology, just what you said. And I know for Ryan, community was really important. So, it, and I talked to a lot of experts. It wasn't just me sort of coming up with things. I talked to a lot of people who really knew nanotechnologists, neuroscientists, archeologists, geologists, geographers, um, on a daily basis, 
to understand how to fold that in. And I think one of the biggest things that I did was I tried to find, a lot of the tech was based on biomimetics. So I tried to find in nature and in the different cultures what the use of something was and then the evolution of it. Because at the end of the day, it is all about the evolution of it, how we are in society and how we are uh, advancing technologically. So it was me relating these things back in a way that represented what they are really used for and how they would have evolved over time. Mm -hmm. And I think technologically, oftentimes, it is the thing for the thing's sake and not here is you know, something that has been such a, a, a big part of a tradition of any nationality, any ethnicity, any culture, religion, and this is how it becomes useful in a, in a futuristic and advanced way. Um, if that means technology, then that's the way that it would be. So that's sort of how I strung those together. And then pulling from nature, that was a huge one. And thereby keeping everything organic, in a sense. So it becomes not such a scary thing, but a very organic thing, because we're so used to seeing certain things in nature, patterns, shapes. Uh, you know, geometry, all of these things, math, science, it's all around us constantly. So it was really easy at some point to start just looking just into nature because it's, it is science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is technology. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like the way everything works. So looking beyond the, the hardware and the finish of the hardware of it and into the or organic nature of it all. That, that's a, like a little dive into how <laughs> it went. <laughs> it must have been a very full 14 months working on this film. Beyond. We were on three continents. We were in two states and I had a team at any given moment that were 500 strong um, just in my department. So we went 14 months and we went hard as we could go for 14 months to get this done and and put every last like my whole team put every last inch of themselves so you know it was a beautiful thing because we we represented the diaspora just our crew so it was a micro version of the macro that we were building in Wakanda and I lived that every single day for a little over a year all right I want to ask you about what's next but it doesn't have to be specific projects but it's like where do you go from here with everything that you've talked about, right? Like the, the production design itself, but like the bigger themes and ideas that you're working on. Uh, you know, I'm ch challenging myself, I think, to try to continue to do things that are out of my comfort zone. Something I learned from Ryan Coogler, who has taken me from Fruitvale Station to a boxing movie Creed to a comic book movie Black Panther. I want to continue the trend on my own and not just be in a place that I feel comfortable. My next project with Melina Matsuko, who is a director um, for Insecure, we're doing, I'm, I'm just working on the pilot for Why the Last Man, which is a graphic novel. Yes, I've read the entire series. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so I'm going to be designing the um, pilot. We're working on that currently. I can't really say much more than that, but it's super <laughs> exciting. The script is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and our approach to it is going to be, I think, something really cool. So I'm really super excited about that. Worked with Beyonce again. That's all I can say about that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the future is... Um, wide open and if Denis Villeneuve is uh, listening I'd love to do Dune. <laughs> yes. I throw that out every opportunity I can get. Denis? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah thank you so much for joining me and sharing your story and all the work that you do. Thank you so much it's super exciting I'm so happy to be here and uh, I think I'm gonna learn something today too so you know it's all about soaking in all this greatness so fabulous thank you. I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is IO Live. All the way up now. I can't imagine how anybody passes a problem that they know that they can fix and doesn't try to fix it. That's not some complicated thing. It's just stop talking about it and start doing it. I feel an absolute obligation to serve. I did two tours in Iraq as a helicopter pilot. I loved being part of the cavalry. But then I got injured, and that caused me to lose my ability to fly. One day you're a soldier. 
And then overnight, they'd rip off that tag and slap veteran on your chest. I didn't know where to start looking for the next thing. What I do is math and engineering, so I had to find a way to apply those things in a meaningful way. The service doesn't end when you get out of the military, it just changes. And I started reading about the research they were doing at the Human Engineering Research Lab. And I thought, man, I gotta go be a part of that. Hurl's mission is to help people with disabilities increase independence and quality of life. I prepare the software to support the research that we do. One of the big things that I've done is help us transition to using Android tools. They make things really accessible. Anybody can sit down and start using these technologies and perform the tasks that we hope that it'll be useful for. That's the right thing to do, is to make things not just able to be used, but to be used with the same sort of joy or ease as I do. A big part of why open technology is so attractive to engineers like myself is there's such an active community of people designing and innovating. Welcome to Pittsburgh. <laughs> All three of my children have a disability. The fact that my son has autism is just one little part of him. But almost his entire existence is defined by that autism. There was part of me that hoped someday I'd be able to help my son be able to live independently and give him a future. What's that? That's part of why I became an engineer. It's part of why I get into this field. There's going to be a time where someone like my son will have gotten a better opportunity, a better swing at this thing. I'm not going to sit around and wait for somebody else to fix the problem. There's not a minute to be wasted thinking about anything but the good things that we can do. This is IO Live, and I'm Timothy Jordan, and I'm standing here with Hannah Beekler, who is a production designer. You may know her from Black Panther. Hello. Hi, how are you today? <laughs> I gotta give it one of these. Great, I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here. Me too. We're really glad that you came here to talk about your work and to talk about diversity and inclusion and how that's affected by representation in media. Absolutely. I mean, I think a big important part of that is if you don't see it, you can't be it. And so mm. putting those things into our narrative work in films, which, you know, everybody finds the time to go see a good movie, as noted by Infinity War, and, you know, and to represent uh, a, a huge portion of the, you know, population in that way, I think when people see it, they realize, like, I can do that. I can have those same goals in life because it's not going to be impossible and I think that that's such an, a huge important part of my work um, and my body of work over the last three years. Yeah one of the things I, I think about a lot is that I was really lucky growing up wanting to be an engineer and seeing lots of engineers that looked for, like me and that was inspiring and I really want that for everyone. Absolutely I mean I think inspiring the next generation of young scientists who are female, young kids of color, um, who see a world where they have a sense of pride, where they have a sense of you know, reaching back and, and seeing their tradition and their culture and their ancestors and all those things, even being a part of their future. And I think walking away with a huge sense of themselves that they otherwise may not know or have had privy to or so it, it's it's lifting spirits that's so important um, when it comes to rep representation it's not only about getting into certain fields it's about who we're we're raising in the world for the for the future for because I know I'm gonna be relying on my young child to take care of me <laughs> and I want him to know some things so you know that's it's always on my mind and it's something that I I think I'm now more than ever driven to do and include as part of my design aesthetic. Yeah, it's almost like if you can see it, you can be it. Absolutely. Um, and I've been watching, you know, I watch all the videos on Twitter. People will send me stuff of teachers teaching um, about the sort of, you know, things that we did. You know, I, I did a deep dive, but it was sort of a, a lighter dive into uh, the technology in Black Panther and the science in Black Panther. And, and teachers are coming up with a way to teach their class 
using Black Panther as an example of sort of our, our vibranium and our, uh, you know, sound science that we use in the movie. And, and to see that being a coming part of like a curriculum and kids getting excited about it because they see themselves and yeah, I can, I can do this is, I mean, you can't ask for anything more. And so, you know, I, I've always thought like, what can I do to better the world as one individual? And I didn't really know ever what that was until I think after Black Panther and I saw the response of um, young kids and it was all about the representation. And so, you know, that does become a design, a design choice. And uh, it's something that I think that I'm just going to do now forever. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that a little bit more because uh, you're on record as saying that when you were working on Black Panther, you were just focusing on it being good, yeah. right? <laughs> and, but then afterwards, looking back on how big a deal this is for how many people, how has your perspective changed? I mean, it, it hugely, because it was just, you're kind of in it, you know, and you can't, like you were saying, see the forest through the trees. So you're just wanting to make sure it's good and it's right and that people are gonna be happy and proud and that, you know, you did the right thing, you made the right choices, because at the end of the day, it was a lot of responsibility in some aspects. So I, you know, and then after when I saw it, I was like, I mean, my eyes were, because I did a little bit of the VFX, I was there for a little bit, but I didn't see the final, final edit. I saw one of the cuts. So when I was there in the theater with everybody else, I was blown away. I was like, this is insane. I can't believe I did this. <laughs> and, and seeing the response is, it's just on another level. It's just you know it's really hard to put into words or articulate in a way that others can understand because it really is made me speechless in a sense um there hasn't been the words made yet to describe what that's like but it was certainly always about making a good movie with a great story and uh, hopefully everything else sort of fell in line and then we had other great filmmakers ruth carter who is uh, oscar nominated costume designer who I worked with really intensively to make sure that what we did matched up, you know, because a lot of what she did in the foreground on the characters defined who they were um, on screen. So that also gave back to the representation of powerful women who had their own agency about them and could make their own decisions and stand up for themselves and could think quick on their feet. That's a whole nother sense of representation and a social aspect for young kids, young girls, um, and the men who, you know, uh, treated them on this uh, equal playing field. There was no, uh, uh, like, oh, we need to make it easy for the girls. You know, you saw the door fight. You saw the king treat them as if they were, when they were the most powerful, uh, you know, guards in, uh, in Wakanda. So it's, it's all of those things mixed together. Then you talk about the technology on top of that. You're giving a, a new generation, old generations, my generation, a whole nother narrative than the one that we've sort of heard for the last how many ever decades. Let's talk a little bit more about the technology, but not go away from the human aspects that you're talking about. And I think one of the things that's always really interested me in technology is not how to make tech just sort of better on its own um, and then teach people how to use it, but rather teach technology how to be better for people. Absolutely. And I, th and I think that you've really captured in this film um, an intersection with culture and people and technology. How did you approach that? Oh, that's heavy, man. <laughs> um, you know, very carefully, because it's really trying to understand community, what the needs of community are, and then how do we envelop the technology, just what you said. And I know for Ryan, community was really important. So, it, and I talked to a lot of experts. It wasn't just me sort of coming up with things. I talked to a lot of people who really knew nanotechnologists, neuroscientists, archeologists, geologists, geographers, um, on a daily basis to understand how to fold that in. And I think one of the biggest things that I out. Thank you all so much for coming. My name's Jonathan, and I work on the Mobile Ninjas. We're a team within Google passionate about testing and testability. If you've ever written tests for Android before, it's likely you've used some of our products, Espresso, RoboElectric, or the Android Testing Support Library. And together, these tools combine for billions of test invocations, both within and outside of Google. 
So today, there's a general consensus within the software development community of the virtues of writing tests. Sure, there's a cost to writing tests, but it's an accepted one, and it's one that quickly pays dividends throughout the life cycle of your project. Tests provide fast feedback on failures. Like a bug caught early on in development is far cheaper to fix than after you've deployed your application. They give you a safety net for making changes to your code. You're free to refactor, clean up, and optimize, safe in the knowledge that you're not going to break any of the existing functionality. And what's more, a suite of readable tests provides the living, breathing specification of your application's behavior. Now, in software development, there exists the concept of the testing pyramid. It's made up of three layers, unit, integration, and end-to-end -end tests. And as you go up the pyramid, you're gaining fidelity. But this comes at the expense of test execution time. It also gets harder to maintain and debug these kinds of tests. But just like a rock band, where you need a perfect blend of musicians to create that great track, each layer in the pyramid is equally important. You're leveraging the uh, advantages of one layer to compensate for trade-offs in others to produce a holistic automated testing environment. We recommend a 70-20-10 uh, split as a general healthy guideline. And now, while the rules of these pyramids still apply, some of the unique characteristics of Android development have introduced some difficulties along the way. So unit tests, due to their need to be fast, will run on the local workstation. And integration and end-to-end -end tests, due to their need to run in a really faithful environment, tend to run on a real or a virtual device. And so separate tools have evolved at each layer of the pyramid. RoboElectric, or the mockable Android framework for your off-device unit tests. Espresso and the Android testing support library for those on-device tests. Now, Android's got some really familiar core concepts, such as getting a handle to your application context or maybe driving your activity lifecycle. And each of these tools has its own distinct APIs and ways of doing things for achieving these exact same tasks. Now, this has led to something of a test writing crisis. As a developer, it's uh, hard sometimes to know what tools are available for use and which of those are recommended. Having multiple tools at each level has led to an explosion of styles, each with their own distinct patterns and APIs. And this, in turn, leads to a lack of mobility between layers. Tests can't easily be refactored or reused between layers in the pyramid without being completely rewritten for a new tool. To discuss this further, let's orientate ourselves with what constitutes a well-structured test. So there's some following common patterns that define a well-structured test. Um, and so we generally break tests down into three clear sections, given, when, and then. And I like to separate them with a blank line to clearly demarcate them. So given some predetermined state of the system, when you execute an action that you wish to test, then verify the new state of the system or some behavior has occurred. Be sure to name the test after both the condition you're testing and the expected outcome. Keep the test focused on very specific behavior, and then test all your, all your behaviors independently. And less is always more with tests. These guidelines will help you keep each test understandable in isolation. Use common setup methods only for scaffolding. This is maybe uh, creating the object that's under test and wiring up some of its dependencies. Let's take a look at the problem of the explosion of styles, and we'll highlight this using a simple test case. We'll have a single activity with one button that responds to a click, sending an intent to the Android system. And I'm going to walk you through a, this test case, comparing the different styles of Mojito, RoboElectric, or Espresso. 
So first up, let's consider Mockito. Now, mocking is a really powerful tool, but it's one that's often overused and sometimes used inappropriately. Mocking your own classes is great, but while mocking the Android framework may seem like a great idea at first, it can soon lead down a path of difficult problems. Many Android classes are stateful, or they have complex contracts, and these are really difficult or even impossible to satisfy with mocks. So even though we don't recommend it, let's just start by taking a look at one of these tests and walk through it using the Mockito framework to um, mock the Android framework. So in the given section, we can new up our um, activity under test. But look, we first of all have to stub out some of the uh, Android framework behavior in the superclass activity so that it responds as we expect in our tests. Now, this introduces some problems. First of all, we're partially stubbing the class under test. And this means we're not testing the true behavior of that object under test. And furthermore, it brings with it excessive stubbing, which introduces all this undesirable boilerplate. And that quickly becomes distracting from the true intention of your test. For the when section of the test, to execute your code under test, you'd have first had to need to register an argument captor earlier to get a handle on that click listener, which you would then invoke manually to, um, to call the code that you're wishing to test. Now, with this approach, you can soon descend into an undesirable mess of argument captors, stubbing calls, and answer invocations. Finally, in the then section, to obtain intent sent to the Android system, you're going to have to use another argument captor. And mocking the Android frameworks in this way tends to force you into testing implementation details when you want to be testing behavior instead. And furthermore, these drawbacks have tended to lead to developers to build their own abstractions to isolate Android. This, in turn, leads to its own set of problems. Firstly, you're introducing another layer of cruft into your application. And secondly, you're introducing texting gaps where bugs can hide. And we believe that while you should architect your application very thoughtfully, the limitations of the tools shouldn't dictate your application architecture either. So let's see how this looks like with RoboElectric. RoboElectric is the popular open source testing framework it allows you to follow the best practices surrounding mocks, as you're able to use real Android objects in your tests rather than having to program uh, your own stubbing behavior in each test. It runs on your local host, which means it's very fast, making it ideal for unit tests. RoboElectric tends to create tests that read a lot cleaner. So let's walk through each section in turn. In the given section, we can simply bring an activity into the resume state for our test just by calling RoboElectric's setup activity API. In the when section, we're able to use real Android SDK APIs, such as find view by ID, to get a hold of the view, and then RoboElectric's click on API, safely click on that view and invoke the code that we wish to test. And finally, in the then section, we again use RoboElectric's own testing APIs to check that the intent was sent to the system. See how much cleaner this version is. We're focusing on the items that really matter in the test, and we're free of all those extra pieces of distraction. Now, Espresso is a UI testing framework, and it runs on a real or a virtual device. It provides you with a really realistic environment. The trade-off here is a much slower execution speed. You're building up your entire APK, deploying it to the device, and instantiating the test run, waiting for the results, and then collecting those back on your local workstation. All of this is adding valuable development cycles. Now, the exact same Android concepts exist here. We're just getting hold of an activity, clicking a button, and then verifying an intent was sent to the Android system. Here, though, as you'll see, the APIs are very different. Let's step through this one together. So in the given section, we'll use the activity test rule, 
which comes from the Android testing support library. This can be used to start an activity, bring it to the resume state, and provide us with a handle to it in our tests. For the when section, we can use the Espresso view matcher APIs to find the view in question and then safely click on it to invoke the code that we wish to test. And finally, in the then section, we use the Espresso intents library to capture that tent and verify that it was the one that we wanted sent to the system. Notice here that while a test has many similar structures to RoboElectric test, the example that we saw earlier, the syntax is very, very different. So while each of these testing frameworks have contra contrasting strengths and weaknesses, it's this explosion of styles that's really become the big problem for writing tests. Who in the audience has been using RoboElectric to write tests? Raise your hands. And what about Espresso? And who's using both? We often hear developers talking about, you know, I need to write a RoboElectric test, or I need an Espresso test. But we'd much rather you be thinking about writing an Android test instead. We feel as a developer that no matter what kind of test you're writing, you shouldn't first have to think about environments and tools and libraries that you'll need. We believe that you shouldn't have to suffer the mental load of having to learn multiple sets of APIs for doing exactly the same thing. So, uh, and of course, you should have the freedom to refactor and reuse your code, no matter where you choose to run it. So what if there was only one set of APIs that you needed to learn? And now imagine also being free on, to focus on writing your test, rather than considering those tools and libraries and environments. Well, to make this a reality, Today, we're launching Android Test. It's part of Jetpack. With Jetpack, testing is now a first-class citizen of the Android tool chain. We're unifying the development e experience around a canonical, high-quality set of APIs that will reduce the boilerplate and eliminate the number of tools that you need to learn. Naturally, Kotlin in support is included, allowing you to write beautifully concise tests. And of course, all of this will be open sourced. We love contributions from our community members. We're going to satisfy developers' needs in each of the four key sections of the test. Remember, scaffolding, given, when, and then. Scaffolding encompasses the configuration and control APIs. Think getting a hold of that application context. For your test scaffolding, Android JUnit Forerunner is used to execute your tests. You can use the instrumentation registry to get a handle to that application context. Well, today, we're excited to announce, for the very first time, you can now use these APIs for both your on and off device tests. The next section of a test is the given section. And here, we're going to provide two key categories of APIs for you. Firstly, the Android JUnit rules from the Android Testing Support Library will become part of Jetpack. And we'll be soon adding more APIs to help drive the component lifecycles for you in tests. As you've seen previously, the activity test rule is used to start up your activity and make it available to the test in the resume state. You've probably used this API running on a device many times before. Well, today, this API too will be available for tests that run off device as well. Secondly, we'll be providing you with a set of Android test data builders. These will help you construct Android objects that your code under test will interact with. Many of the Android framework classes that you need to have for setting up uh, your test state are difficult to create. Often, there's no public constructor, so they can't be instantiated for test. Perhaps they're final, so mocking's out of the question either. And sometimes they're just plain clumsy to instantiate with any degree of brevity at all. So we're including Android test builders within Jetpack to give you a concise way to set up your test environment. They produce readable code. They're a fluent way to create the Android components that you need to interact with. And of course, they're portable. 
Android test data builders work for both your on and off device use cases. The third section of a well-structured test is the when section, exercising the code under test. Usually, this is just simply a case of calling your own code directly. But when you're writing a UI test, it's likely that you'd write for the, uh, reach for the Espresso ViewMatcher APIs. Today, we're happy to announce that Espresso 2 is joining Android Test Jetpack. Espresso View APIs are fluent, and they read beautifully. You've used them for your on-device tests for a while now. And today, we're providing preliminary support for these tests in the off-device use case also. The final part of a well-structured test is the then section. This is where you make assertions on the state of the system in response to an action. So firstly, Espresso Intents 2 is going to be joining Jetpack as uh, Android Test Intents. Those Intents APIs that you've been using for your on-device testing, great news. Today, they too will run in your off-device tests. And finally, we're also releasing an assertions library to help reduce the boilerplate in your tests. Using traditional JUnit assertions can lead to tests that are not immediately readable. See here how easy it is to get the actual and the expected arguments mixed up. And Android uses a lot of integer constants for efficiency. But this makes it difficult to comprehend the error messages in tests. At Google, we love to use Truth. It's our own open source fluent testing assertions library. Using a fluent assertions library is a great step to producing more readable code. And writing the test becomes much more easy, too, because you can lean on the built-in support of your IDE's auto-completion feature. So to help you write concise tests against Android code, we'll be releasing a set of truth extensions for Android, which reduces the boilerplate, reads beautifully, and gives immediately meaningful error messages. Of course, these assertions will work across all environments, both for your on and off device tests. So with Jetpack Android Test, we'll be bringing you the tools that you need so that you can concentrate on writing beautifully concise, easy to read tests without first worrying about libraries or tools or environments. A single set of canonical APIs for common tasks that will reduce the boilerplate, leaving your test clear and readable, and that are environmentally agnostic, allowing you to run the tests either on device, on your local workstation, or perhaps in a cloud test lab. And now that I've shown you how to use a unified set of APIs that decouple the act of actually writing a test from where it's going to run, I'll hand you over to my colleague, Stefan, who's going to show you how you can run these tests in the new simplified world. Stefan. Thank you, Jonathan. Welcome, everyone. 10 years Android, quite amazing. I also want to say a big welcome to everybody who is joining us at the live stream today. At Google, we believe that testing should be a fundamental part of your app development strategy. Let's bring back the pyramid. As we can see, our friend with the chat pack has solved the API dilemma. Now that we got one API to rule them all, it's really easy to start writing tests for Android. No more excuses. We can start with a simple test for our business logic, usually a unit test. And over time, we can add more and more tests. Once we start implementing the UI for our application, it might be worth adding an integration test. This just became a fluent experience, since both layers support the same APIs. No more context switching. Great. But that's not the only use case where the new API become really handy. Let's imagine we have an integration test that got too large and complicated. 
I have seen many of those tests. It's just too convenient to test business logic and UI flow in one single test. At Google, we don't like those tests. They are hard to read, and they tend to become flaky. Small, well-focused tests are much better. So let's refactor this large, complicated test. Refactoring a large test can be a very painful task. Who in the audience has experienced this recently? Raise your hand. Here's some good news for you. If the original test was written with the new API, this task becomes much simpler. We still have to test our UI, and we'll keep this part in the integration test. This layer provides high fidelity, and we don't want to lose that for our UI tests. The rest, mainly business logic, can directly go into the unit test layer. Here, we gain speed, since we can run off device on a local Java VM. So let's verify the refactoring together. We still have high fidelity for the UI test. That's good. We gain speed even better. And the tests are decoupled and less complex. Nice job. Your coworkers will thank you. So let's run those tests. But wait, we still have to choose a runtime environment. It's not always trivial to pick the right one. We also have to work in multiple source sets. The combination of runtime environments plus source sets will lead to an explosion of test configurations. Just imagine how hard it will get to choose the right configuration. Should they run on a device or off a device? And don't we need to run the entire test suite on our continuous integration server before we submit? And you all know the feeling after we kicked off the test run, waiting eagerly for the results. Oh, no. Hold the submit. One of the tests is flaky. I'm pretty sure many of you have been in this situation. Flakiness is one of the biggest pain points for developer productivity. So what if there was a better way to set up your test harness, execute your tests in a reliable environment with unified test results? Today, we are proud to announce Project Nitrogen the new single entry point for all Android tests. Nitrogen is fuel for your jetpacks. With our expertise of running billions of tests a year, we had to build the fastest and most reliable test executor. Nitrogen covers the entire testing lifecycle, from setup to test execution and reporting. Nitrogen provides deterministic behavior across different build systems. It will be fully integrated in Android Studio. At Google, we already use Nitrogen to test our own apps, such as Gmail, Google Maps, Photos, YouTube, and many more. Nitrogen is highly extensible. It provides APIs for test authors to customize the test invocation at any point. Nitrogen will be fully open sourced later this year. But let me give you an overview. Starting with setup, Nitrogen connects your test to any execution environment, on device, off device, or in the cloud. It installs required test artifacts. And if necessary, it can run custom fixture scripts for you. Let me show you how this works. First, Nitrogen finds and provisions a device. This can either be a simulated device, a virtual device, or a real device. 
Once the device is ready, NitroChain installs the application under test and the test. NitroChain stages any test data dependencies and sets device properties. If additional setup is necessary, it can all be done here. Let me give you examples. Setting up a network tunnel, starting a hermetic server, gaining, granting permissions, and much more. And finally, it prepares the device for the next step, test execution. There are many ways how we can run an Android test. It's a little bit like running in the real world. Here we have sprints, mid-distance, and long-distance runs. We also have different environments, track running, road running, cross-country running, and mountain running. A unit test on your local workstation is like a sprint, as fast as possible to the finish line. The test suite on your continuous integration server is the marathon. The goal is to get to the finish line and not to fail along the way. Today, these tests are executed in different ways, from the command line, from Android Studio, or triggered automatically when you submit. With Project Nitrogen, this will become consistent. We provide a well-defined protocol and are unifying all the Android test offerings. Nitrogen uses our own device infrastructure to run your tests. Android Orchestrator and Android JUnit Runner. You can already enable the own device infrastructure today. It has been available since Android Studio 3.0. The orchestrator collects your tests and kicks off test execution. By running each test in a separate process, shared state is minimized and crashes are isolated. Moreover, your tests are executed in a familiar J unit environment provided by Android J unit runner. The orchestrator collects all test results, additional artifacts, and streams it back to Nitrogen. Nitrogen provides a unified reporting format for these test results. In addition, it provides a huge selection of test output data, such as logcat, screenshots, video, profiling data, battery performance, and much more. All artifacts are scoped per test. This means that, for example, a locket snippet is reduced to the test method. No more digging through hundreds of lines of locket. So let me show you how Nitrogen improves the entire testing flow on Android. First, Nitrogen finds a device and configures it for the test run. Second, it runs tests in isolation using the orchestrator. And finally, while tests are running, Nitrogen host side infrastructure will be streaming the test results from the device, pulling down all test output data, and feeding it back to you. With Nitrogen, all this complexity is hidden from you. Whether you're running a test on Android Studio or on a CI server, Nitrogen is the single entry point for all Android tests. It works from a sprint to a marathon. Nitrogen can request the device in a Firebase test lab, reliably running your tests returning unified test results. Nitrogen supports Google Cloud. 
from your workstation, you can deploy and run tests on a real device or on a virtual device. Nitrogen works seamlessly with RoboElectric. Now we can treat RoboElectric as a simulated device. With RoboElectric 4.0, we have made big improvements in startup time and memory consumption. RoboElectric 4.0 is released today. And if this is not enough, Nitrogen supports your custom needs. For example, if you have an in-house device lab. Allow me to summarize. Previously, you had to learn multiple approaches for doing the same thing. Tools lack the mobility to move between the layers of the pyramid. You had to choose wisely. We have reduced the cognitive load by providing you a single set of APIs that work across environments for both on and off scenarios, and a single entry point for Android tests with the flexibility to customize any point in the test invocation. Chatpack with Nitrogen is a giant leap forward in test automation for Android. Write your test once, run it everywhere. <laughs> this is just the beginning. Now, you have both the tools and the knowledge to accelerate your testing experience. I strongly encourage you to check out our code labs, especially our latest edition, Building Android Apps with Bazel. Bazel is the open source version of our internal build system, allowing you to build large Android apps at Google scale. If you have further questions, or if you would like to discuss your testing strategy, come find us tomorrow morning at 11 AM in the office hours tent in section A. We hope you enjoyed our session. And we would love to hear from you. So please take a moment to submit your feedback. And with that, happy testing. in a sense, um, there hasn't been the words made yet to describe what that's like, but it was certainly always about making a good movie with a great story, and uh, hopefully everything else sort of fell in line. And then we had other great filmmakers, Ruth Carter, who is uh, Oscar-nominated costume designer who I worked with really intensively to make sure that what we did matched up, you know, because a lot of what she did in the foreground on the characters defined who they were um, on screen. So that also gave back to the representation of powerful women who had their own agency about them and could make their own decisions and stand up for themselves and could think quick on their feet. That's a whole other sense of representation and a social aspect for young kids, young girls, um, and the men who, you know, uh, treated them on this uh, equal playing field. There was no, uh, uh, like, oh, we need to make it easy for the girls. You know, you saw the door fight. You saw the king treat them as if 
they were when they were the most powerful, uh, you know, guards in uh, in Wakanda. So it's it's all of those things mixed together. Then you talk about the technology on top of that. You're giving a, a new generation, old generations, my generation, a whole another narrative than the one that we've sort of heard for the last how many ever decades. Let's talk a little bit more about the technology, but not go away from the human aspects that you're talking about. And I think one of the things that's always really interested me in technology is not how to make tech just sort of better on its own um, and then teach people how to use it, but rather teach technology how to be better for people. Absolutely. And I, th and I think that you've really captured in this film um, an intersection with culture and people and technology. How did you approach that? Oh, that's heavy, man. <laughs> um, you know, very carefully, because it's really trying to understand community, what the needs of community are, and then how do we envelop the technology, just what you said. And I know for Ryan, community was really important. So, it, and I talked to a lot of experts. It wasn't just me sort of coming up with things. I talked to a lot of people who really knew nanotechnologists, neuroscientists, archeologists, geologists, geographers, um, on a daily basis to understand how to fold that in. And I think one of the biggest things that I did was I tried to find, a lot of the tech was based on biomimetics. So I tried to find in nature and in the different cultures what the use of something was and then the evolution of it. Because at the end of the day, it is all about the evolution of it, how we are in society and how we are uh, advancing technologically. So it was me relating these things back in a way that represented what they are really used for and how they would have evolved over time. Mm -hmm. And I think technologically, oftentimes, it is the thing for the thing's sake and not here is, you know, something that has been such a, a, a big part of a tradition of any nationality, any ethnicity, any culture, religion, and this is how it becomes useful in a, in a futuristic and advanced way. Um, if that means technology, then that's the way that it would be. So that's sort of how I strung those together. And then pulling from nature, that was a huge one. And thereby keeping everything organic, in a sense. So it becomes not such a scary thing, but a very organic thing, because we're so used to seeing certain things in nature, patterns, shapes. Uh, you know, geometry, all of these things, math, science, it's all around us constantly. So it was really easy at some point to start just looking just into nature because it's, it is science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is technology. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the way everything works. So looking beyond the, the hardware and the finish of the hardware of it and the, into the or, organic nature of it all. That, you know, that's a, like a little dive into how <laughs> it went. <laughs> it must have been a very full 14 months working on this film. Beyond. We were on three continents. We were in two states and I had a team at any given moment that were 500 strong um, just in my department. So we went 14 months and we went hard as we could go for 14 months to get this done and and put every last like my whole team put every last inch of themselves so you know it was a beautiful thing because we we represented the diaspora just our crew so it was a micro version of the macro that we were building in Wakanda and I lived that every single day for a little over a year. All right I want to ask you about what's next but it doesn't have to be specific projects but it's like, where do you go from here with everything that you've talked about, right? Like the, the production design itself, but like the bigger themes and ideas that you're working on. Uh, you know, i cha challenging myself, I think, to try to continue to do things that are out of my comfort zone. Something I learned from Ryan Coogler, who has taken me from Fruitvale Station to a boxing movie Creed to a comic book movie Black Panther. I want to continue the trend on my own and not just be in a place that I feel comfortable. My next project with Melina Matsuko, who is a director um, for Insecure, we're doing, I'm, I'm just working on the pilot for Why the Last Man, which is a graphic novel. Yes, I've read the entire series. <laughs> so good! <laughs> so I'm going to be designing the um, pilot. We're working on that currently. I can't really say much more than that, but it's super <laughs> exciting. The script is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and our approach to it is going to be, I think, something really cool. 
So I'm really super excited about that. Worked with Beyonce again, that's all I can say about that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the future is um, wide open. And if Denis Villeneuve is uh, listening, I'd love to do Dune. <laughs> yes. I throw that out every opportunity I can get, Denis. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah, thank you so much for joining me and sharing your story and all the work that you do. Thank you so much. It's super exciting. I'm so happy to be here, and uh, I think I'm going to learn something today, too. So, you know, it's all about soaking in all this greatness. So, fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is IO Live. I can't imagine how anybody passes a problem that they know that they can fix and doesn't try to fix it. That's not some complicated thing. It's just stop talking about it and start doing it. I feel an absolute obligation to serve. I did two tours in Iraq as a helicopter pilot. I loved being part of the cavalry. But then I got injured and that caused me to lose my ability to fly. One day you're a soldier, and then overnight they rip off that tag and slap veteran on your chest. I didn't know where to start looking for the next thing. What I do is math and engineering, so I had to find a way to apply those things in a meaningful way. The service doesn't end when you get out of the military, it just changes. And I started reading about the research that they were doing at the Human Engineering Research Lab. And I thought, man, I got to go be a part of that. Hurl's mission is to help people with disabilities increase independence and quality of life. I prepare the software to support the research that we do. One of the big things that I've done is help us transition to using Android tools. They make things really accessible. Anybody can sit down and start using these technologies and perform the tasks that we hope that it'll be useful for. That's the right thing to do, is to make things not just able to be used, but to be used with the same sort of joy or ease as I do. A big part of why open technology is so attractive to engineers like myself is there's such an active community of people designing and innovating. Welcome to Pittsburgh. <laughs> All three of my children have a disability. <laughs> the fact that my son has autism is just one little part of him. But almost his entire existence is defined by that autism. There was part of me that hoped someday I'd be able to help my son be able to live independently and give him a future. What's that? That's part of why I became an engineer. It's part of why I get into this field. There's going to be a time where someone like my son will have gotten a better opportunity, a better swing at this thing. I'm not going to sit around and wait for somebody else to fix the problem. There's not a minute to be wasted thinking about anything but the good things that we can do.
All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the value of immersive design sprints. Now, have you ever designed and developed products for users who are very different from you? Well, today we're going to go over some tips and strategies to deeply understand your user and to create effective products for them at speed using immersive design sprints. I'm Sumir Falke. I'm a design lead at Google Station. And Google Station is a product that's building high-quality public Wi-Fi for users in next billion user markets. And I'm Bergen. I'm a designer on the Chrome team focusing on our next billion users. All right, let's jump right in and talk about, oh, there we go. What is a design sprint? So we'll do a brief recap of design sprints. So we define a design sprint as a framework for answering critical business questions through design, prototyping, and testing our ideas with users to generate actionable feedback and insights. Now, design sprints were created at Google, and they have evolved over time. They're a mix of methods from design thinking, business strategy, psychology, and user research that were all selected and ordered specifically to support divergent and convergent thinking and to drive towards a targeted outcome. So what's different about a design sprint is that we set clear goals and deliverables up front. We time box all of the activities so that we not only speed up the learning and development process, but we also drive the right behaviors from our users. And then finally, we enable a wide range of disciplines and stakeholders to participate in the design and development process. Now, design is not an individual sport. And design sprints are a highly collaborative process. We want to be able to include multiple perspectives and points of views. And to that end, we leverage sprints to include all participants' voices. Now, the design sprint is a highly flexible framework. And you'll want to flex it and adapt it to your particular challenge or scenario. One of the advantages of the sprint is you can reduce the risks of downstream mistakes by getting to insights that lead to a better understanding of your user and your problem space quicker. So today, we're going to talk about a way that we have flexed the design sprint to really get a better understanding of users that are very different from ourselves. Through immersion, intercepts, and co-creation, we're bringing actual users instead of representatives of those users into the center of the design and development process. Now, there's a phenomenon known as the co-creation effect. And it shows that when organizations and consumers create something together, both parties are more invested in the outcome. So what does this look like in practice? We're going to start by bringing a team together of very different disciplines, including UX, Eng, PM, to create a powerful team. We're looking for a good representation of roles and skills. And this is going to allow us to dra dramatically reduce the amount of time that we spend communicating and increase the number of viable ideas that we generate. So once we have our team together, we're going to walk through the five sprint phases, understand, sketch, decide, prototype, and validate. Now, we have a mix of structured individual work and planned group discussions that support a clear, diverge, and converge process that will guide the team to get on the same page around the artifacts that it's going to produce to test with users. Now, the ideal design sprint is going to provide time for team members to reflect on the challenge and also opportunities to validate or disrupt those ideas. So the goal for the first phase, the understand phase, is to gather all of the relevant data and information at hand. We really want to create a shared brain and align around a new world together and a new understanding of the problem space. Then we're going to move on to the sketch phase. And this is when we're going to generate tons and tons of ideas, tons of potential solutions. Um, and we're going to use a couple of exercise, exercises that are designed to get the ideas out of your participants' head onto paper and to really push them to go beyond their first idea to get better and more innovative ideas. 
Now, once we have all of these ideas, we're in the middle of the sprint, we have tons and tons of solutions, it's time to start narrowing down and making hard choices. So the decide phase is all about those hard decisions and selecting what you're going to prototype with users. Once you've narrowed down, you want to create a prototype that you can test your hypothesis and validate or invalidate your assumptions. Because you only have a really short amount of time, maybe you have a couple hours, maybe, maybe you have a day to build that prototype, you sh it should only be as high fidelity as needed to answer your questions and nothing more. Finally, we're going to validate. The goal of the test phase is to confirm that the product that you've prototyped is good and also that you prototyped the right thing. So today, we're going to discuss two case studies to show you how we've used this framework to give users the tool to engage in the ideation and creation process. And now that you understand the structure of a sprint, when's the right time to sprint? Really, you can sprint at any point in the life cycle of your product. You might be at the very beginning and want to use a sprint for visioning or creating a roadmap. You may have a mature product and you're thinking about adding a specific feature. Whatever point in the life cycle of your product that you run a sprint, it's important to remember that involving users early and often can really help validate the problem space and create better ideas. And there are a couple of outcomes from a sprint. So I like to say that there's never a failed sprint because you always learn something. But we have defined three potential outcomes, and the first is an efficient failure. So it can be a little dispiriting that something didn't work, but it's really useful to know. And you've saved all of that time, money, and resources that you might have spent building out the product and then learning that it didn't work. So you've learned quickly. Now, most sprints fit in this middle bucket, what we called flawed success. Some things worked, some things didn't. But you have a path forward. You know what you need to do next. And sometimes you have an epic win. Maybe you have a couple things you want to tweak, but you're ready to move to production. You'll need to set your expectations with stakeholders at the beginning of the sprint so that they, everyone is aware of this and they know what the outcomes might be. Now, let's talk a little bit about immersion. Great. So really comprehensive recap of a very complex topic there. And the reason that we rushed through that is because we're assuming that if you're here, then you've heard of a design sprint before. You have most likely taken part in a design sprint before. And maybe some of you have even run your own design sprints. So we're going to jump right into immersion. Now, before we talk about immersive sprints, let's try to understand what immersion actually means. So um, to think about immersion, I went to Google, and I looked up the dictionary. And here's a definition of the term immersion. Immersion is instruction based on extensive exposure to surroundings or conditions that are native or pertinent to the object of study. Now, this is a lot to take in, so I kept Googling. Here's another definition, much simpler. Immersion is a deep mental involvement. Here's a third one. Uh, immersion is a state of being deeply engaged or involved, absorption. All right, so there's some common themes emerging from all of these definitions. Let's bring this back to UX. How can immersion guide your interaction with users, especially users that you don't know very well? I like to think of it in terms of three steps. Step one, immersion is about awareness. So first, doing the background research and study that it actually takes before you go into a new environment and users. Then bringing those learnings with you into these new surroundings so that they can provide you the context that you need to process that correctly. And then when you're in this new environment, just being very keenly aware, observing without preconceived notions or bias or judgment. So that's awareness. Step two, immersion is about listening. So you're going to uh, hear a lot of new sounds, process a lot of new sites. You're going to talk to a lot of users that you haven't interacted with before. And these users are going to tell you about their lives, about their problems, problems that you haven't faced before. So it's really important to listen attentively 
And this is actually pretty hard to do. If you try it yourself right now, um, when you try to listen to someone speaking, it's very easy to let your mind wander and think about what you want to say next. It's very hard to mindfully listen. I hope that's not what you all are doing right now, by the way. But um, it's really important to listen uh, attentively. So that's step two. And then step three is taking awareness and taking listening and bringing it to empathy. And this is when you're actually stepping into someone's shoes and experiencing what they experience, understanding their, their needs, their pain points, their hopes and dreams, um, and even things that delight them. So when you have awareness, listening, empathy, all of these three things together, that's when we consider it immersion. So how does this relate to design sprints and design? Now, when you're in a design sprint, you're making a call and you're designing solutions for users uh, based on what you think is going to work well for them. Now, where does this come from? It comes from intuition, right? And how does intuition get built? It comes from a lifetime of experience. It comes from knowledge and study. It comes from trial and error, like launching a lot of designs and seeing what works and learning from success, learning from failure. It's a constant loop of learning and tweaking. But when you're designing for users that you've never interacted with before, you don't have this intuition. So what happens in the context of a sprint? All of this gets amplified. In a sprint, you're time boxed, so you're doing things really fast. Um, it's a high pressure situation. It's not just you, but probably you and a bunch of sprinters who are all in the same boat as you. You don't understand your user really well. So Bergen and I are often placed in uh, situations like this because we both work on products where we are distant from our users. We don't understand our users very well that often. So what happens? We've seen that um, in sprints like this, there is analysis paralysis because your sprinters are not confident about deciding how to move forward with your design. You end up making safe choices. Um, so your design solutions are not strong. Sprint outcomes suffer. You just don't see that big leap that you want to see at the end of a sprint. So we need to help you and your sprinters build intuition. How do we do this? So we think immersion is a great solution to doing this. Um, good design in sprints is about making educated and informed decisions about how to solve a problem that your users are facing. So with immersion, you're helping your sprinters gain the foundation to confidently design solutions. So let's bring it all together. Immersive sprints create a realistic environment to guide your sprinters, drive great outcomes, and then validate sprint outcomes. If you don't understand your users really well, and you want to design solutions for them in a fast-paced sprint environment, then immersion is a great technique to set you up for success. So how do we do this? We're going to go over a few techniques today. First, we're going to talk about doing pre- and post-sprint research, so actually incorporating research as part of your sprint. Then, creating immersion during the design sprint itself. Third, participatory design sprint. So this is when you're co-designing with your users. You actually ask your users to come to the sprint with you and take part in it as a sprinter. And then last, instead of saving validation for the last stage, uh, incorporate validation at every stage of the sprint. Make sure that you check in with your users at the end of each day so that you know you're on the right path. So to give you an understanding of how all of this works in practice, we're going to walk through two case studies of successful sprints that both Bergen and I have run. So first, I'm going to hand it off to Bergen to talk about a really interesting sprint she ran in Kenya. All right, I'm excited to tell you guys about a sprint I ran with an app called AfroScout. Now, we were kicking off this app to help herders survive ongoing drought. Now, pastoralists are nomadic or semi-nomadic people who move their livestock between pastures depending on the season. And now, with the emergence of climate change, rain, rainfall patterns have shifted, forcing herders to find new routes, new pastures, and new sources of water. And the tr their traditional methods of finding good grazing lands, like word of mouth, scouting, ancestral knowledge, 
have proven insufficient to maintain healthy herds in this changing landscape. An organization called Project Concern International, a nonprofit based in San Diego and a Google.org grantee, created a program that relayed satellite data to pastoralists that showed current vegetative conditions. Now, this gave the pastoralists critical intelligence about where to move their herds. The proof of concept was highly successful. We saw 50% reduction in herd mortality and an 80% adoption rate in the local populations that it was tested with. But the delivery system was cumbersome and inefficient. The maps were auto-emailed to the PCI field staff who would print them out, deliver them to district livestock officers who would then pass them on to the locals. So this process was slow and difficult to scale. So our question was, would it be possible for us to cut out those middlemen and simply deliver the maps from the satellite straight to smartphones? As we planned the sprint, we recognized the difficulty in properly understanding the cultural, societal, and usage scenarios encountered by populations so different from ourselves. But we knew that the community, as experts of their own experience, would have the historical context and the knowledge of what was and wasn't important to the community. So rather than just consult the community, we decided to involve it. Now, as designers and developers, we often create products for people. Co-design is the act of creating with stakeholders and users, ensuring that the people most affected by the solutions are part of the development process. And this is really based on the idea and the belief that all people are crea creative. Now, the design sprint gives us a framework to put this into practice. And through the sprint process, we can guide users through the ideation and creation process to really give voice to their ideas. As you can imagine, we had a lot of different perspectives around this challenge. So we had to build the right sprint team. And we had a, quite a large team with a number of diverse stakeholders. We had our graphic inf geographic information systems specialist, who was our mapping specialist. We had local developers and a UX researcher from iHub, which is an incubation space in, in Nairobi. Um, we had two staffers from PCI in San Diego, and we had UX designers from Google. But most importantly, we had two pastoralists from different districts in Tanzania. And then we had three PCI field staff from Ethiopia and Tanzania who worked directly with the pastoralists and had been part of this proof of concept program. So it was important to us that this app transcended geographic and tribal boundaries. Now, this team required the integration of experts and users really working closely together. So empathy between our participants was essential, and face-to-face -face communication was best. So we all gathered in iHub's office in Nairobi. Now, co-creation can be applied at any stage of the design development process through different activities. And as we created the schedule, we thought deeply about how to include our users at each stage of this process. And by incorporating user feedback throughout, the, throughout this process, we can avoid the anchoring effect where we're really going to have really see that human tendency to rely on that first piece of information to make subsequent judgments. So during the understand phase, we, our users helped us understand the problem space through lightning talks and documenting and sharing how might we. Now you can see some of the topics that we discussed were technical infrastructure, offline experience, battery life, traditional decision making. So it was really important to users that these maps worked offline. They were not always connected. And traditional decision making was something I don't think we would have talked about if we had run this sprint in San Diego or here in Mountain View. It really is something that we learned that the elders make a lot of the decisions around where to move the herds. But the younger generation are the one with the smartphone. So we had to take that, those types of things into consideration as we considered the design. So to make the pastoralist experience resonate with all of the Sprint team members, we broke into groups and created user journey maps. 
Um, these were really important because people are good at thinking in terms of stories about people and, th and the things that they do and what happens to them. And stories can be useful in generative design to invoke empathy and imagination and trigger ideas for a more ideal future. We use Crazy 8 to allow the team to generate a ton of different ideas based on everything we learned in the understand phase. And to help our users with this activity, we really gave some structure to it by giving them prompts to sketch around. So we did this in four phases. And during the decide phase, we really gave our users more power in the decision-making process with extra votes. And we reminded our, participant, or our other participants to evaluate each idea, considering what our uh, audience experienced and what they wanted. So depending on the level of the fidelity that you're aiming for, one of the most difficult phases to incorporate users in can be the prototyping phase. Uh, paper prototypes might be the most inclusive way, and those are totally OK. We were aiming for a little bit higher fidelity, and so we considered letting our users go during this phase. But they actually wanted to stay. And their participation actually proved crucial. When the designers were designing this middle screen, they were struggling to come up with iconography that would really represent some of the diverse ideas that we were trying to get across, like this location has no water, or scary animals were sighted in this location. Maybe you shouldn't take your herd there. But we were able to rapidly iterate and show our designs to the users and get immediate feedback so that we were able to confirm which icons resonated and which ones didn't. So for user testing, it was important to solicit feedback from a larger and more diverse group than was just the Sprint team. If you'll remember, we had Sprinters from Ethiopia and Tanzania, but we were in Kenya. So we were able to go about an hour south of Nairobi and test our prototype with a group of Maasai. And this proved extremely valuable as we saw the validity of this tool immediately. That of, and that the approach we chose would transcend geographic and tribal boundaries. Now, the sprint process allowed us to find common ground, to share ideas, and develop a common language and work together to fully understand the user needs from the very outset of the project. Next, we're going to talk about a case study that Samir did here at Google. Great. What an impactful sprint. So cool. All right, so I'm going to switch gears a bit, and I'm going to talk about the product that I work on, and that's Google Station. Now, just as a recap, Google Station is a product that's bringing high-quality public Wi-Fi to next billion user markets worldwide. Now, a uh, little bit of a caveat. I can't really talk about the actual product that we were designing in the sprint, but I can talk about the process, and that's what I'm going to do here. So a while ago, uh, someone on our team had this really cool idea. They wanted to bring in the features that are present in a different Google product into Google Station. We got super excited. Uh, we talked to this team, and that team got super excited. And we were all like ready to have this happen, but we didn't know how. So we didn't know what this experience would look like. A great reason to have a sprint. Um, we also had never worked together as a team, so there was like no working relationship. Another great reason to have a sprint, to bring teams together so they can establish trust. Now, here's another challenge. The Google Station team is based largely in Mountain View. This other product is based in Asia. And at the time, the user that we were designing for was in India. So three different countries, really challenging. And going back to the slide that Bergen showed earlier, we had an answer from the business side how this product would work. And we also knew that from an engineering standpoint, we could most likely make it work. But what we didn't know is, is this something that our users even care about? We didn't know if this was desirable for our users. So this big gap was something we needed to address. So we decided that we should run an immersive sprint. So the sprint challenge was design an experience aligned with user needs that would combine functionality of two products in a very seamless way. But before we could even talk about seamless and the interaction design and all of that, I really wanted us to figure out 
does this make sense for our users? So I flexed the standard five-phase methodology of the sprint and added an extra phase, which is that orange circle you see here for strategy. We wanted to figure out, is there a strong user-focused product strategy for this product? And this was critical. We didn't know if this would work for our users. And this product strategy needed to come from actual user insights. We didn't know our user that well. So we added two more phases to the sprint. Before the sprint, we added research. After the sprint, we added research. Different kinds of research, though. Before the sprint, we added foundational research. And after the sprint, we were going to validate the design solutions we come up with with uh, research to validate it. So that was also um, in the field, but it was a different style of research. Now, this extended the duration of the sprint. And we invited all of our sprint participants to actually take part in the research. We thought this was really important, because that would be an immersive experience for them. And it would lay the foundation for them to effectively participate in the sprint and come up with great design solutions. So this was also a lot of overhead in terms of planning, because that meant travel, going out into the field for a large group. So to recap, understand the user context, doing foundational research, use those user insights to drive the entire sprint, and then when you have design solutions as outcomes, take them back into the field to validate them with your users. So that was the process that we followed. So how did we do this research? For both the pre- and post-sprint research, we use a technique known as intercepts. Now, by intercepts, I mean going out into the field, finding a user, asking them if they can spend a few minutes with you, and then doing an interview. And you can do an interview and ask them about their habits and their lives and do get a lot of foundational information about them. Or you can show them a prototype. And it could, this could be like a clickable prototype. It could be a live product. It could be sketches on a piece of paper. And you can ask them to use this prototype to do certain tasks and observe how they do it. And this would be evaluative. So intercepts are really flexible in that sense. You can use them for different styles of research. And it's also in a user's natural environment. So instead of bringing a user to you and asking them to come to a lab, you're going out to a user. So you're putting them at ease. And paper prototypes are totally OK. So one of the things I really love about uh, intercepts is that they're really sc uh, scrappy. You can put them together in a, in a really short time. And also, they're cross-functional. This gives your team, your non-user experience research and design team, your PMs, your engineers, to take part in research and actually come face to face with their users. It's amazing and eye-opening for them. This is why I love intercepts. So that was the research part. Now let's talk about that strategy piece. To figure out if we had a right user-focused product strategy, we used a technique known as uh, value prop canvas. So based on those user insights, we asked users who were, who were already using Google Station. We made a list of all the features in that product and whether what the pain points of users were using Google Station then. So we had all the user pains. Then we made a list of all the gains that users are seeing by using that product. So we knew the user gains. And then we went through the sprint. We went through a lot of sketching. We diverged. We voted on ideas. We converged. We came, up to a few, we came up with a few solutions. We did the same with those solutions. Are any of the features in the solution going to relieve the pains that users are facing? Are they going to boost the gains that users are seeing? If both of these boxes map, then you know what you're designing is great for your users. If they don't map, then you have a problem. You don't have a strong value proposition. And that's when you have to decide whether this even makes sense to move forward with. So this is what we used for exploring product strategy. All right, so what did I learn by running the sprint? First, the sequence of methods that you use in a sprint really matters. And if I hadn't taken the time to think about the sprint challenge and add a product strategy piece, we wouldn't have been successful. So think about the sequence of products. Do a dry run. Uh, try to see if one method feeds into the other. Does the output of one method feed into the input of the other? If there's a gap, then address it. Make stakeholders your partners, especially when you're running a broad sprint like this. 
You want them to be your partners. You want them to agree with you, invest the time and money and resources. And you want to do daily check-ins with them. Tell them how you're doing. What did you do today? What did you achieve as a team? Get feedback. Work on it. I've never run a sprint that has always gone according to plan. So things go wrong. People have questions. They question the very premise of your sprint. Uh, things take too long to run. Uh, methods don't go as, the, as you plan. Logistical issues. So be, be nimble. Be agile. Be prepared to change things around on the fly. One of the great side benefits of a sprint is that you're bringing two teams together who have not worked together, and you're going to drive a lot of alignment between them and really strong working relationships between them. So no matter what happens, you're going to get that. And we got that. And then the last thing I wanted to leave you with for this case study is that this was a super successful sprint with, for us, not because we figured out this amazing new product that we wanted to launch. We actually learned that we did not have a strong value proposition with this new idea. This did not make sense for our users. At the end of the sprint, we decided we didn't want to move forward with this. So the fact that this sprint helped us understand very quickly if the time, effort, and resources required to build this was worth it makes it super powerful for us. So you might be thinking, I'm not going to Kenya, and I'm not going to India. Why does any of this matter to me? Well. Have you ever designed for users in regions different from where you live? I bet you have. Have you ever designed or developed solutions for users who are different from you, kids, the elderly, minorities, people who are less tech savvy than you? I bet you have. Um, and have, have you designed for use cases you aren't familiar with? Have, have you made a product for the automotive in industry or made a fitness app and you've never been to the gym? You know. We do this all the time. This is our job. Immersive sprints are perfect for these use cases. And why they're powerful is because you now have the opportunity to bring your team with you to learn. Instead of doing research in a silo and bringing a research report back, you can take them with you. This is where the power of sprints really shines through. They're cross-functional, they're participatory, and they're democratic. So now I'm going to present some tips to run your own immersive sprints with Bergen. So the very first one, uh, I went over a little bit uh, in advance. Uh, this is intercepts. Now, intercepts are a great research method. They're very scrappy and fast. They don't work well when you need to recreate a lab setting. So if you're doing an Internet of Things setup and you need hardware, you want to recreate a home, Intercepts don't work well. But if you have an app, if you have paper prototypes, if you want to do foundational research and talk to users and just learn about them, intercepts are great. Now, it's important to know that if you go in a large group of 10 people trying to talk to one user, you're going to scare them off. So don't do that. Try to split up into smaller groups. Uh, and then split up and talk to people on your own. Come back, regroup, and share your notes. If you're doing international research, there's a couple of things to be aware of. Uh, be aware of cultural nuances, how to talk to people, how to address them, dressing. So do some research beforehand. Uh, get good interpreters or translators, because even if they speak the same language as you, there might be important nuances that you would miss. If it's possible and if your uh, user is OK with it, Ask them beforehand if you can take a video. If they say yes, take a video of your interaction with them. Because when you take a video back to your team, it is super powerful, way more powerful than a research report can be. Paper prototypes and focus groups are OK for this. Uh, because you're talking to so many users, you'll correct for that. And then watch out for selection bias. Uh, we have an idea in our head of who our user is. So there's like a bias to go and talk to users that you think would li be likely users of your app. Don't do that. You're outside in the field. You have access to a diverse range of users. So go talk to everyone. And then one last tip. We try to make sure that we don't prime our users to give us answers that they think we'll want to hear. 
So we try not to tell them that, hey, I designed this. Give me your feedback, because they'll be nice to you, and they'll tell you this is amazing, even if they don't like it. So we try to save that information for after the interview. Those are some great tips. And a lot of them will apply to co-design as well. Now, co-design is a fundamental change in the relationship between product creators and users. Traditionally, experts have gone out and observed, done interviews with mostly passive users. In co-design, users are deeply involved in the ideation and creation process. So you really want to prepare your users in advance. Let them know what to expect in the design sprint, talk about the different activities that they might go through, and help them reflect on, a, on their experiences that they normally perceive as routine. So perhaps you ask them to do a diary study beforehand, or have them talk to other members of their community to get a wider perspective. Logistics are also quite important. You're going to want to allow more time for each of the activities and more time to explain them as well. Do you need a translator? Similar to in intercepts, it might be useful. Are you in the natural context of the experience, or are you asking the users to come into your space? What would make them more comfortable? What materials do you need to allow your users to fully express themselves and to, and to take their ideas down? It, are they comfortable with drawing? Would they be more comfortable if you gave them uh, something to build with, different components that they could put together? Would they be interested in role playing or storytelling? So really think through all of the contingencies and the schedule of your sprint. Now, facilitation is going to be key here. And you're going to be switching roles a little bit from translator of the user experience to facilitating the users and guiding them through the creative process. And finally, make sure you include a diverse, di sorry, a diverse and inclusive user set. And why do we do this? This sounds like a lot of work. So what are the benefits of co-design? You're really going to get an increased knowledge and empathy for the user for the full team. And that's key. You're going to have all your engineers, your PMs, face to face with the users. You're going to build better and more innovative ideas. You're going to have lots and lots of more, idea, more and better ideas. Your decision making is going to be more efficient, and your sprint participants are going to be more confident in the decisions that they make. And you're going to have immediate validation of concepts and ideas. Just as I discussed with the iconography in our app for AfroScout, we were able to immediately validate what worked and what didn't. And you'll be able to establish a deeper and long-term relationship with your users. Now, what if you can't bring users in for the full sprint? Maybe they have to work. They're not able to take that much time off to come in and partic participate in your sprint. We also often do something called extended user participation. So this is an alternative where we bring users in at key milestones within the sprint. So we'll recruit users to do check-ins uh, at critical milestones or at the end of each phase. We'll do cognitive walkthroughs. We'll let them look at sketches. We'll just show them what we've been working on and get their feedback. You might have to pivot, but you'll want to plan time to act on the feedback that they give you. Now, what if you just can't bring your users to you at all and you can't go to them? What do we do then? So that's when remote sprinting comes in. And we'll be honest with you, this has not been very successful, and we don't highly recommend it. But sometimes it's unavoidable. Your users are far away. You can't go to them. So you can use things like slides or docs to collaborate remotely. You can use Google Forms and send out a survey and get your users to take a survey to get insights. Uh, one of the things that we've done, uh, especially when you're doing research from many time zones away, is overnight research. So uh, an example was we were doing a sprint here for a product that was based in Indonesia. So we did a lot of work all day, packaged it up, sent it over there. A uh, researcher ran research for us overnight, and we had uh, feedback waiting for us the next morning. So that was great. Obviously, this is very situation specific. So if you can't do this, you might want to consider taking a break. And instead of doing all five days of a sprint in one go, do two days at a time, break off to some research, come back, 
and then regroup the next three. So these are some techniques for doing remote sprinting. All right, so to recap, we talked about intercepts. We talked about co-design. We talked about extend, extended user participation and remote sprinting. With that, we hope that we've shown you the value of immersive design sprints and given you the right tools to run your own successful immersive sprint. Now, we'd love to hear from you. So please provide feedback for this session by signing in on google.com slash io slash schedule. And if you want more helpful resources about design sprints, go to designsprintkit.withgoogle.com. That's it from us. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Google I.O. For someone like me who grew up without a phone, I can distinctly remember how gaining access to technology can make a difference in your lives. That's why we've been so focused on bringing digital skills to communities around the world. We have trained over 25 million people, and we expect that number to rise over 60 million in the next five years. Healthcare is one of the most important fields AI is going to transform. We announced our work on diabetic retinopathy, and we use deep learning to help doctors diagnose it. We can predict the five-year risk of you having an adverse cardiovascular event, heart attack, or strokes. We've been working with our partners using de-identified medical records. It turns out if you go and analyze over 100,000 data points per patient, more than any single doctor could analyze, we can actually quantitatively predict the chance of readmission, 24 to 48 hours earlier than traditional methods. It gives doctors more time to act. We are bringing another feature to Gmail, Smart Compose. We use machine learning to start suggesting phrases for you as you type. All you need to do is to hit tab and keep auto-completing. Another product is Google Photos. So we are bringing a new feature. If you took a picture of a document which you want to save for later, we can recognize, convert the document to PDF, and make it much easier for you to use later. Or if you happen to have a very special memory, something in black and white, we can recreate that moment in color and make that moment even more real and special. And we are adding, as of today, six new voices to the Google Assistant. John Legend's voice will be coming later this year so that you can get responses like this. At 10 a.m., you have an event called Google I.O. Keynote. Then at 1 p.m., you have margaritas. Have a wonderful day. I'm looking forward to 1 p.m. Today, the Assistant is available on over 500 million devices. Now, by the end of this year, the Assistant will support 30 languages and be available in 80 countries. But one step that we've been working on is something we call Pretty Please. Hey, Google, talk to voice run. Daddy, you forgot to say please. <sighs> Tell me a story, please. Thanks for asking so nicely. You're very polite. I know. So the assistant understands and responds to positive conversation with polite reinforcement. Now, sometimes the assistant can actually be more helpful by having a lower visual profile. So let's say I'm heading home from work. I have Google Maps showing me the fastest route during rush hour traffic. Hey, Google, send Nick my ETA and play some hip hop. OK, letting Nick know you're 20 minutes away and check out this hip hop music station on YouTube. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. What's happening out here? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. That was a real call you just heard. The amazing thing is the assistant can actually understand the nuances of conversation. We've been working on this technology for many years. It's called Google Duplex. It brings together all our investments over the years in natural language understanding, deep learning, text-to-speech. 
I'm really excited to announce the new Google News. With the new Google News, we set out to help you do three things. First, keep up with the news you care about. Second, understand the full story. And finally, enjoy and support the sources you love. Our AI constantly reads the firehose of the web for you, the millions of articles, videos, podcasts, and comments being published every minute and assembles the key things you need to know. We're also excited to introduce a new visual format we call Newscasts. You are not going to see these in any other news app. Newscasts give me an easy way to get the basics and decide where I want to dive in more deeply. Full coverage is an invitation to learn more. It gives a complete picture of a story in terms of how it's being reported from a variety of sources and in a variety of formats. This is by far the most powerful feature of the app. And here in the newsstand section, it's easy to find and follow the sources I already love and browse and discover new ones. And if there's a publication I want to subscribe to, we make it dead simple. Because you're signed in with your Google account, you're set. We're rolling out on Android, iOS, and the web in 127 countries starting today. Growth of Android over the last 10 years has helped fuel the shift in computing from desktop to mobile. And as Sudar mentioned, AI is going to profoundly change industries. And this brings me to the new version of Android we're working on, Android P. Adaptive Battery uses on-device machine learning to figure out which apps you'll use in the next few hours and which you won't use until later, if at all, today. With Android P, we're going beyond simply predicting the next app to launch to predicting the next action you want to take. We call this feature App Actions. What's happening here is that the actions are being predicted based on my usage patterns. The phone is adapting to me and trying to help me get to my next task more quickly. Slices are a new API for developers to define interactive snippets of their app UI that can be surfaced in different places in the OS. With MLKit, you get on-device APIs to text recognition, face detection, image labeling, and a lot more. And MLKit also supports the ability to tap into Google's cloud-based ML technologies. Our team has heard so many stories from people who are trying to find the right balance with technology. One of the first things we focused on was helping you understand your habits. Android P will show you a dashboard of how you're spending time on your device. As you saw earlier, you can see how much time you spent in apps, how many times you've unlocked your device today, and how many notifications you've received. Android P lets you set time limits on apps and will nudge you when you're close to your limit that it's time to do something else. If you turn your phone over on the table, it automatically enters Do Not Disturb, so you can focus on being present. No pings, vibrations, or other distractions. You can tell the Google Assistant what time you aim to go to bed, and when that time arrives, it will switch on Do Not Disturb and fade the screen to grayscale, which is far less stimulating for the brain and can help you set the phone down. Well, today, we're announcing Android P Beta. Maps was built to assist everyone. We've mapped over 220 countries and territories and put hundreds of millions of businesses and places on the map. We're adding a new tab to Maps called For You. It's designed to tell you what you need to know about the neighborhoods you care about, new places that are opening, what's trending now, and personal recommendations. We've created a score called Your Match to help you find more places that you'll love. Your Match uses machine learning to combine what Google knows about hundreds of millions of places with the information that I've added. Let me paint a familiar picture. The phone says, head south on Market Street. One problem, you have no idea which way is south. So you look down at the phone, you're looking at that blue dot on the map, and you're starting to walk to see if it's moving in the same direction. Our teams have been working really hard to combine the power of the camera, the computer vision, with street view and maps to reimagine walking navigation. So here's how it could look like in Google Maps. Notice that you also see the map, so that way you stay oriented. You can start to see nearby places, so you see what's around you. Now, with smart text selection, you can now connect the words you see with the answers and actions you need. So you can do things like copy and paste from the real world directly into your phone. 
You're at your friend's place, you check out this trendy looking lamp, and you want to know things that match that style. And now Lens can help you. You open the camera, and you start to see Lens surface proactively all the information instantly. And it even anchors that information to the things that you see. Waymo is the only company in the world with a fleet of fully self-driving cars with no one in the driver's seat on public roads. So Phoenix will be the first stop for Waymo's driverless transportation service, which is launching later this year. Soon, everyone will be able to call Waymo using our app, and a fully self-driving car will pull up with no one in the driver's seat to whisk them away to their destination. Hi, IO Live. It's Todd Kerpelman, and I am here with Asad Naweed, who is a software engineer on AR Core. So, uh, Asad, what's new in the world of augmented reality? Hi, Todd. Uh, so today at uh, IO, we're announcing two new features in AR Core that we're really excited about. We are announcing augmented images and cloud anchors. Okay, those sound very impressive. But what are they? What, what's augmented images? So augmented images is a set of APIs inside AR Core that allow developers to create AR apps that can recognize and recognize images in the real world and then anchor virtual content with respect to them. So if you if your app can recognize an image that say this portrait up here, then it can make that image come to life and overlay virtual content on top of that image and make it do interesting things that weren't possible before. So what kind of apps do you see taking advantage of augmented images? Uh, one other thing that I'm really passionate about is education. And children's education in particular, you, you could create an app that recognizes the images in a children's tech in a children's storybook. And if kids Previously, when they're just reading a storybook, can now point their cell phones at the storybook and then see the story come to life on top of their books, right there and then. Alrighty, let's check out one of these demos here. Yeah, so this is augmented images. And we'll see that AR Core finds this image and then makes it come to life like that. Whoa! So this is what I was talking about when I meant immersive experiences, is that as we move the phone slightly at an angle, we see that the 3D model actually turns with us. And if we end up going a little closer, we'll see that the effect is much more pronounced. You can actually take a look at the structure of the cubes as they are there, and it's so much more immersive than the standard 2D painting because now you have this box that's reaching into the wall, and the image is no longer there, and it's actually been superimposed by this 3D model that's dynamic and can move, and I can get different perspectives on it depending on where I am. So yeah, that's what's really exciting about this. And is this a phone with any special hardware, or any special features? What is this that we're looking at this on? So this is just a phone that's running AR Core, and AR Core doesn't have any specific hardware requirements, like a short of maybe just like a good camera and a good uh, gyroscope and accelerometer, but that's about it. All right, and here we have another augmented image. Let's see what's going on here. Yep, so this is another image that the app knows how to recognize. And now that it's done that, we can see what grows as we move the phone up. And this then grows into like a massive tree that an artist has put together that's rooted at the augmented image. So if we keep going all the way up, you'll see that it becomes like a really, really, really nice tree. And as you bring the phone down, the tree will ultimately sink back into the augmented image that it detected. So these are the kinds of visual experiences and like things that come to life rooted at images that the app knows how to recognize. And that's what we're really excited to see what developers are going to do with. Wow, that is super cool. I could actually just stay here all day and watch the tree grow and shrink, but I think I have other interviews to do. <laughs> no, you're more than welcome to come back when you're done. All right. Well, if you need me, folks, I'll be hanging out here making augmented reality trees grow. And then the second piece of technology we're talking about were cloud anchors. So, so what is that, and what does that allow me to do as a developer? Uh, cloud anchors allow you to create and host anchors, AR anchors, with 
and share them between different people and different devices. And that's really exciting because then suddenly you have the ability to create apps that, can, that two people can use together to anchor content in the world and see where other people have anchored content in the world as well. Uh, one other thing that we're really excited about is that this, the cloud anchors are actually cross-platform. We're also really excited to announce that anchors created on AR core devices will also be recreatable on iOS devices running AR, uh, running, uh, AR core on iOS. And that opens up the door to so many different possibilities and a significantly larger user base. So now iOS developers can also use AR core cloud anchors. All right. So, uh, so basically, we are setting up a multiplayer game where both devices, an iOS and an Android device, are agreeing on the same augmented reality space that they're sharing. Is that basically what's going on here? Yes, that's exactly what's going on here, Todd. I have in my hand an iPhone that's running AR core on iOS. And Brian is, has an Android device and we are going to play the same game together. And... All right, let's give this a try here. That, you can see right there is where uh, Brian has placed his board, and I will place mine here. And when I am ready, we are now going to play a game where I have to fire onto Brian's light board. And when I do that, it effectively lights Brian's board up, and then, he has to do. He has to color all of my shots, uh, all of my dots, before I manage to do the same thing for him. And he is seeing these boards in the exact same place that I am seeing them in. And I can see him playing the game with me. And the and the only reason why this shared AI experience is possible is because of the magic of cloud anchors. So yeah, just to, uh, just to kind of like reiterate, this is an iPhone. It's not an Android device, and we do have AR Core cloud anchors supported on both iOS devices and Android devices, and we're really excited to see what developers are going to do with this. That is super awesome. I can't wait to play some really fun augmented reality multiplayer games um, around my living room. <laughs> well, definitely, and yeah, it's, it's a blast for everyone, like the whole family, yeah. Oh my gosh, that was super cool. If you want to see more exciting videos like this one, head on over to g.co slash io slash guide for lots more videos featuring me and the rest of the IO Live crew.
everybody. Wow, it's a nice stage. Okay, well, I am delighted to be here. I have a clock. We're going to get to see Hannah Beachler after me, so that's going to be super awesome. Uh, I am the warm up act. I'm John Maida. Good to see all of you. This is something I made three years ago. Does anyone know this TV show? No, I don't know this TV show. Well, uh, I spoke at and it was a think of and I wanted to be an engineer. And I was asked, well, why not Sulu? Because he's Asian. And I said, no, I don't want to be Sulu. I want to be Scotty. I want to be an engineer. But it was in that moment I realized the reason why I didn't want to be Sulu is because I thought he was weird. In the sense that I thought it was strange how Sulu didn't speak with some kind of thick Asian accent on TV. And I thought, that's, that's weird. Something's wrong with him. And it always stuck with me. Why did I think it was wrong that he sounded like a Californian? I never thought of it until that moment. And that's a general topic of this presentation. Now, if you have a question uh, and you got introvert, just text me your question, uh, 253-217-4017, and we'll be able to interact. Because the problem with this kind of conversation thing is it isn't a conversation. It's like a one-way thing. So go ahead and text me a question at 253-217-4017. And I'm watching the clock. OK, here we go. OK, the Zen Tech reports, uh, there's four of them now. They're long. So you can read them in the microtype, et cetera. Uh, the big conclusion after four years of work has been to ask questions about how can design and tech be more inclusive. If we can figure this out, we can unlock incredible possibility and profitability. The problem with the word design, however, is that it means too many things. So the report defines design as three kinds of design. There's classical design, like your glasses. There's design thinking, this idea of using post-it notes to create structure of ideas. And there's computational design, the kind of design that is powered by Moore's law. It's a different kind of design. It uses a material that didn't exist 100 years ago. What's a computational designer? I've defined this as roughly four type of things you have to have as a computational designer. You don't have to know how to program, but you have to be technically literate. Uh, you also have to think critically about technology. For you, technology is a responsibility. So you wonder how things are being used. You also use all kinds of design. You aren't stuck in just computational design. And lastly, you're very curious about new things. Because designers love to learn new people, new customs, new anything, because it's how they learn. So designers are inherently diversity positive. It's a very important point. Now, if you think about the value of design, it's been demonstrated by all the M&A activity, the mergers and acquisition activity uh, of agencies. So uh, I reported on this report, uh, over 20 agencies were acquired by consulting companies, because consulting companies are finding value in design for their clients, which is a big deal. Never happened before. Now, the problem, however, uh, is that classical designers tend to dis design thinking. You know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, design thinkers, they have the post-it notes and the Sharpie markers with a whiteboard. You know, classical designers don't think of them as real designers. But I always tell classical designers, well, they make more money than you do. So important to note, design thinking is not a bad thing. It's a different kind of design. Also, I found that being in Silicon Valley for a while, we tend to forget there's the rest of the world. So I'm a big fan of China and all the design work being done there. Uh, design of cars, design of experiences, especially mobile, and more recently, using AI to design banners, designs. It, they're just so further ahead that many people seem to uh, have the impression in the United States. And that's uh, kind of an embarrassing problem. Also, the other problem I've seen in tech is that it indexes to younger people, uh, which is a great opportunity. But there's also an incredible opportunity uh, in the older generation. Because uh, I don't know if you all know this, but you all will get older. Yeah, it's not a problem. It's a real thing. And as you get older, things change. The first thing that changes is your eyesight. So for all designers who love 6.5 point, better give it up. 
looks awesome, especially in light, but you won't be able to see it once you hit 40-something. And at Automatic, we call this the Boulder generation. Get it? Boulder? We like that. OK. Um, good news is that design is being used sooner in the process. It used to be in tech that you'd make the technology, and oh my gosh, it finally works. And you'd spray design on, called Make It Pretty. Um, that was great 10 years ago, but because the competition is so fierce now, you have to bake design into the product. And you can see globally, uh, we did a survey of 2,000 people, um, the, the trend is design is being used early in the process, which is a big deal. Now, when we talk about computational design, however, it's important to note that computational design uses the computer. And uh, if you were, who was there in the 80s? 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 Come on, 80s people, right? People didn't like people who used the computer for design, right? You're made fun of, like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. You were a bad designer because you were using the computer. There was a time. Um, uh, but the computer kept on getting more interesting. It came out of prints. It became interactive. Who remembers Macromedia Director? Macromind, come on. Yes, yes. Uh, this stuff has been happening for a long time, interaction design. Uh, more recently, have these tools gotten more interesting, uh, specifically by integrating things like machine intelligence. That's, we can all feel it coming. And that's kind of exciting, but also scary at the same time. Let's see here. OK. So when we think about machine intelligence, my favorite demo, and this is all sourcing real data off the internet, uh, this is Siri saying something in iOS 9. One liter is 33.81 fluid ounces. This is iOS 10. One liter is 33.81 fluid ounces. This is iOS 11. One liter is 33.81 fluid ounces. Got really good fast, didn't it? That's what's happening. These quantum leaps are occurring. Linearity is being thrown out, and that's really important. And so when people ask in design, should I learn all these things? If you don't learn them, you'll be left behind. And so it's so key to stay at the forefront. Now, uh, I also had this question. Uh, when do you expect AI to replace most visual designers? And it's interesting because the average says at least five years till visual designers get replaced. Uh, not everyone, of course, but some design jobs. Uh, I think it's going to be much sooner, uh, quite frankly, uh, because all the information from companies like Google and companies in China as well are that a lot of rote things can be done by machine intelligence. Here are some of my favorites. Uh, I love that you can remove the watermark. I wonder why you'd want to do that. Um, you can perfect contrast. This is MIT work. In a dark image, awesome image. You can also take two photos and make a new photo out of them, too. This is work from NVIDIA. You can also generate infinite variations of ideas. Uh, just with pattern libraries in machine intelligence. You can also, as you all know, in this audience at least, you can change people's faces, and you can fix drawings. What's important to note, though, is that we see these warnings. Consider the photos. That's how you tell if it's fake. But it's so hard to tell if things are fake these days. As soon as it's going to get harder and harder. Um, so we are human beings. We like to mess with the machine. So this is one of my favorite things. If you click on this button, uh, this will like randomly hit things so your browser gets confused. So we humans love to confuse machine intelligence. You know, put a pixel there. I don't know where it is anymore, says machine intelligence. So we'll keep looking for this to try to stop the inevitable, which is that computers are learning so quickly. And when they learn so quickly, they learn bad things. I'm not sure if you remember it, but in July 2015, the Wall Street Journal reported how images, uh, Im images mistakenly tagged black people as gorillas was happening in 2015. The algorithm was fixed. Why did it exist? Because the database had more light faces than darker faces, so the database was dumb. And so these data dumbness is occurring all over the place as machine intelligence ingests more data, which contains incredible biases that we have unfortunately let sit out there for too long. So how do we change that? Um, I think we change that by rethinking a few things. And that is, where does technology evolve the quickest? 
And in the report, we pointed out that there's two regions. You see the red regions, the hot regions? That's where all this stuff is happening, right? This region of the country, New York. But if you flip the map, this is a map of inequality, uh, income inequality. If you flip it, you see the exact opposite, that where tech is not impacting is where poverty is growing the quickest, because the skills gap is so large. Um, this audience here is probably in the 0.01% of the most advanced people in the world. Uh, that said, the entire world is behind in computation, understanding the impact of Moore's law. And this is a, this is a, this is a very subtle intellectual privilege problem today. So when we look at what technology has done, it's been able to be extremely smart at optimizing our experience, and therefore making nothing we understand real or not real. And we all know it's happening, and it's amazing, but it's also quite disturbing. My mother, by the way, her favorite newspaper is a National Enquirer. So I'm always checking out the headlines. Uh, I, I just picked this up. Look out, Google. They know too. So is it just a divide related somehow to poverty and equality? I think it's hard to say they're related or it's causal or correlated, but there's something connected that we cannot miss. And that is that if you don't have access to computation, you are excluded. And if you don't understand what it can do, you're excluded. And so technology keeps shooting off without them, us. So what's the solution? Uh, I'm passionate about remote work. I'm at a company that is all remote, automatic. Who, remotes, who, who works remotely? That's quite a few. So uh, remote work is neat because it takes you out of these bubbles of tech. Uh, I guess I'm hopeful that uh, at Automatic, we're trying to figure out a world where world WordPress is a good design for all. How do we do that? We have to use the fact that we can go anywhere because we're remote. So for instance, uh, let's see, someone, 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 I was visiting Appalachia. And in Appalachia, I heard the story about how um, it was a coal miner who's teaching code to ex-coal miners. And he said, you know, you, you people are from the three-dimensional world. You're 3D. You live in cities with skyscrapers, you know? And, and if you're from a smaller city, you're in town, you live in 2D. In 2D, you have, like, no skyscrapers, just streets. And he said, here in Appalachia, we live in 1D. There's one street, and we all live off of it. That's where I realized the neat thing about remote work is you're zero-dimensional. And by being zero-dimensional, you can travel anywhere. And so we're trying to use this advantage to go into all kinds of places anywhere in the world and to connect with people. And I can tell you that this experience of being remote is a very powerful way to reduce exclusion because you can be including by just going anywhere you think is necessary. Now, this is my favorite quote by the lawyer Vernay Myers. Diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Uh, Say this over to yourself. It's such a powerful idea. Because if you don't have both, nothing occurs. And so when you ask how to be more inclusive, it's quite easy. Just ask, where do you spend your time? Who do you hang out with? Look at the people in the room around you. Are they diverse in some way? If they're not, you're going to have to do something terrible to yourself. You're going to have to make yourself uncomfortable. And it's exciting to be uncomfortable. Oh my gosh, you say the dumbest things. Um, and you stumble, and you become stupid, and you become smarter and a better person through it, I believe. So all of you who are not found yourself in this way, enjoy it. It's so exciting. Um, I'm a big entertainment fan, uh, and I've been tracking all the movies that have put diversity and inclusion at the center of them, and they're doing very well financially. Uh, movies like Wonder Woman, directed by Patty Jenkins. Star Wars had a much more diverse cast. Uh, the Foreigner by Jackie Chan. Who's seen The Foreigner? The Foreigner, where the terrorists aren't dark-skinned people. That was brand new. Uh, and The Big Sick, of course. Um, and these are doing really well financially. This is teaching machine intelligence and the business world that this is a pattern to take note of. I like Kumail Nanjani's quote, there's so many movies from different points of view that are making a ton of money. Don't do it because it's better for society and representation, even though it is. Do it because you'll get rich. You'll get that promotion, right? This thinking seems crass, yet it sits at the center of how change will start to occur. 
And I believe that as we see more of these kinds of things, wonderful things will happen. I want to close on, uh, my mother went to see Black Panther. Uh, this was her review. It went kind of viral. Hi, John. Just came back from seeing Black Panther. It was very good. Um, and uh, we actually went to see Avengers last, me and my mom. I was in Seattle. My mom's like 83 years old. She's like, you know, little woman with a cane. You know, we're walking out of Avengers. And I said, Mom, how was it? Oh, it wasn't as good as Black Panther. <laughs> you know? So anyways, um, thank you. And we'll have Hannah next, so please stay seated. <laughs> this is nuts. Look at all the faces. <laughs> wow, I'm so happy. I get to interview Hannah Beachler. Yes. Yeah, all right. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Good to be here. And this thing is a little weird, so you might see me kind of being a little weird. <laughs> so how's it been walking around this area? I'm sorry? How's it been walking around? Cool. Like wandering we went around, around. hung out at the auditorium and walked around some of the tents and ate and sat on the grass, and it was fabulous. Anything yeah. catch your attention? I mean, I was just looking at everything. I mean, the area is beautiful, and I think everything has been great. I've been talking to some great people, and it's been, it's been awesome. Hmm. So my mother loved Black <laughs> Panther. Um, I'm sure you weren't surprised, though. What? I'm sorry? I'm I was... sure you weren't surprised. That your mother loved it? Yeah. Not it, really. It, 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 <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, that was part of what we tried to do was, you know, make it so everybody could love it. It wasn't really geared towards one specific anything. It was more about creating a feeling and a moment and, you know what I mean? I, I'm pretty into my emotions. I would call myself an emotionalist, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really what drives me is... Uh, you know, creating things from a place that people can relate to. And then that, you know, expands. Had you heard of Black Panther when you got the job? Or yes, I did. Oh. I, I had heard of the, the character and the comics, and I kind of knew it because I knew Marvel. I've certainly asked my son, who's 20, right away when I knew I was going to interview for the job that, oh, um, you know, tell me all about, you know, the MCU and, and all of that. And he was like, here's a... Marvel Dictionary, and I sort of started from there. So I knew of him, but over that 14 months, I really got to know him. <laughs> so a superhero. Superhero. Was your reaction positive, yay, superhero, or superhero? Um, I, my reaction to, to it being superhero? Yes. Uh -huh. I mean, I was really super excited because it was challenging. It's, you know, I've done so many things that are so different from each other that anything that is going to challenge me, I instantly want in on, you know, and working with Ryan Coogler, the amazing director, again, for the third time was, you know, without question, I was going to be involved with that. So I never thought I would ever do something like a superhero movie. That's not where I saw my career going. That's not what I thought I wanted to do. But then that's life. It's not really what you thought, think in the beginning. But as, you know, I started to get into it, I was like, you know, why not? I didn't think I would do a boxing movie. I didn't think I would work with Beyonce. I didn't think I would, you know, work on a little $1 million movie that would win an Oscar. Mm. So I don't generally go into anything thinking anything other than how do I make this work? Mm. How do I make this the best? It can be, and you know, for, for each film, it's, it's something different. So for Panther, there was a, a reason behind it for Ryan and I, and same with all the other projects. Mm -hmm. So you, you had to look a thousand years in the future. Mm -hmm. And you didn't come to Silicon Valley to look at that future. No. Talk about that. Well, first I had to look a thousand years in the past. Uh -huh. That was a big part of Wakanda was the honoring of the culture and the tradition and the diaspora, uh, the African diaspora, that really is what Wakanda is representational of. Um, so I had to look backwards because I think the past is a very important bridge to what the future is. Um, and that needs to inclusion in, in design, in this world of what I was doing for Black Panther. Um, 
looking into the future, I didn't know, and you know what, honestly, I didn't know that Silicon Valley could ha help me for my needs. I didn't think that I was going to find in there, and honestly, I didn't really know much about it. I live in New Orleans. It's a very small town. I don't live in Los Angeles. I don't live in New York. I live in a place where the population is like 250,000 to 300,000 people. Um, you know, I, I didn't know much about Silicon Valley. I kind of knew what I saw on TV. Sounds familiar. <laughs> but I didn't really know how that could help me create this, this technology, which you would think was kind of crazy. Because what I knew I needed to do was evolve something that Silicon Valley, to me, I felt had no interest in, which is this mm. culture. Huh. So there was, you know what I mean? I, I, I felt like I kind of had to give uh, an autonomy a, a, to this story and a narrative that at times is, is restricted. Um, just in general by society, like the, the ability to tell, uh, a community's ability to tell their own story, how they want it told, um, and based on what they want it based on. So that was sort of me kind of being the person who made sure that the representation of the culture that we were digging into and creating a fictional one on top of it stayed to what I needed it to be, and I didn't know that Silicon Valley could help me. Now, I did reach out to a lot of experts mm -hmm. um, about uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, geology, geography, archaeology. Um, we talked to experts in architecture who were doing future cities, people who were sort of um, architectural archaeologists that could talk to us about some of the architecture, um, you know, uh, pre-colonial uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, of course, going to South Africa, traveling all over South Africa for three weeks and sort of understanding that, because at the heart of Black Panther was the question of, what is it to be African? And it, so that's sort of, mm -hmm. you know, why I felt like I didn't want to go or need to go to, to Silicon Valley. Hmm. Um, I don't I, know if that <laughs> like, and I mean, that's honest. That's the honest truth. Be and because I was so busy, I was like, you know, I'm just going to have to do this. I'm just going to have to figure this one out. <laughs> um, and I didn't really know a thousand years into the future. Here's the thing. It's hard enough to f go any amount into the future and understand what you think might happen mm. or how people would respond. So I found myself getting to this place where I started thinking about technology in the future, how Wakanda would use technology. Technically, Black Panther is placed in 2018. It's not sci-fi. It felt sci-fi because Wakanda, right. it, you know what I mean? We have to remember it's not science fiction. It's supposed right. to live in this universe, which is 2018. Mm. So I had to make sure it felt grounded enough that people weren't like, it's space but it also had to be advanced enough where people thought um, maybe this is something that's going to come around in you know, 50 years, 60 years or something. It's not impossible, hmm. you know? And then you had to add sort of with the vibranium, the, the fantasy of it all. So, um, you know, and I'm rambling, so. <laughs> I don't even know if I answered the question, but, you know, that's sort of, oh. I might have lost myself on you that. May, actually, when you were describing well, that, I remember walking my mom out of the theater because she can't walk very well because she has diabetes and her feet are really makes it hard. So she's walking really slowly and talking really slowly. And I remember when we just left the theater, she said, you know, Black Panther was so beautiful. All the scenery, everything was so beautiful. And it's a thing that stuck with her, how beautiful the movie is. And it's optimistic. And so where did that come from and how you were able to translate that? I mean, I like to do things that are beautiful, you know, and I, I think that's another part of Black Panther is changing this idea of narrative of how we see things. Uh, you know, it was a challenge to me of how I saw Africa, what I thought about Africa. Just because I'm black doesn't mean I'm an expert on <laughs> African culture, right? 
Um, so I really had to dig in and challenge myself about like, okay, well, what do I think? What are my biases? What was I raised with? How do, from my American experience, you know, this is a land that's a thousand miles away. And as far as I know, my ancestry begins and ends at slavery. And then the culture that came afterwards was this bastardized idea, or we were told it was a bastardized uh, culture. You know, we're not African, we're not American, so it became this bastardized culture in a sense, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you go through all of these different points in time um, throughout American history. So I needed to rediscover like what that was uh, uh, thousands of miles away from where I live mm -hmm. and how I'm connected to that, you know, because oftentimes you feel like the hyphenate between the African and American, you're really not either one. You know, so it was, what is it to be African? Because this is a movie, Wakanda's African, and it's not African-American. And, you know, one of the little things that Ryan was so brilliant at doing in the film with Killmonger's character, who's the villain, if you haven't seen it. Has ever seen Black Panther? Is that a thing? <laughs> awesome. So Killmonger, um, played by the fabulous Michael B. Jordan, if you notice something about him is his names. And part of the reason behind him having so many names is because, you know, our American ancestry is that we have been given so many names. We were Negroes, we were black folk, we were colored, we were um, Afro-American, we were African-American. Um, and that's sort of how this has gone over time. So what Ryan did was he gave Michael Jordan the Indradaka name, but they also called him Eric. They also called him Killmonger. They also called him Eric Stevens. So he's that representation of African-American, never having a true identity from different places and different people call him different things. And that's the tie back. And those are the types of things that we were trying to do. That is a piece of representation in a sense. And we'll get to representation because I think that's mostly what we want to be talking about is, is how uh, that is so important in Black Panther, right. uh, it, you know, technologically, uh, scientifically, you know, through your STEM and then also socially and economically. And, and, and so there's so many little things that we did in there. I mean, it goes so deep into how we, we, we brought in the representation and that was one of them. And it was in such a small story way that you don't even really realize that's what's happening because Shuri calls him Eric Stevens, T'Challa calls him into Jaka. His father calls him, you know, uh, Ross calls him Killmonger. Hmm. His father calls him Eric, you know. Wow. So it's, everybody, he doesn't have an identity and he's going to Wakanda to try to figure that out. Wow. And that's sort of the representation of where we are as sort of the lost tribe, as we called it. Um, in a <laughs> I'm such a Ryan Coogler fan. So I'm like, I can see that detail. I didn't see the it. small detail. You described it. Um, uh, when we, were, when we were talking last week about representation, yes. you mentioned the production designer, Wynn Thomas, and I looked up Wynn Thomas, I hadn't heard his name before, um, he had, uh, um, and he has, he has credits for Hidden Figures, A Beautiful Mind, Analyze This, all of Spike Lee's movies. So you mentioned seeing him on television or something? I, I saw he had, was nominated for an Academy Award for uh, Mars Attack, the Tim Burton film. And I happened to be watching the Academy Awards that year and I was like, oh, who's this black man <laughs> doing this thing that I want to do? And um, that was really the first time that I really saw that. I was like, oh my goodness, what is this? Um, because I'd always been a big fan of Bernardo Bertolucci, who is an Italian director, his back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and in the 80s. And um, his designer, Fernando Scarfiati, was someone who was really in a big influence to me. He was this Italian man way back when, but my design aesthetic, you know, is highly influenced by his. But I, seeing him never made me feel like, yeah, I can do that because he's this Italian guy. You know what I mean? Like, of course he can, he's an Italian guy. Like, I'm this farm girl from Ohio you know, who literally runs around with bare feet and riding my horse to the store to get Jolly Ranchers when I was like six. Mm -hmm. Like, how do I get to that? Right. How do I get, well, there's no path for me there. Mm -hmm. So I kind of started thinking like, what are some of the other things that I could do where there might be a path that's still creative and that's how I had to think, knowing that that wasn't something that was for me. But then when I saw Win, which was much later in my life, um, I was, 
that's when I realized, like, you know what, I can actually go for this. I mean, that didn't actually mean that I could go for it, but seeing it certainly made me feel that way. Mm -hmm. And I took that chance, and that gave me an opportunity to get into this industry and really go far. I mean, as I got into it, I realized, like, oh, this is really hard. <laughs> I'm the only one, and I am the only one. And that's a really strange thing to think that you are the only fe black female who does this, mm. who does what I do. Mm. And at this level, mm -hmm. you know, there's one other one, Tony Barton, you know, and she works, she's an art director working on television for Marvel. Mm. And I kind of saw her on Twitter and I was like, ah, you know, like I want to be, let's be friends. And she's like, I don't even know you. <laughs> and I'm like stalking her on Twitter, like I want to be girlfriends. And she's like, okay, maybe don't. Maybe call my agent, <laughs> maybe don't. But we finally kind of, like I broke her down and she finally decided to be my friend. And we're kind of, we're kind of besties. Don't quote me. And uh, don't go up to her and be like, Hannah said you were besties, because she'll be like, I don't know who she is. Um, so, but that's, you know, you, you want to find likeness. You want to find relatability. And when you look at communities, I think, you know, one of the other things, too, is when you look at communities who are associated with not like having a lot of tech and not, you know, having access to a lot of tech, uh, and you start relating, uh, you know, your economic status to your racial uh, profile, that all of a sudden, especially in poverty, the black community becomes associated with this idea of uh, not being tech savvy or wanting tech or having that type of thing. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Within their community. And it's, yeah. and it's basically all based on accessibility. It's not there because how many representation is not just in front of what it, whatever it is, you know, or like throwing the pretty on it that seems to be representing a, a group or a culture, but actually having the voices creating it. Mm -hmm. You know, is it how, you know, you look at it like, was it important for me to be the production designer on something like Black Panther, you know, or the Infinity Wars designer Charles Woods, would he be able to have then done that? Mm -hmm. And so I, I do believe that the, the representation uh, behind the camera, I'll say, because that's what I do. I mean, at, behind the desk, I don't, <laughs> you guys stand or I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't, you know what I'm saying? Um, well, however it goes, is is as important as creating an app or creating something, you know, specifically as having the voices there that, can, that then has the experience in those communities. Because mm. you really don't know what you don't know. And that's what I learned by going to Africa. Like, I don't know what I don't know. And, but I knew that I was going to look at it at, with beauty. I knew I was going to look at it f with the lens of, of absolute... Um, modernism and beauty and capability, all the things that I wanted to put into Panther. Like, I wasn't looking for the commercial with the poverty-stricken children. I wasn't looking for the things that were told the continent is. Hmm. I was looking for the joy and the pride and the dignity of the people that lived there. Hmm. And, you know, that's the choice we make for wherever we are, because there are, I met people who lived in the rural parts of Africa just as much as people lived in the, the modern cities, like Johannesburg, and, and uh, you know, we were in Durban, we were in Cape Town. So it's, it's you know, you could see someone dressed in their traditional Zulu or uh, traditional Kosa and, uh, in, in the city. You know, just as much as you might see that in the rural era. So I decided not only to find myself and realize that uh, I think I've been African this entire time, um, but that I, 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 I was determined to, to find all the beautiful things that I, you know, was told weren't there. Hmm. You know, because that, that then really came back to who I am as a person. Hmm. You know what I mean? It really related back to who I am and how I felt about myself and the confidences I had. So it all kind of like, our fictional world building bleeds back into our realities. Could you, we have two minutes left. Could you share a non-fiction story you shared with me that moved me very much, which was about the director Ryan Coogler, who I'm a huge fan of. Mm -hmm. And I've always, when in Silicon Valley we talk about leadership, 
mm. you know, CEO or the product manager is the CEO of the product and all these CEO-ish things. I think of Ryan Kugler as one of the great CEOs of our time in creatives. <laughs> yep. you, tell, you shared a story about him. Did you talk uh, about When that? I was talking to myself? Yes. So you obviously know I'm kind of weird. So I'm going to tell this story. Don't hold it against me. But so we're working on Creed and we're tech scouting, which is kind of we go to look at all these locations and you can spend all day. And we had stopped at this coffee shop and I got my coffee and everybody was getting their coffee, but I was kind of working out a problem. And when I'm trying to work out a problem or solve a problem, I talk out loud to myself because that's the best way to do it um, for me, apparently. And, you know, my, my friends and stuff were like poke fun at me like, oh, you're crazy. You're talking to yourself. And so, I, you know, sometimes I do and I don't even know I'm doing it. So Ryan comes walking over to me and he was like, are you talking to yourself? And I was like, you know, a little like, oh, you know what I mean? I know you and love you, but yeah. And the first thing he said, he looked at me and he said, that's a sign of a really healthy mind and a really intelligent person. And he kind of turned around and walked away. And I was kind of like ready to get the hit of like, oh, you're crazy, uh, you know, kind of funny joke, joke, but a little bit like of a slight. And that's not at all where his mind came from. It looked for the immediate positive thing about the thing that I was doing that sometimes people think is weird or could make you feel a certain way about yourself that eventually starts beating you down and, and making, you know, d defining who you are because you're hearing negative things about it. That is who Ryan is. He's the person that will constantly lift people up you know, will constantly, and he's not perfect, I promise. <laughs> There's days when I'm like, please make a decision. You have like two hours. Um, but, you know, and he, ha he does all the things that directors do that can, you know, completely bother you or things that are like amazing. But he's the type of person, like we would be on set for Warrior Falls, which was the big waterfall where they had the big fight. And, um, he gathered us all around in a big circle, you know, some people were in the water and we were, and he really told us why that scene was important. This is before we even started shooting. He really started to say why that uh, scene was important to him and really talked about having all the fictional tribes of Wakanda in one place and represented by all the references that we use of the tribes, the different tribes in sub-Saharan Africa and how that was a big a part of him really feeling complete. And, you know, you were holding hands and he's telling us all this and we're standing in this circle and you just feel like you can take on the entire world, mm -hmm. you know, at that point. So that's who he is as a director and my friend. And he's a really important voice because his perspective on, on anything and everything is the most unique perspective you will, I promise you, ever hear from anybody. If you ever get a chance to talk to him, talk to him because he will turn a situation and make you see it from a side you were never maybe even meant to see it from and all of a sudden your world opens up and so I can always and he would be standing here going like oh please stop but <laughs> but he is really that great so well oh, thanks for sharing that story what a yeah. leader and what a designer thank you everyone <laughs> thank you
Todd Kerfelman here, and I am joined with Abe Haskins, who is a developer programs engineer on the Firebase team. Hi, Abe. Hi, Todd. So uh, what is this exciting game that we see going on behind us right here? This is AppShip 2018. This is a Firebase-powered multiplayer arcade spaceship thrilling game. Extravaganza. I was... Extravaganza, yeah. It's a phenomenon. That's, that's what I was thinking. And uh, so how is this game making use of Firebase? So we started weeks ago when we generated thousands of custom rocket ships that we turned into sprites, which we turned into cards, which we got printed. And we did that all with Cloud Functions and other Google technologies. And then once we had those printed, we built scanners that can scan the cards using the new ML kit from Firebase. Then we made a game which received updates from the scanner using real-time database. Once you're in the game, it loaded your actual sprites from cloud storage for Firebase. And once you're in the game doing stuff, it shoots out analytics to Google Analytics for Firebase. So it's all Firebase through and through. Yeah, I noticed every attendee here is getting a appship.io card, each one with a unique rocket on it. Did you design all these rockets by hand? I basically did, yeah. Whew. We made a tool uh, that allowed you to go and mass produce rockets by picking and choosing parts that went together. This is mine with my custom spaceship. And basically, when you scan it in at these scanners over there, everybody just sort of has their own spaceship magically appear in the game. Yep. And so that's all being powered through Firebase. Yeah, it's all being powered through Firebase. We, like I said, we use cloud functions to actually generate the sprites, generate the cards, and we had the cards printed, and we connected all the cloud storage real-time database, so we're writing back when you scan it in. We have history on all the cards. So there's a lot that's been going on with Firebase. Um, what, for you, what are your highlights of the things that have been happening with Firebase over like the last year? Well, I personally normally work on Cloud Firestore, so I was super excited that we got to launch that. But we also have performance monitoring for keeping an eye on your app. We have A-B testing for trying out new things. We have ML Kit, which is obviously a huge, like, everything about ML is exciting and awesome, and I'm glad I got to use it a little bit here. Um, basically all that, we have so much cool stuff coming out. Excellent. Well, I'll have to check out more of it after I play a little appship.io and like, I don't know, kick your butt in it. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's give it a try. So every attendee at IO this year has a unique appship.io card that they can get here at the Firebase booth, dome, and every card has a unique rocket design on it. So when you scan this QR code at one of these scanners, my special rocket will appear on screen there. That's me. No matter what kind of app you're developing these days, there's a good chance you'll want to store your data in the cloud. Maybe that's because your users want to share their data with their friends for some exciting in-app collaboration. Or maybe it's just because they'll want to access their data from more than one device. But storing data in the cloud isn't quite as easy as it first looks. You have to set up your own servers to host the data and keep them up and running day and night. You got to spend a lot of time on the client dealing with networking issues, including making sure everything still works when your user goes offline. You need to stay up all night wondering if you've gotten your security exactly right. And spoiler alert, you probably haven't. And then you need to make sure your service can scale no matter how many millions of users you might have. All of which is time you don't get to spend on building your app. This is where Cloud Firestore comes in. Cloud Firestore lets you store your data in the cloud so you can sync it across all your devices or share them among multiple users. And it comes with all the conveniences you'd expect from a Firebase product, like robust client libraries, full support for offline mode so your app will continue to work just fine whether you're connected or not, even on the web, a comprehensive set of security rules to help you manage access and sleep at night, and an easy to use data browsing tool. It also lets you structure your data in ways that make sense to you, thanks to its powerful querying and fetching capabilities. Cloud Firestore works in near real time, automatically fetching changes from your database as they happen. Or you can request and fetch data manually. It's completely up to you. Cloud Firestore brings you the best of Google Cloud Platform's powerful database infrastructure, with features like multi-regional data replication for extra reliability, strong consistency to make sure everybody's on the same page, and multi-document transactions so you can perform complex operations on your data. And we've designed it to handle the toughest workloads from the world's most popular apps so it can scale automatically to support yours. But it still integrates with other Firebase products, including Firebase Authentication for easy sign-in and Cloud Functions, which lets you run all sorts of server-side logic in response to changes in your database. 
all of which means you get a truly serverless development experience. And that means you can spend less time on infrastructure issues and more time building your app. So give Cloud Firestore a try today. You can find all our documentation here, try a sample or two, and start building something great. Stability issues can derail the success of even the best apps. Buggy apps make your users unhappy, and they might uninstall your app, leave a bad App Store review, or write negative social media. Apps can generate a lot of different crashes, and manually tracking them is time consuming. Even if you're able to collect all of this data, it's difficult to figure out which crashes to troubleshoot and fix first. Firebase Crashlytics helps by automatically collecting, analyzing, and organizing your crash reports. It also helps you understand which issues are most important so you can prioritize those first and keep your users happy. It combines a real-time dashboard and alerts to keep you aware of your newest issues and any sudden changes in stability. The dashboard shows crashes ranked by overall impact on your users, giving you the information you need at a glance. Crashes are intelligently grouped across versions of your app, with individual stack traces easily explored in the dashboard. Sometimes you might hear about crashes from users that you can't reproduce. With the help of logs and key value pairs in Crashlytics, you can add some context to each stack trace and see what your app was doing before the crash. When the crash is reported, this extra information is sent to Crashlytics, becomes visible in the dashboard, and gives you the context you need to help pinpoint the exact cause of the crash. Non-fatal errors can be reported in the dashboard too, so when your code fails but doesn't crash your app, you can still get full reports in the dashboard. If your app is built with the NDK on Android, Crashlytics will capture native stack traces as well. Crashlytics is easy to integrate with zero lines of code required on Android. With iOS, just use CocoaPods for simple integration. You can count on Crashlytics to help stay on top of the stability of your app, spend less time troubleshooting issues, and more time doing what you love with Crashlytics. And to learn more and get started with Firebase Crashlytics, check out the documentation right here.
Hello and welcome to Total Mobile Dev Made Fun with Flutter and Firebase. I'm Emily Shack. I'm Emily Fortuna. And today we are going to show you just how easy and fun it can be to build your very own mobile app using Flutter live here on stage. But to kick things off, we're going to tell you a little story about our friend Francine. Now, Francine was the proud owner of a pet store, and she realized the one thing that she needed for her business was to write a mobile app that would allow people to see her inventory, reserve fish that they were interested, and so then when they came into the store, they would be on hold and they could adopt them. Now, I know that Google I.O. is the worldwide gathering of aquarium enthusiasts. Uh, so we I'm, are not, I'm not sure that's quite right, but I do know that we have a lot of mobile developers in the audience. So I think they'll still appreciate this. All right. Well, so it's still relevant. So we have a, we will, today we'll be live coding a pet adoption app for fish for Francine on stage. So let's switch over to the devices and we can see the app that we'll be live coding today. As you see, we have these nice cards with information about the fish. There are nice animations as you can slide between the information about the fish. There, some of the fish are even animated. And if you decide that a fish is the right one for you, you can hit that catch button and then it is reserved. Then you can hop over and you can see that it has disappeared from the view of the other phone. So no one else can reserve that same fish. Now if you hop over reserve, view, which Emily has, you can see that the fish that she has reserved is available. And if she decides that dart is not actually the fish that's right for her, then she can swipe up and it has been cleared from your reservation. And if you decide that you have a regret from if you let loose the wrong fish, you can shake and your fish is back reserved. And as you notice, there are all these great sound effects to go along with all of your actions. So let's hop back to the slides. So whether you are creating an app to create a home for unloved marine animals or just coding up that app that you've been talking about for years, what we hope you'll find today is just how easy it is with Flutter to make your vision a reality. One of the great things about Flutter is you can get a native look and feel for both iOS and Android all from a single code base. So you don't have to learn multiple new technologies just to get an app that can serve all of your users. And not only is it a native look and feel, it is an actual Flutter compiles down to native code. So you don't have to sacrifice quality to get a great looking app. One of the reasons that I always look forward to developing in Flutter is hot reload. So all I have to do is type my code into the IDE, hit save, and then it's almost, it's instantaneously on my phone. The only downside is I no longer have time to make coffee because my code's already running. Flutter also has many powerful components that you can integrate with that go beyond the scope of Flutter itself. In this talk, we're going to be showing you how to integrate Cloud Firestore, which is an option for your server-side component of your app. You can also integrate uh, the accelerometer. That's how we're showing you uh, shake to undo. And we're also going to integrate those crucial sound effects for the flushing of that fish. And all of this is done in the same code base so that you don't have to deal with the hairy details of those device platform-specific APIs. So I'm going to jump on over to the code base, and we're going to give you a little tour of what we're going to be coding before we go ahead and dive into the coding portion. So we went ahead and wrote some class declarations for you, because watching us type class declarations is kind of boring. But we'll do a quick overview of what the file looks like. So at the top, we have our main function, our entry point. That's where we're going to be building our top level widget or component that we're drawing in our app. 
Our top level widget is very creatively called My App. My App is in charge of getting the information from Cloud Firestore, or AKA Francine's fish database, and then telling to draw that app as, uh, to screen. My App has a fish page and a corresponding fish page state. Now, you'll notice that fish page is a stateful widget, whereas all the other widgets you see are stateless widgets. If you remember when we demoed, we had that undo functionality. And so that's some information that we need to store and have a long running uh, persistent action of what we last did to the fish. So if we decide that we need to undo that, we have that. So for this reason, we're storing that in fish page so we can have that long running persistent state. For everything else, we have stateless widgets so that it can just draw to screen whatever information we provide it. Fish page has a fish options. That is that center section that allows you to scroll through all the available fish that you are able to adopt. And then fish options is made up of many profile cards. And that's the individual cards that you have for your fish. Now, there's probably a few more class declarations in here than you would want to have if you were coding this app for real. But for the sake of live coding, we're putting it all in one file so that it's easy for us to jump around and for you to see what's going on. We do have one more file, though. Hop over to the utils class. There are two classes in it. Fish data is just a convenience class. So when we're writing information to Cloud Firestore, it's going to be in the form of a map. And so fish data takes that map and converts it into a Dart object. And then we, when we want to write it back to Cloud Firestore, we convert it back to a map. Local audio tools is just a wrapper around the audio tools function or plugin, which allows us to write, uh, play audio files from locally from our devices. So let's go back to main. And Emily has our app running up on the uh, devices. So let's switch over to the device view and see what we've got. OK, I think this is a pretty good app to start out with. Obviously, we have a long way to go here. One thing that I'm noticing right off the bat, though, is that the text in that app bar and in that button at the bottom is a little bit larger than I might have on apps on my phone. Why is that? That's a good question. So actually, uh, this is a good illustration of Flutter's accessibility features. So if you are vision impaired or if you are giving a presentation, you want to make sure the people in the back rows are able to see the text, uh, you can set the text size, default text size on your phone to be larger. And Flutter uh, will respond to this and then increase all the text size in the app. So we increase the text size without changing anything in our code itself. OK. So I know that I can read this app, but there's not really much here that I'm reading yet. Why don't we go ahead and get some content in there? I think the most important thing to start out with is that we have some nautical theming in the background to really show that we're shopping for a fish. Sounds good. So we can do that by setting the color of that center section. So we're in fish page state. There's a build method. This is the method that gets called when, you, when Flutter wants to draw this widget to screen. Build method exists for every single widget that you have. So here, we are constructing a scaffold. That provides the outline for its children widgets and where they should be displayed on the screen. Scaffold has an app bar. That's that title bar at the top, giving the name of our app. Then we have the bottom navigation bar. That allows us to toggle between the two individual views. And then at the bottom, we have this fish options as that main body. So to set the color, Emily's going to wrap this in a container and set the color of the container. Now, why are we wrapping this in another widget rather than just setting the color of fish options directly? This is actually a common design pattern in Flutter to favor composition over inheritance. And if you can imagine, we could potentially have parameters in fish options to set the color and the width and the padding. But you could then maybe have 100 parameters, and it could get pretty overwhelming. Having a composition in the way we build our widgets keeps our APIs much leaner. And it allows us to build a combination of widgets in ways that we might, the API designer, maybe originally had never envisioned. So Emily specified Indigo. She's ready. She's hit save. Hot reload is happening. Let's switch over to the devices. There it is. Staring that forever. 
And that was pretty fast too, sub-second, I would say. So we didn't have to rebuild our entire app to get that to show up. Uh, so now, I like the color, but I think it would be nice if we had some content on top of that. All right, all right. So we can do that by adding that profile card. So in our fish options right now, let's go to that build function. And right now we have a placeholder container. So we're going to get rid of that, and then we're going to construct a profile card. Emily is also constructing a default fish data, because right now we're not connected to our fish database on Cloud Firestore. So fish data just has some placeholder images, placeholder name and information, so that we can see what it looks like before we connect to Cloud Firestore. Now, if you are familiar with Dart, which was what we are using to code, uh, you might be noticing, hey, Emily's constructing this profile card, but she's not using new anywhere. What's with that? Well, uh, this is a good example of how the Dart and Flutter teams have collaborated. Flutter was saying, hey, we have a lot of Flutter users that are noticing that new is cluttering up their code because they're constructing all these widgets. What do we do? So the Dart team made new optional, and this is part of two point, Dart 2.0. So uh, now you can just write a profile card. So Emily's got it all written up. We're going to hit Save, and it's going to hot reload. Switch over devices. All right, we've got a pretty empty card on here. I think what I want most in my viewing of a fish is to see the big picture of the fish. OK, OK. So let us modify the profile card. So if we swap back over to the code, inside profile card, let's look at their profile card's build function. That's pretty simple. We're just construct calling get card contents and wrapping it in a card. That's a material widget. Get card contents does three things. It's calling show profile picture, which is clearly falling down on the job. It is calling show data. And then lastly, show button. So let's go into show profile picture and make it actually display a picture. Take, take out that container. Instead, Emily's calling fade in image. So usually, we're going to be getting an image from Cloud Firestore. So that's a call to the server that's potentially asynchronous data. So when we build, we might not have that data at the moment of building. So for that reason, now you could just pass in an image. But once it has that image data, it might pop in. That could be visually jarring. So instead, Emily's making a fade in image that once we have the image, it will fade into view very nicely. And then lastly, we're specifying the fit. So images have a width and height. And in saying boxfit.cover, saying expand to fill all the available size, even if it means cu cutting off some part of the image. So Emily's going to hit save, which hot reloads. And we're going to switch over to the devices. Oh, it already faded in. You didn't get to see that so fast. All right. We've got our big picture of a fish, but I need to know more about that fish before I decide to adopt it. I want to know the fish's name, its personality. Yes, that is very important for human fish bonding. So let's go back to the code. Emily's going to modify show data. And we have declared three text widgets. The first one is the name widget. Second one is the music widget, fish's preferred music. And then lastly, preferred pH. And to display those, we're going to wrap those three in a column widget, which is going to stack them from top to bottom. Assembly is going to hit Save. It's going to hot reload. Go over the devices. Do we see it? Yes, there it is. All right. So I can understand now this is Frank. He loves blub step. His favorite pH is 7. But the information's a little cluttered right now. And I feel like his name's probably the most important piece of this. So how could I set that apart? All right, all right. So we can do that by setting the text style. So instead, how about we make it bold, and we could set we could double the font size. That would help it stand out a little bit more. That way, people can look up Frank by name. So let's look at the devices again. Oh, that's much better. Mm, okay, I think we're getting there, but I still think the Frank should be a little bit apart from the rest of the information. Okay, so back at the code, um, how about we wrap that text widget in some padding? Now, there's a really handy feature with Visual Studio Code, which is what we are currently using. This also works in Android Studio and IntelliJ. You can just wrap a widget inside of another widget. So it takes care of all the indentation for you. So Emily's going to wrap this in some padding. It's done. We're wrapping it in eight pixels of padding, which is good enough for us. So we're just going to hit Save, 
hot reloading and look at our devices, uh, much, much better. Hmm, okay, so I think that the card is in a pretty good place, but I'm a little tired of looking at Frank. What if we got some real data in there? I like Frank. But okay, okay. So um, let's connect to Cloud Firestore. So at the top, um, that my app, right now we are passing an empty list because we're not getting any data from Cloud Firestore. So instead, we're going to be making our, our call to Cloud Firestore. So there are two different ways that you could deal with asynchronous data because we're making a call to a database or Cloud Firestore to get our information. The first way to deal with asynchronous data is futures or promises, depending on where you're coming from. And this is if you want one bit of data asynchronously. Streams are your other option. Now, streams are if you need multiple pieces of data. In this case, we want a snapshot of cloud, all, all the information on Cloud Firestore. And then when something changes on that database, we want to get a new snapshot of all the fish that ha are still there. So in this case, stream is the correct option. And then there's this convenient stream builder, which allows us to build widgets from the stream. So Emily has specified the source of the stream. This is from Cloud Firestore. We are getting a collection of fish profiles. And then we are calling the builder to build widgets based on that fish information. You might notice on the line 32, we have this interesting question mark syntax. What's going on there? So what we're saying is, is data null? If it is, don't call dot documents. And then you can return that empty list or assign that empty list to the documents variable. Otherwise, get the, the documents from Cloud Firestore. And then we're taking that map and converting it to a fish data object. So we have a list of fish data, passing it into fish page. Now, you might be wondering, how are we accessing this Firestore variable? Well, if you scroll up to the imports, you see we have these package imports, particularly Cloud Firestore. Where does that come from? Well, if you go over to PubSpec, this is just a YAML file that allows us to specify all of our dependencies for Dart. And the pub, which is our package manager, is able to calculate all of the versioning things, pulls them down from online, sets up all the paths correctly, and then you're good to go. You can just import them. So back to our main file. Um, we have one more change we need to do, because if you recall, Emily constructed that fish data object that was default, it had no information. Now we want to take some that stream that we just got from Cloud Firestore and display it. So here she's saying, if we have data, just call the first one, because we're only displaying one card right now. So now Emily's saved, it's hot reloaded. If we switch over to the devices, we've got some good data. OK, I'm looking at Flo, and I'm feeling pretty good. I think I might want to adopt her. Oh. But I'm not really sure how I can do that from this view. Yeah, catch does not seem to be implemented. So uh, I think it's time to implement that uh, show button. Right now, show button, our on pressed parameter is not doing anything. On pressed, we're going to pass in a function that is going to be called when the user presses it. And in this case, we want the button to function as a toggle button between reserved and unreserved. And so we're going to be passing these. If it's already reserved, unreserve it. Otherwise, reserve it. These callbacks haven't been implemented yet because we're not writing Cloud Firestore, so let's implement those. Those are in this reserve fish and remove fish. So we're up in the fish page state class right now, which you recall is a stateful widget. So in this case, we're going to be calling set state. That tells the widget, hey, there's something that might have changed in how I displayed. So Flutter, you might want to redraw me. And then Emily's setting the reserved by field to this user ID. That's a unique ID when we sign into Firebase, and it's unique per device. And then remove fish is just the same, except we set the reserved by field to null. So we have to implement our save method. That's going to be actually writing to Cloud Firestore. That's inside fish data. And it's pretty easy. We're going to take our documents, reference to that individual fish, and we're going to say, set data. And then we mapify our object. So now, when we hit save, our button should be implemented. Let's hop over to the devices. Hot reload should be in action. We got a button. Go reserve it, Emily. OK, it's time. Hmm. 
It looks like I reserved Flo on the one device, but she's still available to be reserved on the other. So I'm not really sure if I'm going to come into the store and everyone's going to think that they've reserved Flo. Yeah, we could get in a fight. Everybody wants Flo. Uh, I will hop onto the computer and you can talk us through the rest. All right. So we have one fish showing. We can reserve it on one phone, but it's not really showing a different fish on the other phone. So what we really want to do is pass in the list of fish that a user can reserve or a user already has reserved to that particular user, rather passing in all of our fish blindly. We want to filter that list. So to do that, we're going to use the dot where operator. Now this is an example of functional operators in Dart. You can use the dot where operator, or if you were paying close attention when I was implementing the Cloud Firestore piece of this, you would, you would have seen the dot map operator. Both of these are examples of functional operators. And in this case, we are iterating over every item in the all fish list and only returning a list of fish that meet the qualifications that the user has either reserved the fish or the fish is not reserved by anyone. Now, if we're in that reserved view, which is our, our shopping cart view, then we only want to display the fish that are reserved by the current user. So now, when we hot reload and switch over to the devices, we should be able to see a new fish displayed. Emily, hmm. I broke it. So it's not looking good. We have the red screen of doom. But it seems that we've encountered an error, so let's try to debug this here. When you hit an error in Flutter, it's going to show up on your devices in this red screen with a very helpful error message. This error message is going to be a little bit more concise than the more verbose version that you would see in your debug console. But let's see if we can uh, debug it from here. It looks like from the phones, it said something like type where iterable is not a subtype of type list. So probably what was happening was that when we converted uh, using the where operator, it was converting to an iterable rather than a list, because it was doing that a little bit lazily and not converting to a list until it had to. We want to explicitly convert to a list. So let's uh, go ahead and do that. I accidentally closed out of the oh. file. <coughs> I'm rewriting it. All right. So this is an example of why hot reload is so handy. <laughs> we appear to have accidentally stopped the app. And it's going to take a long time to restart it. With Hot Reload, you don't have to wait all of that time. So uh, I believe if we switch back to the code, we're still going to need to implement that dot list, or dot to list. Oh, OK, I see. I've already done that. All right, how are the phones doing? Uh, we're waiting for iPhone. It takes so long. No. Really good selling point for Flutter. I bet all of you mobile developers in the audience can relate to this problem. This is why Emily is drinking so much less coffee and tea after uh, switching to Flutter and using Hot Reload. All right, why don't we switch to slide 19, which is our backup. We're back, we're back. Oh, we're back. never mind, never mind. We're going to go over to the devices. And see, it's working so fast. Hot Reload really saved us there. <laughs> All right. Now, I know that you didn't quite get to see this because we had a little bit of a technical difficulty. But Hot Reload can actually Hot Reload past errors. So if the devices had stayed connected and we'd been able to Hot Reload, it would have shown up just like this instead of us having to quit out of the app after we'd hit an error, which can be really handy. In this case, uh, we're seeing that when we reserve a fish now, uh, the fish has disappeared from the other phone. It appears we're back to Frank. Oh, there you go. Very OK, I think probably Firebase just had a little bit of time to load those fish. Now when we reserved Flo, Flo is no longer available on the other phone. Great. Perfect. All right. But I don't know. Something doesn't seem quite right. Yeah, here. Emily, uh, I'm not really digging Marlon Brando. I would like to have some other options to adopt. That's true. We're only seeing one fish right now. But as we all know, there are plenty of fish in the sea. And we would like to give you the option to adopt all of them. So why don't we go ahead and switch back to the code. And we're going to try and implement a cover flow widget. Now, this is a widget that we are getting with another plugin, just like we got the Firestore plugin. Uh, and that's the simple CoverFlow plugin. 
Now, CoverFlow takes in two arguments. It takes in an item builder and an item count. Item builder is going to take in just basically the same code that we had before. We're just going to change that index in Fish to make sure that when we're displaying multiple cards, uh, we're not displaying flow every single time. Then we're passing in the length of the Fish list to item count so that we're not going to scroll infinitely through CoverFlow. Now, we should be able to hot reload and switch over to the phones. Oh, this is so much better. Look at all these fish I could adopt. I could adopt Gale the Whale, uh, except I don't think I have space for Gale the Whale. Can I Yeah, I think you might have gone a little overboard there. Uh, but why don't we try and see how we can remove a fish from that reserved view? That seems like a pretty handy use case for our users. So back to the code. We're going to implement two more arguments on that cover flow. We're going to add a dismissible items argument, and that's going to tell CoverFlow whether it should be able to dismiss cards by dragging up or down and having those disappear from the list. We're also adding in a callback, a dismissible callback, and that's going to be triggered whenever we do dismiss a card from the list. And that's just going to be using the same on remove callback that we implemented before. So let's go back to the devices, hot reload, and see that in action. And I think I saw, uh, yep. yep. Gale is available for anyone else to reserve. Except I don't have space for Gale the Wheel, but I think my parents have space for Gale the Wheel. I do want to adopt her. What do I okay. Do? So we don't want to dismiss a fish and then instantly regret it. We want to give the user the option to get that fish back in. So this is where we're going to integrate the accelerometer. So for this, we're going to implement a very simple undo functionality. We need, uh, first of all, our fish data to store the fish that has last been undone, or the fish that has last been removed from the list, so that we can undo that later on. So we're going to keep track of that variable and then go ahead and set it whenever we remove a fish. Now, this is a pretty simple version of undo. We're only going to be able to remove one fish at a time. But you can imagine some more complex version where we're removing multiple fish. For our purposes, this is going to work just fine. So now, we're going to need to actually trigger an undo with the accelerometer. Here, we're implementing an init state method on fish page state. All stateful widgets actually have this init state method. But a lot of the time, it's implicit and can just default to the default implementation. It's going to be called whenever we start up that state. In our case, we want to introduce our own logic, so we're going to explicitly write it out. Here, we're going to initialize a listener onto the accelerometer events stream. That stream is something that we're getting from the sensors plugin. Now, we're going to listen to these events in the background, and it's going to throw us back any accelerometer events that it finds where the phone has moved in some way. In our case, we want to trigger a shake Whenever, our un whenever the phone has accelerated in the x-axis by at least two meters per second. And we also want to uh, trigger an undo if we recognize that undo data is null and we're in that reserved view. So I believe, uh, yes, we have to uh, impose our less than or equal to, oh, yeah. or greater than or equal to two to make sure that we have some threshold there. Uh, and then when we go ahead and you think I'm about to say hot reload, but I'm actually not. There's another function here that we can use called hot restart. Hot reload is actually going to be stateful and bring you back to your current state in the app. Hot restart is a little bit different. Because we have these init state calls and maybe some calls in our main function before we built the widgets, those aren't going to get rerun when we do a stateful hot reload. We want to fully restart the app to display our new changes. But a hot restart is better than a full restart in that it's a lot faster. It's actually almost as fast as a hot reload. So we've hot restarted, and we can jump on over to the phones. So I'm reserving Gail. Remove, and she's back. Perfect. And she's disappeared from the other phone. You know what would really put the, be the icing on the cake, though? What's that? If we had sound effects. Mm, OK. Yeah, those are pretty important in any fully featured app that's trying to be a little bit whimsical. So uh, we want to in incorporate sound effects using our local audio tools class, which is calling the audio tools plugin. So here, we are going to, in the top of our main function, we're going to load a couple audio files, our background audio and our removed audio. We're also going to initialize an audio loop on that background audio. 
so that when we start up the background audio, it keeps playing until we maybe interrupt it with a different audio file. So this would be a good time to pause and talk a little bit about asynchronous functions in Dart. You'll notice that the main function is marked with the async keyword. That means that it's asynchronous and is going to return a future or a promise of a value that's going to come a little bit later on. It's also calling two more asynchronous functions. We have this Firebase auth sign in anonymously call, as well as our audio tools load file call. Both of these are asynchronous, but we're handling these in two different ways. In the first case, we're using the await keyword. And what that's saying is that we're dealing with an asynchronous function, but we really don't want the rest of our main function to continue until this one has completed, until the future has completed. So we're going to call await, and that's going to pause execution on everything after that await call in our main function. For audio tools, we're using the dot then operator. And that's going to pause execution of everything inside of that body of the operator, but it's not going to pause execution on anything else. So in our case, we want to wait for the file to be loaded before we can play it, but we don't care if the rest of the app builds a little bit before we've loaded our file. So we have one more place to incorporate audio, which is that whenever we remove a fish, of course, we want to have a nice sound effect there as well. So we're just going to call play audio, and then we should be ready to switch back to the apps, or to the devices. So we can do another hot restart this time, uh, and then switch over. And we should be able to hear some ocean breeze sounds in the background as well as that crucial flushing noise when we dismiss a fish. Uh, yeah, what do you think? That looks good. I think our app is pretty good. So why don't we go ahead and deliver this to Francine? Let's go back over to the slides. And this app is a huge success with Francine. She's so excited. She delivers it to her customers, and it drives business by over 300%, all because of Flutter. But how did we get here? Well, using Flutter, we were able to achieve a native, customizable look and feel for both iOS and Android from a single code base. But not only was it a native look and feel, we also did really compile down to native code under the hood. So we didn't have to make any sacrifices in quality or customizability. We also integrated with Cloud Firestore, which gave us all of that fish data that updated in real time. And finally, we integrated our device level controls, the accelerometer and sound, to get that app really fully featured. And all of this, all of that functionality, hard to believe, but it was done in 310 lines of code. That's everything we wrote in advance of the talk and everything we showed you today. So that's pretty low. Flutter is currently in beta. What does that mean? Well, it means we support right to left layouts in case you're writing a fish adoption app around the Dead Sea. It means we support internationalization, also related for that Dead Sea app. It means that we support accessibility, as you saw in our current app. Flutter has apps in all sorts of industries. We have finance, health, music, travel. Here are just some of the brands and companies that are writing Flutter apps. I want to highlight three of them for you. The first one is Hamilton. If you haven't heard of Hamilton, I'm sorry, you're probably not, you probably don't live in the US. This is the name of the hit Broadway musical that is about Alexander Hamilton, and their official app is written using Flutter. It has over a million downloads and over a mo uh, half a million monthly active users. On the left, you see AdWords, which is the multi-billion dollar product by Google that helps keep the lights on in Google. And their new app is also written in Flutter and is going to be released soon. On the right, we have Alibaba, which is a top 10 internet company. And their new mobile app is written in Flutter. And they're in the process of releasing it to users now. If you want to learn more about Flutter, we have so many great resources for you. First, check out Flutter.io. That's where you have information about how to download it, set it up on your computer. There's documentation. We have a Udacity Flutter course. If you want to learn about it right now, 
you should run over to the code labs. We have a whopping nine code labs about Flutter and Dart. And at various points between today and tomorrow, you might see someone that looks kind of like this and someone that kind of looks like this helping out. Uh, also, we have a sandbox. There's the Flutter, Firebase, and Cloud sandbox. We have a great section of goodies there. Uh, there's this hot reload game, which is pretty fun. Emily, have you played it? I have actually played the hot reload game. It's great. It's also a great example of how you can get really good looking 2D animations working in Flutter. And there is one more talk tomorrow that is about how you can set up good design patterns for your Flutter apps. So say you're like, I have so many widgets. How do I manage them? And how do they talk to each other? You should go to this, app, uh, this talk tomorrow. And there was one more talk that happened earlier today. And if your time machine is not in order, you should check it out on YouTube and pretty soon. Here is the code that we wrote today. This link will also be out in, uh, in two slides. We'd love to have your feedback. Go to the I.O. webpage. And then the link, that's still there. Thank you so much. It was great to share Flutter with you. We will take questions in the Flutter sandbox and adopt a lobster. way to do it um, for me, apparently. And you know, my, my friends and stuff were like, poke fun at me, like, oh, you're crazy. You're talking to yourself. And so I, you know, sometimes I do, and I don't even know I'm doing it. So Ryan comes walking over to me, and he was like, are you talking to yourself? And I was like, you know, a little like, oh, you know what I mean? I know you and love you, but yeah. And the first thing he said, he looked at me, and he said, that's a sign of a really healthy mind and a really intelligent person. And he kind of turned around and walked away. And I was kind of like ready to get the hit of like, oh, you're crazy, uh, you know, kind of funny joke joke, but a little bit like of a slate. And that's not at all where his mind came from. It looked for the immediate positive thing about the thing that I was doing that sometimes people think is weird or could make you feel a certain way about yourself that eventually starts beating you down and, and making, you know, d defining who you are because you're hearing negative things about it. That is who Ryan is. He's the person that will constantly lift people up, you know, will constantly, and he's not perfect, I promise. <laughs> There's days when I'm like, please make a decision. You have like two hours. Um, but, you know, and he, ha he does all the things that directors do that can, you know, completely bother you or things that are like amazing. But he's the type of person, like we would be on set for Warrior Falls, which was the big waterfall where they had the big fight. And um, he gathered us all around in a big circle. You know, some people were in the water and we were, and he really told us why that scene was important. This is before we even started shooting. He really started to say why that, uh, scene was important to him and really talked about having all the fictional tribes of Wakanda in one place and represented by all the references that we use of the tribes, the different tribes in sub-Saharan Africa and how that was a big a part of him really feeling complete. And, you know, you were holding hands and he's telling us all this and we're standing in this circle and you just feel like you can take on the entire world, mm -hmm. you know, at that point. So that's who he is as a director and my friend. And he's a really important voice because his perspective on, on anything and everything is the most unique perspective you will, I promise you, ever hear from anybody. If you ever get a chance to talk to him, talk to him because he will turn a situation and make you see it from a side you were never maybe even meant to see it from. And all of a sudden, your world opens up. And so I can always, and he would be standing here going like, oh, please stop. But, <laughs> but he is really that great, so. Well, thanks for sharing that story. What a leader yeah. and what a designer. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.
Hello and welcome to IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan and I'm here with Ilion, who is a principal engineer on Android and he leads Project Treble. Hi Ilion. Hello Timothy, how are you? I'm super, how are you? Excellent, thank you. <laughs> so that keynote was amazing and there was a lot of your work up there. In fact, Project Treble. I want to talk about that, but before, could you describe the problem? What are you solving with Project Treble? Uh, what we're solving is what we call uh, Android's version fragmentation problem, which is best uh, explained, you know, if you're, a, if you're an app developer, you have to deal with all of these Android versions that you have to implement against, and this is a massive uh, pain to deal with. So this is the problem that we started addressing out with Project Treble. And how you solve that with Project Treble is you make it easier for manufacturers to upgrade to the latest version, right? Correct, yeah. I mean, for developers to have the latest, device manufacturers have to launch their devices on the latest or upgrade existing ones to the latest. Uh, but historically, it's been very difficult, uh, which means expensive, um, to do that, which, uh, which is why device manufacturers simply didn't do it. Um, this, is, this is why we have Android version fragmentation today. Um, the way that we solved it is effectively by lowering their costs. That's what Project Treble is. All right, so Project Treble was introduced last year. What's new this year? Uh, what's new this year is that we effectively uh, completed the engineering portion of our work and we embarked on an operational side of it, which uh, the, the goal of it is to accelerate the deliverables, the intermediate deliverables of Android to the OEMs, to the device manufacturers, so that they can do their work to launch these devices and upgrade these devices much, much earlier than previously. So the end result is that we expect companies like Samsung, for example, to do their work this same year, in the same year when we launch uh, Android. That's awesome. Now, uh, what OEMs are launching? We have um, seven companies in addition to um, uh, Google's very own Pixel, of course who are launching um, uh, previous betas uh, this year. And these are Oppo, Vivo, Nokia, Sony, Essential, uh, OnePlus, and Xiaomi. Awesome. That's a lot of companies. Yeah. And you and I actually have our pockets full of some of these phones. Yes, we do. We do. So I think it would be neat to show there's the same version of Android running on each of these different phones. Yeah, that's, that's what's beautiful about this is that these are devices by completely different companies um, which all run the same version of Android. That's never, that was never happening until now. That's totally awesome. And, uh, there's one more thing, of course. In addition to these previews, we have uh, a total of 18 devices by 11 manufacturers who will either launch or upgrade their existing devices to the latest of Android this year. That's really cool. It is. So for developers, this again really matters because it simplifies their overall developer experience, which they can get started on by downloading the preview. That's exactly right. Elian, thank you so much for joining us to explain all of that. Thank you for having me. <laughs> to learn more, head on over to android.com slash beta. I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is IO Live. Hello, and welcome to IO Live. I'm Timothy Jordan, and I'm standing here with Tim Sneath, a product manager on Flutter. Hi, Tim. Hi, Timothy. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Let's talk about Flutter. Yes. For those few developers out there that don't know what Flutter is yet, what is it? Yeah, so Flutter is a toolkit for building native mobile apps for iOS or Android from the same code base. It's open, it's uh, open source, and uh, today at IO we're announcing a new version of Flutter. Oh, yeah, so that was my next question. What's ah. new this week? There's a new version, what else? Yeah, so to this week we're announcing Beta 3. Uh, obviously, it's the third beta of our product. Uh, we shipped uh, the first beta at Mobile World Congress a couple of months ago, and now we're starting to get to the point where we really feel like it's ready for a lot of production use, and so we're encouraging people to start taking a look at Flutter. Now, you've worked with developers using Flutter a lot. What would you say they're most excited about when they start using Flutter? Yeah, so I think there are three things primarily that make Flutter a great platform for building apps. Number one, uh, we have native performance. We, sh we compile everything that you write to ARM code. We're powered by the Dart programming language, and that enables this really fast performance. Uh, second thing is we have this unrivaled productivity. Uh, with Flutter, you can use this thing called Hot Reload, so you can uh, write your code, you can continue to work with it, and see exactly the changes that you're making in real time on the device. And then thirdly, Flutter has this high-velocity uh, graphics engine that lets your dreams come true, lets uh, designers choose what they want to build and developers put them into production. Awesome. And there's a lot of people using Flutter today. What are some of your highlights of the apps that are out and live? Yeah, so again, we've only just uh, got into beta over the last couple of months, uh, both internally at Google and externally. 
Uh, internally, well, we power some things like our ads. Uh, if you uh, ever create an ad campaign, you're using a Google app uh, built with uh, Flutter. Uh, externally, uh, probably the most famous one that uh, was shipped uh, the back end of last year was uh, Hamilton. You know the Broadway uh, musical. They shipped a companion app for uh, using Flutter that has had millions of downloads, a really great application. And then this week, we're talking about some other uh, new apps. Alibaba, the big Chinese online retailer, they have just shipped an app in Flutter that they're now rolling out to millions of customers. Uh, Groupon have an app that they're working on. Uh, we have just different kinds of apps from different industries, wine, retail, finance, loads of different people are, are coming out with apps. And in fact, we've just seen several hundred apps just since we shipped beta go live on the Play Store. If you want to get started with Flutter, what's your first step? Well, uh, there's one simple place you can go, and that's flutter.io. And there you can find sessions, you can find code labs. We're obviously live streaming six different sessions here at Google this week. Uh, there's a whole bunch of documentation, and of course you can download the Flutter SDK. And that's all at flutter.io. Flutter.io. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Of course, it's a pleasure. I'm Timothy Jordan, and this is IO Live. Hamilton is one of the most talked about and best loved musicals with shows on Broadway, in London, and around the country. We wanted something to make the show more accessible for our fans, so we wanted to develop an app to meet the needs of fans as we started to expand the brand. We turned to Posse, a New York-based development firm, to help us develop the Hamilton app. Hamilton's Flutter app launched in the App Store and the Play Store three months after we wrote our first line of code. And we accomplished a ton. Fans can enter a daily lottery for a shot at $10 tickets, buy merchandise through an e-commerce experience, take selfie photos with the ham cam, and get daily news and updates. We knew that this app needed to be rock solid, both in terms of performance and visual fidelity, and really represent the amazing experience that the Hamilton show itself provides. And ultimately, that's why we decided to use Flutter. Flutter is a mobile UI toolkit that allows developers and designers to craft beautiful native experiences on iOS and Android and is entirely free and open source. We have very high expectations of quality for the apps that we build. We expect pixel perfect results and we need them to be very high performance. Flutter gave us a lot of opportunities that previously weren't available to us. The fact that it's a single code base drastically improved our ability to deliver a consistent experience across platforms. It's hot reload gives us an ability to build more features in less time. It allowed me to make changes really fast and iterate through the UI without having to stop and restart the app. Coming from an iOS and Android background, it's something that I've been waiting for for a long time. The Flutter developer community is very active. Drop-in packages helped us maximize productivity. It helped us integrate elements like Firebase and Cloud. At the end of the day, we're just really happy that we found Flutter so that we can build these beautiful native interfaces for both iOS and Android from a single code base. We are given a really tight timeline and we turned the app around faster than I ever could have imagined. We were able to make changes right up to the night before we went live and really feel confident about them. In fact, we pushed an entirely new feature to the App Store the day before we launched. And since launch, Flutter's efficiency and speed has helped us to build new features, such as the recent trivia game. We're really excited because as the show continues to grow, we're going to be able to keep pace with a ton of new features that's going to make the app even better. We couldn't be more thrilled with Flutter. It has enabled us to use one code base to deliver a truly high quality app that Hamilton fans have absolutely fallen in love with. We're thrilled with what Posse was able to deliver. The entire brand of Hamilton is about delivering on an experience for fans. They're thrilled about the new features that we're rolling out, and we're really excited to see where the app goes next.
Well, good afternoon, everybody. Oh, come on. I got nothing. Good afternoon, everybody. There we go. There we go. Well, thank you so much for spending your time with me today. Uh, my name is Dave Smith. I'm a developer advocate here at Google working on the Android Things platform. Uh, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about building apps for the Android Things platform um, and how you can be more effective in the apps that you build using the Android SDK. So whether you're new to Android or whether you've been building Android apps since the beginning, targeting Android Things devices it has some subtle differences from what you may or may not be used to in working with Android. Understanding these differences is what will ensure that you can build better apps on the platform. But before we jump into too much of that, let me just do a quick overview of what Android Things is, maybe for the uninitiated. So Android Things is a fully managed platform for building connected devices at scale. It's a variant of the Android platform that is optimized for use in embedded devices. It enables you to build apps for embedded and IoT using the same Android SDK and Google Play services that you use to build for the Android mobile. You can develop apps using the same tools, such as Android Studio, to deploy and debug your apps to devices as well. It includes the Android Things developer console. This is a place where you can securely manage your software stability and security updates for your devices. You simply upload your apps, choose the OS version that you want to run on your device, and then deploy those updates to those devices over the air. Security updates are even deployed automatically to those devices for you. Android Things also supports powerful hardware that's suitable for edge computing and production capable of driving artificial intelligence and machine learning out to the edge. This hardware is packaged into system on modules that make it easy for you to integrate into your final production designs. So when you look at all these things together, the process is a little bit different than when you were building apps on a mobile device. Building a typical app for Android devices means distributing a single app binary through the Google Play Store, typically. Apps have to work on multiple devices made by multiple OEMs targeting multiple versions of the Android operating system, typically requiring you to do various compatibility checks and other things like that to make sure that your app runs well across that entire breadth of the ecosystem. With Android Things, you are the device OEM. You control when the OS on your device gets upgraded and the various apps that are bundled into that system image along with it. And you do all of this through the Android Things console instead of through the Google Play Store. This can greatly simplify your code because you don't need to incorporate a lot of those same compatibility checks. But there are some things to consider that are going to be a little bit different. Let's start with displays. In Android Things, displays are optional. They're supported. And you can use the full Android UI toolkit to build applications that have a graphical user interface, whether it's touch enabled or not. But we've removed a lot of the default system UI and disabled or reworked some of the APIs that assume that graphical displays are in place. Because many IoT devices will not have these pieces, and we don't want to place those requirements in there. The best example of this in practice is app permissions. So in Android Things, Permissions are not granted at runtime by the end user, because we can't assume that there's a graphical display to show things like this dialog. And we can't even really assume that user granting specific types of permissions is appropriate for an IoT device. So instead, these permissions are actually granted by you, the developer, using the Android Things console. Okay, so as the owner of your device, you're responsible for taking control of the apps that run on this device and the permissions that those particular applications have. Okay? Now, because of this, permissions may not be granted by end users. So that means you don't necessarily have to check whether or not those permissions were grant, or you don't have to request for those permissions to be granted at runtime. But since they are still granted dynamically, the best practice is still for your code to verify that you have that permission, okay? Because that permission could have been revoked by one of the console users, and you don't want your application code to behave improperly in those cases. So you'll still want to have checks like this one in your code when you are accessing dangerous permissions that could be granted or revoked by the console, but you won't have to include the code that requests those permissions up front 
from the end user. Not doing this will result in the same security exception that you would otherwise see by trying to access those protected permissions if, in fact, that permission is disabled. Additionally, in Android Things 1.0, permissions are no longer granted automatically on reboot. This is something that we did in some of the earlier previews and is no longer the case. So that means that as a developer, you can't simply just reboot your device to try and get all those permissions brought into your app automatically. You have to actually use the tooling to make that happen. So during development, what you're going to want to do is provide the dash G flag when installing the applications on your device. And this will grant all the permissions requested by your app by default. Android Studio actually does this for you automatically. So whenever you click Build and Run out of the IDE, this process is taken care of for you. But if you want to do this from the command line, you're going to have to add that flag yourself. Another option is to use the PM grant command to individually grant or revoke promotion, per permissions inside of your application. You can do this uh, during development or maybe just to test what the individual behavior is of a certain permission if you deny that inside of your application. If you prefer to use the Gradle command line, or perhaps you're running automated tests or other things where the IDE is not involved, you can actually add this to your build.gradle file using an ADB options block to apply that same dash G flag anytime your application is installed. Speaking of UI, we should probably talk a little bit about activities. Most developers think that activities are essentially screens. So if we remove displays, why do we need to keep them around? And it turns out that activities are a little bit more than that. An activity represents a component of user focus in Android. For devices with graphical displays, that does mean that it will render the contents of the view onto the window. But even for devices without displays, activities also handle all of the user input events, whether that's coming from a touchscreen input, or maybe it's a game controller, or a keyboard, or any other external input device that you may have connected. All of those events are going to be delivered to the foreground activity. So even without a graphical display, activities are still a very important uh, portion of Android user interface, even though the user interface might not actually include the graphical UI. It's important to note also when we're talking about activities that activities are still vulnerable to configuration changes the same way that they are on Android. So as an Android developer, you're probably used to, at least at some point, having to deal with an orientation change of a device and having that destroy your activity and recreate a new instance of it. That's effectively a very common configuration change on Android mobile devices. While on Android things, that specific instance probably is not very common, if it, if it would happen at all. There are still a number of other configuration changes that might still happen on Android things devices, things like changing the default locale, or con connecting or disconnecting a keyboard, a physical keyboard, from the device. All of these events have the same uh, net effect in that that activity will be destroyed and recreated if it happens to be in the foreground. So generally speaking, when you're working with activities on Android things, the same rules apply to activities in terms of the logic that you put into those components. They're effectively just as fragile in terms of their life cycle. So you're only going to want to have view-based logic or user interface-based logic inside of these activities. Try not to put too much additional state into these components. You're going to want to push that out into other parts of your application. Android Things even uses activities to launch your primary application uh, as part of the boot process. We do this using the home intent, which is the same intent that's used to trigger the app launcher on an Android mobile device. This intent starts your app automatically on boot, and specifically the activity inside of that application. Start it automatically on boot. And in addition to that, if that application crashes or terminates for any reason, Android is going to restart that application automatically. So this becomes the, the main entry point into your application that is automatically managed by the Android Things platform. So we don't want to forget about activities just yet. A couple other things about Android Things devices. Android Things devices are also relatively memory constrained when you compare them to an Android phone. 
A typical Android Things device may have 512 megabytes of RAM or so. Compare that with the multiple gigabytes of RAM that you would have on an Android phone, like say a Pixel or a Pixel 2. What this translates to for you, the developer, is that there's actually a much lower per process heap size for your individual application. So if you're not familiar with this idea, Android sets a fixed heap level on every application running on that device. And it's significantly lower than the total available memory on that device. And since the Android Things devices are relatively memory constrained, that per process limit is significantly lower than it would be on an Android phone. Because of that, if you're porting code from an Android mobile device over to Android Things, you just have to realize that if you're using the same amount of memory in your app, there's going to be a lot less free memory in that same process available to you. Okay? So you have to keep that in mind. And you also want to realize that this can also translate into a significantly larger amount of garbage collection events happening as you allocate new objects. Okay? So you want to keep a close eye on object allocations, how often you're doing object allocations, uh, because you may run into that ceiling much more quickly than you otherwise would on an Android device, or you might see the garbage collector kicking in quite a bit more. The memory profiler in Android Studio is a really great resource to help you keep an eye on what's going on inside your memory. It will allow you to track those allocations over time, as well as see overlaid into it the individual garbage collection events. So you can get a really good idea of whether or not your application is allocating too much memory and causing trouble. Some of the things that you can do to help understand your device a little bit better is use some of the activity manager methods to do some inspection on the memory capabilities of your particular device. So for example, you can use the memory class attribute on activity manager. This will give you the exact heap size that's available to your application. The value that is returned is a value in megabytes that is how much memory you have. The large memory class attribute is what your application would have if you added the large heap attribute to your manifest. I would caution you against doing this on Android things. Generally speaking, because Android things devices are memory constrained, the memory class and the large memory class of these devices are generally configured to be the same value. So adding this attribute to your manifest is essentially not going to do anything. Okay? You also want to inspect the low memory threshold of this device to get a sense for what that actually looks like. When the available memory on the device falls below that memory threshold, the device is in a state that we call memory pressure. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means and why it's important in a little bit. But just keep it in mind for now. So I want you to notice something else about this diagram that I had up before. Because of this per process heap limit that's a fixed value for a single application, if you try to put all of your application code into a single process or a single APK, you're going to be severely limited in your ability to fully utilize the memory that is available on this device. Okay? Now keep in mind, with Android Things, the only apps on the device are your apps. So you should be able to take full advantage of those memory resources as much as you possibly can. The way to do that is to split your application into multiple processes, okay? because that limit essentially will apply to each one of those processes individually. So if you can federate the design of your application out into multiple components that are actually running in separate APKs, you're going to have a much better ability to fully utilize the memory available on whatever device that you're running. To make the most effective use of our device, we're going to break this app up into multiple APKs with the primary activity running in the foreground and additional apps running in the background with support services running inside. The additional benefit of running this architecture is that it actually insulates these various components from one another. So in this scenario, if a crash happens in one of these components, it's localized just to that element. And it won't bring down your entire application and have you have to restart all of that from the beginning. So you can manage those individual issues just within that component and leave the rest of the applications or components running on your device to be unaffected. It also means that you can launch or relaunch these components individually as needed by your application. 
So if you don't need to load everything at once at boot, you can launch the various services and components just as you need them. Now, it turns out the decision to put some of your components into background apps has consequences as well. Android treats foreground and background processes a little bit differently, and we need to be aware of what's going on under the hood here. Android marks application processes by priority based on how closely they are related to the foreground application. And this is very important because of a system process known as the low memory killer. The low memory killer is a process that is constantly prowling in the background looking for new processes to devour. Its job is to ensure that the free memory on the system is available to the foreground app at any given time. So if the foreground app needs new memory and the device happens to be in a system of memory pressure, low memory killer is going to go hunting around for processes that it can terminate to allocate that memory back to the foreground. Okay? On an Android device, like a typical user-driven Android device, this can be somewhat of a nuisance to developers because their app may get terminated from the background, but at some point the user is going to relaunch it later and everything will be fine. On Android things, the low memory killer could mean that you have critical device functionality that is being terminated out from under ye underneath you and you didn't even know it. Perhaps there's a device driver running in that service, and Android killed that because it thought it was low enough priority in the background. Okay? So something to keep in mind as you're moving through this. In addition, Android Oreo introduced execution limits for background apps. So applications can no longer be started into a background state. They must either be launched from the foreground app or bound to it in some way. So because of these two things, there's a number of different common ways that you may or may not have used in the past to launch components into the background. Okay, and we're going to kind of walk through those a little bit. So the first that you might be familiar with is using the boot completed broadcast to listen for a final boot message coming from the Android framework saying that the system is up and running. You can launch other apps if you would like. Do not use this on Android things. The primary reason is because of those background execution limits, your background services actually can't be properly started into that state. In a lot of cases, it won't even work. Okay? And in addition to that, this background broadcast, this boot completed broadcast, is very unpredictable in terms of its timing. In a lot of cases, this boot completed broadcast actually triggers much, much later than when the home intent and the home activity are fully up and running in the foreground. Okay? So if you're trying to synchronize between these two things, it's not a very good mechanism to rely on. In addition, I would recommend you don't use start service. For a similar reason, start service is limited by those same background execution lim limits unless you are starting a service in foreground mode. Now, foreground services require you as a developer to actually build in a notification that would typically display to the user when that service is running. Well, we took away the system UI where that notification would display. So you end up doing a bunch of work for displaying the service that it doesn't actually gain you anything. And in addition to that, there are some difficulties with started services when it comes to managing their lifecycle. A started service, if, you crash, if that crashes for some reason, you don't have a direct connection to understand that that occurred and that you need to restart that service so that you can manage that process a little bit better. Now, Android does have this thing that uh, services can return this start sticky attribute. And that's a way for applications to tell Android that this service is important, and if it crashes or terminates for some reason, I need it to be restarted. However, Android usually only does this about once or twice for a given service before they just sort of give up and realize that at some point the user will launch this app again, maybe this will start again, and everything will be fine. Okay? That type of thinking doesn't go well for those background services that have critical functionality in them like a, like a device driver. Okay? So we recommend you use bind service instead. By using bound services, this gives the background processes an active connection to that foreground app. Okay? So you'll have a, you have a good indication of when that service is running, 
and when that service has died for some reason, so that you can manage that, relaunch it if you need to, do any of those things. This also has the added benefit of a built-in communication channel between the applications that are bound. So you can do some more direct communication with that service without having to use intents or other mechanisms like that to pass data back and forth. So looking at this diagram again, one of the other important reasons to use bound services is that pure background applications, like those that would have been started by boot completed or just start service on its own, are very low priority on the scale. Okay? Whereas bound service applications are almost as high priority as the foreground app. They are literally the highest priority you can get without being the foreground app. So this ensures that those background processes stay safe from something like low memory killer if the device ever does get into a memory pressure situation. Okay? So you get better management of those services, and you get better protection from a memory management perspective. All right, let's take a look at what this would actually look like in code. So if I have a, just a basic example of a service here that has a device driver inside of it. In this case, this is just a device driver to take some button inputs and convert them into key events like they were coming off of a keyboard. All of this logic can be fully encapsulated into this external service and can run on its own. So we can build this service component, and then from the foreground app, we can construct an intent to that service component, and we can bind to it. Notice that I'm doing this from the application class and not from a, the primary activity. Remember our discussion from activities before and the life cycle associated with those. If this is a service that needs to be as persistent as possible, we want to bind to it from a component that it's expected to be around just as long, okay? So that you don't end up with life cycle issues where your activity gets destroyed, recreated, and you're rebinding to that service unnecessarily. It doesn't necessarily cause a major problem, but it's not the best idea. In addition, with bound services, this also means that you get this feedback mechanism coming through the service connection callback. So when you bind to a service, you provide this callback as a service connection, and when the service is up and running, you will be notified through the on-service connected method. So you know exactly when this is now something you can interact with or communicate with if you need to. In addition, on service disconnected tells us any time that service stops unexpectedly, maybe because it has crashed or something else has occurred, and at that point, we probably need to take a look at restarting this, especially if it's running some critical functionality on our device. So we, we now have the information we need to properly manage this functionality from within our applications, which we wouldn't get with started services or other of these more independent mechanisms. So here's kind of a final picture of that architecture again. Android is going to manage for us automatically that foreground app using the home intent. It will launch it automatically on boot, and it will relaunch it if that application crashes for any reason. And then our application code can then manage these additional background support services through the bound service mechanism. All right. The last thing that I want to share with you today are just a couple of quick tips on doing this type of development from within Android Studio or within the development tools. So you can manage multiple APKs from within a single Android Studio project by adding each additional package as a new module. You can add multiple modules to the same project, and all of those modules can represent an APK or an individual app process. This allows you to manage all of your code in one place, even though they're technically separate apps. Now, by default, Android Studio does not allow you to deploy an app module that does not contain a launcher activity, okay, or an activity that has that main launcher intent filter on it. This doesn't work so well for background service apps that don't have any activities at all in them in some cases. But you can modify this behavior. For a background services app, you can edit the run configuration and simply adjust the launch options for that particular module, set that target to nothing instead of default activity. This will enable Android Studio to deploy that service-only app to your device, and it won't complain. You can also do this from the command line, and one of the advantages of doing it this way is that Android Studio does require that it, you deploy only one module at a time by selecting that module from the run configuration list in the UI. 
So if you have an application that's constructed of four or five different modules, all as individual APKs, it can be a bit cumbersome if you have to try and deploy them all individually all the time. One of the advantages of using the Gradle command line is that by default, when you run a command like install debug with no other modifiers, it builds and installs every module in that project. So with one command, you can deploy everything on the latest version to that device. And you can still do individual modules if you would prefer to do that by just adding the module name to the command as well. Once you've got the modules on the device, the other thing you can do directly from the command line that isn't really supported in Android Studio today is the ability to start those individual components, whether they're activities or services. So using the AM shell commands, you can trigger those services manually if you want to test out some of that behavior sort of independently from the rest of the system, even though they may be managed by the foreground app in production. All right, so let's quickly review some of the tips that we've gone through here today. Don't assume a graphical UI. Design for your memory constraints on these devices. Break your app up into modules. Bind your background services to the foreground app. Don't use started services. And use the Gradle command line if you want to have more control over deploying your modules to the device. Now, if you're just as excited about Android things as we are, I want to remind everyone that we're doing a scavenger hunt here at Google I.O. If you visit the link here or use the Google I.O. app, you can follow the instructions to find various items around the conference. And once you've, created, or once you've completed those challenges, you can then receive a free Android Things developer kit to take home. To learn more about Android Things, visit the developer site and make sure to visit the code labs, office hours, and other demos that we have here in the sandbox. Also be sure to visit androidthingswithgoogle.com to find featured community projects and additional sample code. You'll also find a lot of the sample code available for some of the demos that we have here at the conference on androidthingswithgoogle.com as well. So thank you, everyone, for your time today. And I'm really excited to see the apps that you build with Android Things.
Hey there, IO Live. I am Todd Kerpelman, and I am here inside the very crowded and popular Flutter Firebase Dome, talking to Michael Thompson, product manager of Flutter. Hi, Michael. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. So uh, there's a lot going on here inside the dome, as well as some stuff going on outside. Tell me, what are we looking at here? What's, what's going on behind us? So this is our showcase wall that illustrates the uh, wide selection of different types of apps you can build with Flutter. So Flutter, of course, is uh, Google's multi-platform SDK for building mobile apps for both iOS and Android. Uh, so what we're seeing here are some apps that look very traditional iOS look and feel. We're seeing an app from uh, Google over here from our Atlas team that has a much more traditional material look and feel. And we're seeing a number of apps that have a much more custom look and feel where they've tried to create this more brand specific extension and where the, the layout of the app really is an extension of that brand. And so what else can an attendee find if they're exploring the Flutter Dome? Yeah, so what we're seeing here is the end result. And uh, the thing that's really interesting is that's just one of our key components of our offering. Uh, the other thing is we have a great developer experience. Uh, so when you try and create UI, whether it's more traditional or more custom, we found that there's a lot of iteration going on. Uh, you may have one notion of what your screen should look like, but it's really helpful to take that and tweak it and step by step to build up your UI. So for that, we built something called Hot Reloads, which is the ability to update the current screen you're looking at and in just a few hundred uh, milliseconds, push a small change to that running application, preserving the whole state without having to re-navigate back in. Uh, and that's actually an example of all the great engineering we do in this project. Uh, so when you use Hot Reload, you're running against a virtual machine, uh, which is how we can do those quick reloads. But when you're running these apps in production, very importantly, we compile these to native ARM machine code. So you get the combination of fast iteration speed at development time with fast execution speed in production goals. The thing about Hot Reload that I think maybe not everyone gets at first is this is actually running on a real device. Like the, the game, you're editing real code. Yeah, so this is, the, the, we do a lot of uh, really cool engineering in this project, I think. Uh, so when you run during development time with your Flutter app, you run on a virtual machine, so we can push these tiny updates to the running app and see that effect right away. But when you're running all these apps behind us in release mode, we actually compile straight to native machine code. So we get the combination of this fantastic performance with 60 frames a second in production apps and amazing stateful hot reload but we can update the UI in just a few hundred milliseconds. Wow, I have to say that is great. As a developer, like I know sometimes it you know, takes 30, 45 seconds to compile a new version, and those are like the longest 30, 45 seconds in the world. So one of the uh, sort of expressions we use for this is you can uh, paint your app to life in Flutter. So you can sit down and collaborate with a designer, and they can ask you to tweak the app, and you're just making those tweaks on the fly. And you know, in less than a second, they can see the effect and it enables you to experiment, and I think that's actually one of the main reasons why we're seeing all these creative layouts come out, is that tight developer loop you're getting uh, with Flutter. So I know a lot of developers I've talked to have been very excited about Flutter. Everyone I've talked to who's really kind of used it is like, you know, walked away super excited about the potential. Um, what's new in, in Beta 3 that developers can look forward to? There are a number of new things in Beta 3. Uh, we're announcing a couple of new partnerships. I mentioned uh, two dimensions here, which uh, Welcome everyone, I am Jeremiah and this is TensorFlow in production. I'm excited that you're all here because that means you're excited about production. And that means you're building things that people actually use. So our talk today has three parts. I want to start by quickly drawing a thread that kind of connects all of them. Uh, and the first thread is the origin of these projects. These projects really come from our teams that are on the front line of machine learning. So these are real problems that we've come across doing machine learning at Google scale. And these are the real solutions that let us do machine learning at Google. The second thing I want to talk about is this observation. Um, if we look at software engineering over the years, we see this growth. 
as we discover new tools, as we discover best practices, we're really getting more effective at doing, machine, or doing software engineering, and we're getting more efficient. We're seeing the same kind of growth on the machine learning side. Right? We're discovering new best practices and new tools. The catch is that this growth is maybe 10 or 15 years behind software engineering. Um, and we're also rediscovering a lot of the same things that exist in software engineering, but in a machine learning context. So we're doing things like discovering version control for machine learning or continuous integration for machine learning. So I think it's worth keeping that in mind as we move through the talks. The first one up is going to be TensorFlow Hub. And this is something that lets you share reusable pieces of machine learning, much the same way we share code. Then we'll talk a little bit about deploying machine learning models with TensorFlow Serving. And we'll finish up with TensorFlow Extended, which wraps a lot of these things together in a platform to increase your velocity as a machine learning practitioner. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Andrew to talk about TensorFlow Hub. Thanks, Jeremiah. Hi, everybody. I'm Andrew Gasparovich. And uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about TensorFlow Hub, which is a new library that's designed to bring reusability to machine learning. So software repositories have been a real benefit to developer productivity over the past 10 or 15 years. And they're great, first of all, because when you're writing something new, uh, if you have a repository, you think, oh, maybe I'll check whether there's something that already exists and reuse that rather than starting from scratch. Um, but a second thing that happens is you start thinking, maybe I'll write my code in a way that's specifically designed for reuse which is great because it makes your code more modular, but it also has the potential to benefit a whole community if you share that code. What we are doing with TensorFlow Hub is bringing that idea of a repository to machine learning. In this case, TensorFlow Hub is designed so that you can create, share, and reuse components of ML models. And if you think about it, it's even more important to have a repository for machine learning, even more so than software development. Because in the case of machine learning, not only are you reusing the algorithm and the expertise, but you're also reusing potentially enormous amount of compute power that went into training the model and all of the training data as well. So all four of those, the algorithm, the training data, the compute, and the expertise, all go into a module, which is shareable with TensorFlow Hub. And then you can import those into your model. And those models, uh, those modules are pre-trained. So they have the weights and the TensorFlow graph inside. And unlike a model, they're designed to be composable, which means that you can put them together like building blocks and add your own stuff on top. They're reusable, which means that they have common signatures so that you can swap one for another. And they're retrainable, which means that you can actually backpropagate through uh, a module that you've inserted into your graph. So let's take a quick look at an example. Uh, in this case, we'll do a little bit of image classification. Let's say that we want to make an, an app to classify rabbit breeds from photos. But we only have a few hundred example photos, probably not enough to build a whole image classifier from scratch. But what we could do is start from a general purpose model, and we could take the reusable part of it, the architecture and the weights there, take off the classification, and then we could add our own classifier on top and train it with our own examples. We'll keep that reusable part fixed, and we'll train our own classifier on top. So if you're using TensorFlow Hub, you start at tensorflow.org slash hub, where you can find a whole bunch of 
newly released, state-of-the-art, research-oriented, and the well-known image modules. Some of them are, uh, cl include classification, and some of them chop off the cl classification layers and just output feature vectors. So that's what we want in our own case, in this case, because we're going to add uh, classification on top. So maybe we'll choose um, NASNet, which is a, uh, an image module that was created by a neural architecture search. So we'll choose NASNet A, the large version, with the feature vectors. So we just paste the URL for the module into our um, TF Hub code. And then we're ready to use that module just like a function. In between, the module gets downloaded and instantiated into your graph. So all you have to do is get those feature vectors, add your own classification on top, and output the, um, the new categories. So specifically what we're doing is training just the classification part while keeping all of the module's weights fixed. But the great thing about reusing a module is that you get all of the uh, training and compute that's gone into um, that reusable portion. So in the case of NASNet, it was over 62,000 GPU hours that went into finding the architecture and training the model, plus all of the expertise, the testing, um, and the research that went into NASNet. You're reusing all of that in that one line of uh, code. And as I mentioned before, those modules are uh, trainable. So if you have enough data, you can do fine tuning with the module. If you set that trainable parameter to true and you select that you want to use the training graph, what you'll end up doing is training the entire thing along with your classification. The caveat being that, of course, you have to lower the learning rate uh, so that you don't ruin the weights inside the module. But if you have enough training data, it's something that you can do to get even better accuracy. And in general, we have lots of image modules on TF Hub. We have ones that are straight out of research papers like NASNet. We have ones that are great for production, and even ones made for on-device usage like MobileNet, plus all of the industry standard ones that people are familiar with like Inception and uh, ResNet. So let's look at one more example, in this case doing a little bit of text classification. We'll do, uh, look at some restaurant reviews and decide whether they're positive or negative sentiment. And one of the great things about TF Hub is that all of those modules, because they're TensorFlow graphs, you can include things like pre-processing. So the text modules that are available on TF Hub take whole sentences and phrases, not just individual words, because they have all of the tokenization and pre-processing uh, stored in the graph itself. So we'll use one of those, and basically the same idea. We're going to select a sentence embedding module, we'll add our own classification on top, and we'll train it with our own data. But we'll keep the module itself fixed. And just like before, we'll start by going to tensorflow.org slash hub and uh, take a look at the text modules that are available. In this case, maybe we'll choose the Universal Sentence Encoder, which is uh, just recently released um, based on a research paper from last month. And the idea is that it was trained on a variety of tasks and is specifically meant to support using it with a variety of tasks. And it also takes just a very small amount of training data to uh, use it in your model, which is perfect for our uh, example case. So we'll use that universal sentence encoder. And just like before, we'll paste the URL into our code. The difference here is we're using it with a text embedding column. That way, we can feed it into one of the uh, high-level TensorFlow estimators, in this case, the DNN classifier. Uh, but you could also use that module it, like I showed in the earlier example, calling it just as a function. If you are using the text embedding column, that also, uh, just like in the other example, can be trained as well. And just like in the other example, it's something that you can do with a lower learning rate if you have a lot of 
training data, and it may give you better accuracy. And so um, we have a lot of text modules available on TF Hub. We actually just added three new languages to the NNLM modules, Chinese, Korean, and Indonesian. Those are all trained on uh, GNU's training data. And we also have a uh, really great module called ELMO from some recent research, which understands words in context. Uh, and of course, the universal sentence encoder, as I talked about. So just to show you for a minute some of those URLs that we've been looking at, um, maybe we'll take apart the pieces here. tfhub.dev is our new source for um, Google and selected partner published modules. In this case, this is Google that's the publisher, and the universal sentence encoder is the name of the module. The one at the end is a version number. So TensorFlow Hub considers um, modules to be immutable. And so the version number is there so that if you're you know, doing one training run and then another, you don't have a situation where the, the module chain changes unexpectedly. So all modules on tfhub.dev are versioned that way. And one of the nice things about those URLs, if you paste them into a browser, uh, you get the module documentation. The idea being that maybe you read a new paper, you see, oh, there's a URL for a TF Hub module in it. You paste it into your browser, you see the documentation, you paste it into some code, and in one line, you're able to use that module and try out the new research. And speaking of the uh, universal encoder, the team just released a new light version which is a much smaller size. It's about 25 megabytes. And it's specifically designed for uh, cases where the full text module wouldn't work for doing things like on-device classification. Also today, we released a new module from DeepMind. This one, uh, you can feed in video, and it will classify and detect the actions in that video. So in this case, it correctly guesses the video is of people playing cricket. And of course, we also have um, a number of other interesting modules. There's a generative image module, which is trained on Celeb A. Uh, it has a progressive GAN inside. And also the deep local features module which um, can identify the key points of landmark images. Those are all available now on TF Hub. And last but not least, I wanted to mention that we just announced our support for TensorFlow.js. So using the TensorFlow.js converter, you can directly convert a TF Hub module into a format that can be used on the web. It's uh, a really simple integration to be able to take a module and use it in the web browser with tensorflow.js. And we're really excited to see what you build with it. So just to summarize, TensorFlow Hub is designed to be a starting point for reusable machine learning. And the idea is, just like with a software repository, before you start from scratch, check out what's available on TensorFlow Hub. And you may find that it's better to start with a module and import that into your model rather than starting the task completely from scratch. We have a lot of modules available, and we're adding more all the time. And uh, we're really excited to see what you build. So thanks. Next up is Jeremiah to talk about TF Serving. All right. Thank you, Andrew. So next is TensorFlow Serving. This is going to be how we deploy modules, or deploy models. Just to get a sense for where this falls in the machine learning process, right, we start with our data. We use TensorFlow to train a model. And the output, our artifact there, are these models. right? These are saved models. It's a graphical representation of the, the data flow. And once we have those, we want to share them with the world. That's where TensorFlow Serving comes in. It's this big orange box. So this is something that takes our models and exposes them to the world through a service so clients can make requests. T 
TensorFlow serving will take them, run the inference, run the model, come up with an answer, and return that in a response. So TensorFlow serving is actually the libraries and binaries. You need to do this to do this production grade inference over trained TensorFlow models. Uh, it's written in C++ and supports things like gRPC and plays nicely with Kubernetes. So to do this well, it has a couple of features. The first and most important is it supports multiple models. So on one TensorFlow model server, you can load multiple models, right? And just like most folks probably wouldn't push a new binary right to production, you don't want to push a new model right to production either. So having these multiple models in memory lets you be serving one model on production traffic and load a new one and maybe send it some canary requests, send it some QA requests, make sure everything's all right, and then move the traffic over to that new model. And this supports doing things like reloading. If you have a stream of models you're producing, TensorFlow Serving will transparently load the new ones and unload the old ones. We've built in a lot of isolation. Um, if you have a model that's serving a lot of traffic in one thread and it's time to load a new model, we make sure to do that in a separate thread. That way we don't cause any hiccups in the thread that's serving production traffic. And again, this entire system has been built from the ground up to be very high throughput. Things like selecting those different models based on the name or selecting different versions. That's very, very efficient. Similarly, it has some advanced batching, right? This way we can make use of accelerators. We also see improvements on standard CPUs with this batching. Um, and then lots of other enhancements, everything from protocol buffer magic um, to lots more. And this is really what we use inside Google to serve TensorFlow. I think there's over 1,500 projects that use it. It serves somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 million QPS, which ends up being about 100 million items predicted per second. And we're also seeing some adoption outside of Google. One of the new things I'd like to share today is distributed serving. So looking inside Google, we've seen a couple of trends. One is that models are getting bigger and bigger. Some of the ones inside Google are over a terabyte in size. The other thing we're seeing is this sharing of subgraphs, right? TF Hub is producing these common pieces of models. And we're also seeing more and more specialization in these models as they get bigger and bigger, right? If you look at some of these model structures, they look less like a model that would belong on one machine and more like an entire system. So that's, this is exactly what distributed serving is meant for. Kind of lets us take the single model and basically break it up into microservices. So to get a better feel for that, we'll say that Andrew has taken his rabbit classifier and is serving it on a model server. And we'll say that I want to create a similar system to classify cat breeds. And so I've done the same thing. I've started from TensorFlow Hub. So you can see I've got the TensorFlow Hub module in the center there. And you'll notice that since we both started from the same module, we have the same bits of code. We have the same core to our machine learned model. So what we can do is we can start a third server, and we can put the TensorFlow Hub module on that server. And we can remove it from the servers on the outside and leave in its place this placeholder we call a remote op. And you can think of this as a portal. It's kind of a forwarding op that when we run the inference, it forwards at the appropriate point in the, in the processing to the model server. There, the computation is done, and the result gets sent back. And the computation continues on our classifiers on the outside. So there's a few reasons we might want to do this, right? We can get rid of some duplication. Now we only have one model server loading all these weights. Um, we also get the benefit that that can batch requests that are coming from both sides. And also, we can set up different configurations. You can imagine we might have this model server just loaded with TPUs, our tensor processing units, so that it can do um, what are most likely convolutional operations and things like that very efficiently. So another place where we use this is with large sharded models. So if you're familiar with deep learning, 
There's this technique of embedding things like words or YouTube video IDs um, as a string of numbers, right? We represent them as this vector of numbers. And if you have a lot of words or you have a lot of YouTube videos, you're going to have a lot of data, so much that it won't fit on one machine. So we use a system like this to split up those embeddings for the words um, into these shards, and we can distribute there. And of course, the main model, when it needs something, can reach out, get it, and then do the computation. Another example is what we call triggering models. So we'll say we are building a spam detector. And we have a full model, which is a very, very powerful spam detector. You know, maybe it looks at the words, understands the context. It's very powerful, but it's very expensive. And we can't afford to run it on every single email message we get. So what we do instead is we put this triggering model in front of it. As you can imagine, there's a lot of cases where we're in a position to very quickly say, yes, this is spam, or no, it's not. So for instance, if we get an email that's from within our own domain, you know, maybe we can just say, that's not spam, and the triggering model can quickly return that. If it's something that's difficult, it can go ahead and forward that on to the full model where it will process it. So a similar concept is this mixture of experts. So in this case, let's say we want to build a system where we're going to classify the breed of either a rabbit or a cat. So what we're going to do is we're going to have two models we're going to call expert models. Right? So we have one that's an expert at rabbits and another that's an expert at cats. And so here we're going to use a gating model to get a picture of either a rabbit or cat. And the only thing it's going to do is decide if it's a rabbit or a cat and forward it on to the appropriate expert who will process it and will send that, that result back. All right, there's lots of use cases. We're excited to see what uh, people start to build with these remote ops. Um, the next thing I'll quickly mention is a REST API. This was one of the top requests on GitHub, so we're happy to be releasing this soon. This will make it much easier to integrate things with existing, uh, existing services. And it's nice because you don't actually have to choose. On one model server with one TensorFlow model, you can serve either the RESTful endpoint or the gRPC. There's three APIs. There's some higher level ones like for classification and regression. There's also a lower level predict. And this is more of a tensor in, tensor out for the things that don't fit into classify and regress. So looking at this quickly, uh, you can see the URI here. We can specify the model, right? This may be like rabbit or cat. Uh, we can optionally specify a version, and our verbs are the classify, regress, and predict. We have two examples. The first one, you can see we're asking the iris model to classify something. And here, we aren't giving it a version, a uh, model version, so it'll just use the most recent or the highest version automatically. And the bottom example is one where we're using the MNIST model, and we're specifying the version to be 3.1.4 and asking it to do a prediction. So this lets you, this lets you easily integrate things um, and easily version models and switch between them. I'll quickly mention the API. If you're familiar with TensorFlow example, you know that representing it in JSON is a little bit cumbersome. So you can see it's pretty verbose here. There's some other warts, like needing to encode things in base64. Instead, with TensorFlow serving, the RESTful API uses a more idiomatic JSON, which is much more pleasant, much more succinct. And here, this last example just kind of pulls it all together, where you can use curl to actually make predictions uh, from the command line. So I encourage you to check out the project at TensorFlow serving. There's lots of great documentation and things like that. And we also welcome contributions and code, discussion, ideas um, on our GitHub project page. So I'd like to finish with James to talk about TensorFlow Extended. Thanks. All right, so I'm going to start with a single non-controversial statement. Uh, this has been shown true many, many times by many people. Uh, in short, TFX is our answer to that statement. 
I'll start with a simple diagram. Uh, this core box represents your machine learning code. Uh, this is the magic bits of algorithms that actually take the data in and produce reasonable results. The blue boxes represent everything else you need to actually use machine learning reliably and scalably in an actual real production setting. Uh, the blue boxes are going to be where you're spending most of your time. It comprises most of the lines of code. And it's also going to be the source of most of the things that are setting off your pagers in the middle of the night. Uh, in our case, if we squint at this just about correctly, uh, the core ML box looks like TensorFlow, and all of the blue boxes together comprise TFX. So we're going to quickly run through four of the key principles that TFX was built on. Uh, first, accessibility. And TFX is going to be flexible in three ways. Uh, first of all, we're going to take advantage of the flexibility built into TensorFlow. Using it as our trainer means that we can do anything TensorFlow can do at the model level, which means you can have wide models, deep models, supervised models, unsupervised uh, tree models, anything that we can whip up together. Second, we're flexible with regards to input data. We can handle images, text, sparse data, multimodal models, where you might want to train images and surrounding text, or something like videos plus captions. Uh, third, there are multiple ways you might go about actually training a model. If your goal is to build a kitten detector, you may have all of your data up front, and your goal may be to build one model of sufficiently high quality, and then you're done. In contrast to that, if your goal is to build a viral kitten video detector or a personalized kitten recommender, then you're not going to have all of your data up front. So typically, you train a model, get it into production, and then as data comes in, you'll throw away that model and train a new model, and then throw away that model and train a new model. We're actually throwing out some good data along with these models, though, so we can try a worm starting strategy instead, where we'll continuously train the same model but as data comes in, we'll warm start based on the previous state of the model and just add the additional new data. This will let us re result in higher quality models with faster convergence. Uh, next, let's talk about portability. So each of the TFX modules, represented by the blue boxes, don't need to do all of the heavy lifting themselves. They're part of an open source ecosystem which means we can lean on things like TensorFlow and take advantage of its native portability. This means we can run locally. We can scale up and run in a cloud environment. We can scale to devices that you're thinking about today and to devices that you might be thinking about tomorrow. A large portion of machine learning is data processing. So we rely on Apache Beam, which is built for this task. And again, we can take advantage of Beam's portability as our own, which means we can use the direct runner locally, where you might be starting out with a small piece of data, building small models to affirm that your approaches are actually correct, and then scale up into the cloud with a data flow runner. Also utilize something like the Flink runner, or things that are in progress right now, like a Spark runner. We'll see the same story again with Kubernetes, where we can start with Minikube running locally, scale up into the cloud or to clusters that we have for other purposes, and eventually scale to things that don't yet exist, but they're still in progress. So portability is only part of the scalability story. Uh, traditionally, we've seen two very different roles involved in machine learning. So you'll have the data scientists on one side and the production infrastructure engineers on the other side. The differences between these are not just amounts of data, but there are key concerns that each has about, as they go about their daily business. With TFX, we can specifically target use cases that are in common between the two, as well as things that are specific to the two. So this will allow us to have one unified system that can scale up to the cloud and down to smaller environments and actually unlock collaboration between these two roles. Finally, we believe heavily in interactivity. We should be able to get quick, iterative results with responsive tooling and fast debugging. And this interactivity should remain such, even at scale, with large sets of data or large models. So this is a fairly ambitious goal. So where are we now? So today, we've open sourced a few key areas of responsibility. So we have transform, model analysis, serving, and facets. 
each one of these is useful on its own, but is much more so when used in concert with the others. So let's walk through what this might look like in practice. So our goal here is to take a bunch of data we've accumulated and do something useful for our users of our product. These are the steps we want to take along the way. So let's start with step one with the data. We're going to pull this up in facets and use it to actually analyze what features might be useful predictors, look for any anomalies, so outliers in our data or missing features, to try to avoid the classic garbage in, garbage out problem, and to try to inform what data we're going to need to further pre-process before it's useful for our ML training, which leads into our next step, which is to actually use transform to transform our features. So TF Transform will let you do full pass analysis and transforms of your base data. And it's also very firmly attached to the TF graph itself, which will ensure that you're applying the same transforms in training as in serving. From the code, you can see that we're taking advantage of a few ops built into transform. And we could do things like scale, generate vocabularies, or bucketize our base data. And this code will look the same regardless of our execution environment. And of course, if you need to define your own operations, you can do so. So this puts us at the point where we're strongly suspicious that we have data we can actually use to generate a model. So let's look at doing that. We're going to use a TensorFlow estimator, which is a high-level API that will let us quickly define, train, and export our model. Uh, this is a small set of estimators that are present in core TensorFlow. There are a lot more available, and you can also create your own. We're going to look ahead to some future steps, and we're going to purposefully export two graphs into our save model, one specific to serving and one specific to model evaluation. And again, from the code, you can see that we're going to, in this case, we're going to use a wide and deep model. We're going to define it, we're going to train it, and we're going to do our exports. So now we have a model. We could just push this directly to production, but that would probably be a very bad idea. So let's try to gain a little more confidence in what would happen if we actually did so for our end users. So we're going to step into TF model analysis. We're going to utilize this to evaluate our model over a large data set. And then we're going to define, in this case, uh, one, but you could possibly use many, uh, slices of this data that we want to analyze independently from others. This will allow us to actually look at subsets of our data that may be representative of subsets of our users and how our metrics actually track between these groups. For example, you may have sets of users in different languages, maybe access with different devices, or maybe you have a very small but passionate community of rabbit aficionados mixed in with your larger community of kitten fanatics. And you want to make sure that your model will actually give a positive experiences to both groups equally. So now we have a model that we're confident in, and we want to push it to serving. So let's get this up and throw some queries at it. So this is quick. Uh, now we have a model up. We have a server listening on port 9000 for gRPC requests. So now we're going to back out into our actual product code. We can assemble individual prediction requests, and then we can send them out to our server. And if this slide doesn't look like your actual code, and this one looks more similar, then you'll be happy to see that this is coming soon. I'm cheating a little by showing you this now as current state, but we're super excited about this, and this is one of those real soon now scenarios. So that's today. Uh, what's coming next? So first, uh, please contribute and join the TensorFlow.org community. We don't want the only time that we're talking back and forth here to be at summits and conferences. Uh, secondly, some of you may have seen the TFX paper at KDD last year. Uh, this specifies what we believe an end-to-end -end platform actually looks like. Uh, here it is. And by we believing that this is what it looks like, uh, this is what it looks like. This is actually what's powering some of the pretty awesome AI-first products that you've been seeing at I.O. and that you've probably been using yourselves. But again, this is where we are in OSS right now. Uh, 
This is not the full platform, but you can see what we're aiming for, and we'll get there eventually. So again, uh, please download this software, uh, use it to make good things, and send us feedback. And thank you from all of us for uh, being current and future users and for choosing to spend your time with us today.
Hey there, IO Live. Todd Kerfelman here, and I'm here with Jen Tong, who is apparently using the power of the cloud to like find new planets. No big deal, you know. Yeah, why not? Sure. So, Jen, what is going on here at this at this booth? So behind us, we see Project Panoptes, which is an open source project that includes open source hardware that is composed entirely of commercial off-the-shelf components. And it is intended to be low cost enough for educational institutions and hobby astronomers to build these robotic telescopes and contribute to the project. And so what happens once they build these robotic telescopes? How, how are they discovering stars, or planets, I should say? So the way they discover planets around other stars is by combining their efforts uh, using the cloud. So what happens is each night the telescopes will all wake up and look at the sky. And they'll get a bunch of great images of the sky. And then when the day comes, they'll go to sleep, but not really. They're going to start uploading all of their data to the cloud platform. And from there, we can combine all the data together, aggregate it, and then from that, we can infer the existence of planets around other stars. And how do you infer the existence of planets? So planets are very hard to see directly because their stars are very bright and there's lots of glare and they're very far away. In fact, a star only looks like one pixel uh, on the camera. So we have to use some trickery to do that. So instead of looking for the planet directly, we look for a dimming of the star when the planet moves between us and the star, kind of like an eclipse, or we call it a transit in a more general case. And so, so the general idea is you've got hundreds of telescopes all around the world taking pictures of the night sky. They combine all those images up to Google Cloud, which analyzes them all and looks for a star that dims on a regular enough basis that you think it must be because there's a planet passing in front of it. That is exactly correct. So we are able to infer that just by having a whole bunch of samples from having a very large fleet of telescopes. Wow, that's very interesting. Now, um, if I remember from being three years old, stars do twinkle. How can you tell that a star is dimming because of a planet passing in front of it versus like, you know, normal star twinkling, which is totally a, uh, a technical term? Totally technical. And uh, that's a great question because that's some part of the stuff that makes Panoptes special. Because we're using commercial off-the-shelf cameras instead of specialized astronomy sensors, we have to compensate for the fact that those cameras are designed to take color photos. Because when a camera takes color photos, it filters some of the light out using this thing called a Bayer filter. And when the star twinkles, it moves around that Bayer filter, and it makes it much harder to count the number of photons, because we don't know how much are getting filtered out by the Bayer filter. So the way we compensate for that is we look for another star in the same picture that has the exact same amount of twinkle. And from that, we can do a relative brightness measurement, because we know how bright those stars should be, because we can identify the star. And that's how we kind of cancel out the twinkle. And I'm contractually obligated to ask, what awesome Google Cloud Platform features are you using to power Project Panoptes? Yeah, Panoptes definitely kind of illustrates that boring uses of the cloud can, can enable really cool stuff. So we are using some simple stuff. We're using uh, some of the simple security controls. We're putting a uh, service account on each one of the devices so we can control access to a specific telescope, can access a specific part of our storage buckets. And then we're using Google Cloud Storage to store all of that data. And then we're aggregating it on Google Compute Engine. And so the general idea is anybody can get involved. They can build their own telescope. And they can be part of this project. And then if they find a star, they can name it after themselves. Is that, is that basically it? Well, naming stars is a more complicated issue. Uh, and individual Panoptes telescopes don't actually discover a star themselves. It's kind of like a, a team that, that collaboratively accomplishes a goal. But yeah, anybody can get involved. We especially like to work with hobbyist astronomers and educational institutions because we, we want to kind of inspire a love of astronomy in, in the youth around the world. That's good. And how would I get started if I wanted to? So I encourage you to go check out projectpanoptes.org. All right, so you heard it here. Go to projectpanoptes.org, and you too can name a star after you. Jen totally promised that you can do that. Hello, IO Live, and I am coming to you from the cloud, or I guess more specifically, the cloud section of the IO space. And we're just going to do some demos. So I'm here with Sarah Robinson. Sarah, what is this that we're looking at here? We are looking at a demo of our cloud machine learning APIs, um, specifically highlighting our video API, speech API, and translation API. So. What these let you do is they let you access a pre-trained machine learning model with a single REST API request. So you don't need to know anything about how machine learning works to use them. Awesome, and what is this game that we have set up? So we're going to see how we compare to our video API. Should we take a look? You mean like me against the computer?
<laughs> Hello and welcome. I'm Russ Ketchum. I'm the product lead for Google Analytics for Firebase. And it's so great to be back with all of you here at I.O. It was two years ago on a stage not too far from here that we launched Google Analytics for Firebase. And in the time since, it's been awesome to partner with so many of you across so many apps to harness the power of app-first analytics that's tightly integrated into a mobile developer platform. You've used Firebase and Google Analytics for Firebase specifically to create so many magical, intuitive, fun, useful, creative, I can't imagine my life before I had them, apps. The range that you've created is truly incredible. It's also incredible to have had so many conversations with you all about the range of business goals that you have and life cycle challenges that you face. Some of you are just starting out. Others are established players. Some of you are focused on growth. Others of you are expanding your focus to include re-engagement. For some, monetization is a goal of the hopefully not too distant future. And yet others, you're on to your second or even your third simultaneous monetization strategy. Now, while you have a lot of diversity to the challenges and goals you have, there's also a lot of things that you have in common. And one of the big ones remains. Let's face it, building a successful app is still really hard. But it's no surprise when you ask the Google Analytics team, we think that having good data is often the key to making the process achievable and repeatable. But of course, having good data isn't always easy in the first place. So mobile apps generate an incredibly large amount of data. Even small apps do. And that's why when we were building Google Analytics for Firebase, we built it to scale. And that's how we're able to offer free and unlimited event reporting, even for the largest of apps. But then once you collect all that data, that creates another set of challenges. You shouldn't have to be a forensic scientist sifting through your data to try to glean some sort of understanding. And that's why Google Analytics for Firebase surfaces key themes and insights and brings them right to the forefront. But you can have all the understanding in the world, but if you can't take action on it, then really, what's the point? And that's why Google Analytics is immediately actionable inside of Firebase and across our other app-focused products at Google. Now, we believe that these three pieces are a good starting point for getting your data story right. But really, they're just that. They're a starting point. So today, we're really excited to share with you how some of our latest features we think will truly change the way that you work with analytics. And so the first is truly a foundational change. So up until this point, if you had two apps in a Firebase project, regardless if they were the same platform or a mix of iOS or Android, you had to analyze them individually. So we've heard from you all loud and clear that this forced isolation doesn't really map to how you think about understanding in-app activity. You think about what goes on in your project more holistically. So today, I'm really excited to announce project-level reporting in Google Analytics for Firebase. So with it, the event data for all of your apps in a given project are collected together to give you a single and comprehensive view of what's happening. And we're really excited about the possibilities this is going to unlock. And these possibilities, they're not limited to one moment in time. Being able to take this holistic perspective has inciting implications across your journey as an app developer. Across Firebase and Google Analytics for Firebase, we've delivered a slew of capabilities to help you build and grow your apps. Now, with project-level analytics, all of those features become even more powerful. But also, now that we have a core foundation that's inherently multi-platform, this is going to unlock entirely new types of capabilities that we're really excited to begin to explore. We're going to look at a lot more of these today. Specifically, we're going to show you what this new holistic perspective looks like in Google Analytics for Firebase. And then we're going to pivot and show you how you can use it to build stable, well-functioning apps, how to monetize more effectively, and how to grow and retain your high-value users. So without further delay, I'd like to invite Steve and Mai up on stage 
to show you what this looks like in action. Thanks, Russ. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Gannon. And I'm Milo, and we're product managers for Google Analytics for Firebase. Uh, OK. So today, we're going to start with what Russ has already mentioned, gaining a holistic view of your app. So let's dive in. For many of you, your Firebase project represents your product and your business. And although seeing the analytics for each of your apps independently can be useful and inspire meaningful actions, you really want to know how your product is being used and how your business is performing as a whole. And up until this point, the only solution had been to integrate with BigQuery and then to do some kind of data manipulation elsewhere, possibly in Data Studio or in a tool that's internal to your company. Yet over 90% of the top 100 apps on Google Play are also available in the App Store. And what this means is just one of many statistics that highlights how it's important to see and understand your app data across platforms, because many of you, in fact, have it across platforms. So I'm excited to announce that within the next few weeks, you can view all of the analytics for your app at the project level. So instead of seeing your data separated by platform, you can now see your event activity combined. You will see things like first opens, purchases, revenue across your Android and iOS app. And project level analytics as a concept also applies to the other places in analytics that you've become used to, such as audiences, funnels, and retention cohorts. Of course, you will still need to be able to focus in on one app in your project to make sure there are no issues with key metrics or efforts that you have that are specific to a platform. And you can still do that. By applying a stream filter. <laughs> so a stream is just a source of analytics data, and it maps one to one with an app in Firebase. And it's not an all or nothing situation. So you can filter on other dimensions in addition to a stream. So maybe sometimes you want to only see production versions of your app and not the noise of the test versions. Our new flexible filters control allows you to do just that. And the use case is just built from there, right? You can see the concept applied to age or user properties, OS versions, et cetera. Another place where we find it particularly powerful to have project-level insights is real time. So here, the changes in the way you work with analytics are twofold. One is around what we've been talking about, which is project-level data. And two is around where you're seeing the data. And some of you may remember last year, we launched StreamView, which helps you understand what your users are doing inside your product right now. It's a big and exciting launch for analytics. And at the time, it was its own dedicated section in our UI, and it lived separately, which made it hard to incorporate the insights from that section within the rest of the context of your app. So I'm excited to let you know that now, as of today, throughout the whole product, you see real-time cards to give you that missing connection to your users so you know what they're doing right at this moment in time. This gives you an idea of, your product, of how your business is performing right now, within the context of all the other app data that may not be real-time in nature. And of course, if you want to dive deeper into real-time data, you can still do that. You click through, and you'll arrive in our stream view section. OK, time to look at some of this stuff live. Steve's here to do just that. All right, so today we're going to take a look at Flooded. Flooded is a simple, fun, addictive puzzle game that's available on Google Play and on the Apple App Store. And it leverages a number of different Firebase features. It's also the public Firebase demo project. So it's a place you can go to check out all the latest Firebase features, see what Firebase has to offer. To access the demo project, just go to the Firebase console and look for the prompt that says, Explore a demo project, and click on it. And you'll be able to take a look at all the features, the analytics features that we're talking about here today, which will be rolling out to your projects in the coming weeks. Now, for a special treat for those of you who are attending I.O., if you're interested in getting priority access to these features,
just head over to the Firebase sandbox at any time. Look for somebody wearing that bright yellow Firebase shirt and let them know that you're interested in that. They can get you signed up for it. So without further ado, let's switch to the demo, please. The demo starts here on the project overview for Floodit. This is also being revamped and will be rolling out soon. Among other changes, there's a focus on a lot more analytics data being shown here, so that at a glance you can, get, uh, you can check the pulse of your project. Previously, there was one day worth of analytics data here. Now that's been expanded to show two weeks worth, and it focuses on daily active users, day one retention, and revenue. Now, this is across your project, but also broken down by app in your project. Also, as Maya mentioned before, we're spreading real-time data out throughout the product, showing it in context in other places. So you can see even here in the project overview, we're showing a count of users playing Floodit right now, actually participating in my demo, 79 of them. So in addition to being a good pulse check on your app, the project overview acts as a good springboard into analytics if that's your destination. So you can click on any of these cards to jump right into the analytics dashboard. So I've landed here on the dashboard. I'm going to take just a time out from the demo to point something out. So some of you who are familiar with the dashboard might have already noticed there's a small change in our user interface, and it's worth calling out. The app selector is gone. So there used to be a drop-down next to the dashboard, next to the word dashboard, that would require you to select the app that you want to analyze. And by removing that, what we're doing is actually showing together all the data from all of the apps in the project together. This is project-level reporting. Now, it may seem like a small change in UI, but actually this signals a fundamental shift in how analytics is going to work going forward. From now on, the events being logged from any of the apps in your product are actually being collected in a single analytics property. And the way that you configure your analytics is going to change as well. It used to be that you configure each app independently. So for Floodit, I registered a whole set of audiences, user properties, conversions, and funnels for the iOS version. And then I had to go and do the exact same setup for the Android version. And any changes I'd make there, there on, I'd have to go and mimic the copies to the other ones. Going forward, that's, we're going to configure analytics at the project level. So you can configure it just once for your project, and it applies to all apps in the project going forward. And we've, what we've done also is <clears throat> combine the configuration that you have at the, pro at the app level into a single configuration and promoted that to the project level. And our engineers have worked extremely hard, and I have to give them a shout out, really, really hard to ensure that your historical data and your configuration is migrating seamlessly into this new world to make sure that you don't miss a beat. The result is an analytics product which is simpler to set up, easier to maintain, and more powerful in its reporting capabilities. It makes it easy to answer important questions like, how much money is my app business making? Or how much time are users spending in my apps across platforms? And the answers to those questions so that starts in this dashboard. If you haven't seen the dashboard in a little while, it's actually gone through a huge overhaul, a complete facelift. And we center the reporting around questions that people in your organization need to ask and answer on a daily basis to do their jobs. Questions related to conversions, engagement, revenue, stability, your latest release acquisition, and so forth. And we have real-time cards everywhere, as Mai mentioned, showing us that now it's up to 86 users playing Floodit since I started. So we're on the up and up there. So that's 84 users across the apps in the project. Now, I recognize that this is a developer's conference, and there's bound to be some of you in the audience going, this project-level stuff sounds great for someone, but I work on just the iOS version of the app. Are you telling me that I, I have to look at all the data together and I can't just isolate? the iOS version, and of course, that's not what we're saying. We just changed the, the way subtly that you're going to look at data from one specific app. Going forward, you're going to apply a stream filter if that's what you want to do. A stream is just a source of analytics data, and in Firebase, that maps one-to-one -one with an app in your project. So if I wanted to look at data just for the iOS version of Floodit, I could click that, or just the Android version, or unfiltered, looking at the product, the whole project. Floodit's set up pretty simply, but I've seen a lot of projects set up with many more apps. For example, some projects have one app for every stage, for alpha, for beta, and for release, or the production version of your app. 
And if you're set up like that, now you'll have the ability to actually just filter in the release version of your app or just beta or just alpha. So you have more flexibility than you had before, actually. You haven't lost any. So let's take a look at how this works. We put it together to answer some real questions. As a product manager on Floodit, I want to know how much time are people playing Floodit each day? So I'll go to the user engagement card. That shows me that the daily user engagement is 11 minutes and 45 seconds. That's how much time, it, on average, people are playing Floodit Flood each day. If I'm curious if that changes for iOS, I can apply that as a filter. And I can see that it goes down to 11 minutes, 39 seconds, so remarkably consistent, which I guess isn't too shocking because there's feature parity among the apps. But I can go further than that. If there's new flexibility here, which will allow me to also apply uh, filters beyond just the stream. And if I'm curious how, how this metric holds up with people on new devices, maybe I want to filter for iPhone 8s and the iPhone 10 as well. I can apply those all as filters all at the same time. And you can see that engagement actually goes up by a little bit. Maybe this is you know, a small sample size, or maybe there's some correlation between people on these latest phones and flood it, or maybe the experience is just better. It's hard to tell without diving deeper, but you can do that with these calls to action at the bottom of each of the card, letting you go deeper along those same lines of investigation. So I could go into more and more examples, but now that you know how to access the demo project yourself, I encourage you to check out these features for yourself and get a sense of how these new features and analytics All right. So while we work really hard to meet your needs with our reports and dashboards that we're building, we know sometimes you just got to take the data and manipulate it yourself. Maybe it's an additional analysis or joining the data with outside sources. Up until this point, the only way to do that is to integrate with BigQuery. And we love BigQuery, but it may be more than what you need. So I'm happy to let you know that we've built CSV export into our UI. And now you can download almost any report you see with the click of a button in the overflow menu. But CSV export is aggregates only. So some of you may be interested in the raw underlying data. And of course, some of you are already integrated with BigQuery and are loving using it in collaboration with Data Studio. So you're wondering, what does project level mean for me? Well, I want to assure you we've got you covered. And project level data is also available in BigQuery and Data Studio. So you'll be able to see and visualize project level data without any tallying of any kind. You can just focus on customizing your dashboard. So let's take a look at these live. Please switch to the demo. So we're back here in Fudd and we'll pick up where we left off. And we'll take a look at how you get access to the underlying analytics data, starting with access to your reporting data. So to access your reporting data, you download CSV. The first thing to keep in mind with CSV download is what you see is what you get. And so the CSV that you download will reflect the report that you're looking at, including the date range and the filters that you have applied to it. So in this case, if I want to download a, the metrics for my dashboard for project level analytics, I'll remove the filters that I had applied for the earlier part of the demo. All right. And now I just choose download CSV. That finishes downloading. And take a look at the data. And it looks like this. So you have the data you see on the dashboard, a section for each of the cards, and the metrics for every day. You can copy this into a spreadsheet to continue your analysis. I've done that ahead of time, because I'm crafty like that. And you can see that my daily, weekly, and monthly active users are shown per day here in the sheet, where I can do a one-off analysis. I'll do one for example here today. Sometimes people want to compute Dow Mao, which is daily active use, the ratio of daily active users to monthly active users. This is a common proxy for stickiness in an app. So maybe we want to do a one-off here. We'll define Dow Mao, say that it's equal to daily divided by monthly, apply that down, and then graph it. And that quickly, I've done a one-off analysis where I can give an answer to someone who was asking for it or check the pulse on some metric that I care about. Now, this is your reporting data. As Mai said, it's aggregate. And there's some tasks that you need to do which will require 
raw data. For example, if you want to combine your analytics user data with data that you collect independently, like from your CRM database, you're going to need access to raw data. And we make that possible through our integration with BigQuery. The way that you access BigQuery is first, you have to link your Firebase project to BigQuery. You do that starting with this gear. You go to your project settings. And in the integration section, you'll find BigQuery. And you can link to, link to that product there. Once you do that, and I'll head over to BigQuery to show you the result. So this is the BigQuery user interface for those of you unfamiliar with it. And BigQuery, for those of you unfamiliar with the product, is Google's tool for running super fast queries over massive data sets. And when I've linked my Firebase project to BigQuery, previously what that would do is actually create a data set for each app. So I have highlighted the data set for my iOS app and a data set for my Android app. Going forward and keeping with the theme of project level analytics, Firebase will export its analytics data to a single project level data set. And all the data for those for all of your apps will be exported into that single data set. This will make it much simpler to run queries across your apps and to join data from your project with external data. I'll run a quick query here just to show you a simple example of how it works. This is a count of events broken down by event name and platform. And I'll run the query, and it usually just takes a second, and there you go. It's a count of the events for Android. And if I scroll through, you'll see the iOS events as well. Now, some of you may not be looking for a technical interface. You'd rather have something more visual to work with, but you still want to access your raw data. And that's where our integration with Data Studio really shines. It's additive on top of this BigQuery export. And product managers from Data Studio and Google Analytics for Firebase have created this set of two reports templates that you can apply to your own raw BigQuery data to give you a really quick head start in analyzing your raw data in a visual way. Nothing technical required here. In our Help Center, it can walk you through just a series of clicks to get up and running and see these visualizations for yourself. This is what our public demo project reporting looks like. And there's three pages full of curated reports that give you insights into your user's location, broken down by city, language, et cetera, filterable by platform, app, et cetera. And it goes much deeper than this. And what you can do is you can just make it your own. You click the Edit button, and you can start editing the graphics, give it your own branding, remove metrics, add your own. You can click on any control, change the dimension, or change the metric. And when you have it looking just the way you want it, you click Share, and you can share the report with any party that's interested in seeing it. And it keeps up to date as new data pipes into BigQuery. So now we've talked about how project-level analytics will change your reporting. And we've talked about how it also changes the way you get access to the underlying data. Now we're going to pivot and talk about some features which will change the way developers work with analytics. Can we switch back to the slides, please? All right. So we all know it's critical to have insights into um, your user base, your revenue, your growth, and so on. It's foundational, of course, to have an app that's stable and actually works as you intended to. And we all know you guys love Crashlytics. And we're, that's why we're excited that Crashlytics is now part of Firebase and the Crash Reporter for Firebase. But if you like Crashlytics before, just wait. It gets even better with Google Analytics for Firebase. Because we also know many of you guys love our breadcrumbs feature. So that's why we've integrated it with Crashlytics. So now you can access our breadcrumbs in the Crashlytics section of the Firebase console. Because we want to make sure you have all the data you need at your fingertips when you need to troubleshoot. And Steve's going to show you what that looks like in just a second. Beyond understanding your crashes, you also want to know how your releases are landing with your users. So you want to know the answers to questions like, how is my latest release affecting the user experience? Or how am I trending release to release? And thus far, we didn't have that information for you. So I'm happy to show you that we have a latest release report, which was inspired by the Fabric report of the same name. And here we show you how your latest builds are performing. And to make things easy for you, we, uh, if you have any issues around stability in your latest release, we deep link you into Crashlytics or Crash Reporting, depending on which you're using, so that you can be in the right place to troubleshoot right away. 
All right, so coming up, we have a case study to bring these features to life. And center stage is actually an app that Steve built. So let's take a look. So before coming to Google, I was a lifelong game developer. And one of the last games I released was Transworld Endless Skater. Skate, as we call it, is a skateboarding take on the endless runner genre. And I've integrated Google Analytics for Firebase to track my KPI and Crashlytics to track my stability. And I want to reiterate what Maya said. We are so stoked to have Crashlytics as part of Firebase now. There's not a better tool on the market to help monitor the stability of your app. Now, most crash reporting tools at least give you a list of issues, the number of users it's affecting, and also will give you a call stack related to each issue. But as we all know, call stacks aren't always enough to understand where a crash is occurring or how to reproduce it. For example, take a look at this crash report, this issue shown in Crashlytics for my own app, Skate. The issue that I'm looking at is identified as an OpenGL rendering crash. And the crash occurs in an OpenGL driver. Basically, some triangle somewhere caused a crash. Good luck trying to find and fix that. If my own QA department had reported this, I'd march over there and I'd say, you've got to give me more info than this. Tell me what skater you were using, what level you were on, what screens the user viewed before the crash occurred. And, and then maybe you can actually get started fixing it. And that's why I'm so excited about the breadcrumbs integration, because that's exactly the sort of data you'll get, the extra context you get, from having logged analytics events already. So you can see in this example, after the session start, this user, uh, I logged a select content event, which will identify the skater the user chose, and then a level start event at the start of the level, which identifies that the user started the school level, they were not using a gamepad or logged in. Basically, give me all this context about the answers to the questions I might otherwise ask. And, and so this, this changes how developers think about analytics. Because now they want to log events because it will help them do their job better on a daily basis. If I'm an app developer, I'm going to put these in there, not necessarily because it's going to help the business person track success, but because it will help me fix bugs when they occur. And that's really exciting to me to think that it will change the way developers work with analytics. Now, crash reporting is one way to examine the health of your app. But latest release report that we launched approaches the problem from another direction. It's, this is a screenshot of the latest release report for Skate. And it compares the stability and the engagement of your latest release compared to previous versions to make sure that everything's looking good. It might be that your app is just as stable, but people are spending a lot less time in it because you messed up. And this is a case study of when that recently happened to me. So taking a look at the adoption chart, you might see an area there that looks a little bit fishy. There's like a seven-day period where an app was rolled out and subsequently rolled back and a new one was pushed out. That time period actually corresponds to a vacation that I went on right after releasing a new version of my app. And I forgot to bring my work laptop, so I couldn't fix it until I got back from vacation. And it really stunk to do this to my users. Um, I wanted nothing more than to fix it, but at least I became aware of the problem right away. And I discovered it actually using our own tool, latest release. No joke. How did I discover it? Well, the previous version of my app, uh, users were spending an average of almost nine and a half minutes playing the game each day. And the new version of my app, that went down to 27 seconds. Now, for those of you who are interested in the gory details, I had forgotten to associate my expansion file with my APK, and it has all my game data in it. So basically, users were updating to a new version of my app that had no game data, at which point they would leave and often uninstall. So I fixed it, and I can see that user engagement went up to almost 14 minutes a day. So I'm happy to report that Skate is stable again and ready to make money. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> like with many games, Skate monetizes using both in-app purchases and in-app advertisements. Next, we're going to talk about some new, re new features that actually will change the way that you monetize your apps as well. All right, so now you have an idea of how to get both broader and deeper insights into your app. You know how to build something that's stable and functions. So let's talk about the next step in some of you all's journey, which is how to make some revenue with your app. Our app map integration is a breakthrough way to get a much richer revenue figure in our reporting. When we launched, we included ads revenue, in our revenue card, as well as lifetime value in campaign reporting in our acquisitions card on the dashboard. But at the time, mediated revenue was missing, and we know how helpful it is for you all to have it included. 
Maybe some of you already heard Sissy and Trudor announce this yesterday, the launch of open bidding. But nonetheless, I'm excited to let you know that as of today, you can see mediated revenue for participating ad networks as part of both revenue and lifetime value. And of course, like everything else, also at the project level. And once you've begun monetizing your app, you can really lean on your data to help you build the best possible ads experience for your users. What does that mean? Well, we've all been there in an app that has ads that are irrelevant and annoying, and they distract you from what you've come to do. It's really not good for anybody. Well, we want to help you build the best possible ads experience for your users, because we want your users to discover new great content that delights them, and we want the discovery to be seamless, to be natural and organic, and to make sense. Firebase A-B testing launched late last year. And within the ads context, this is really the data-driven way for you to make decisions around what kind of ads experience is best for your users. You simply optimize on ad mob revenue and total revenue, which is in-app purchase and ad mob revenue. And the beauty of it is that it's a win-win situation. Your users have a better experience. They discover content that delights them. And you make more revenue in the process. But A-B testing isn't the only way you can maximize your earning potential. So Firebase Predictions is currently in beta. And it's one of the ways that Google applies machine learning to the wealth of your app data to bring you meaningful insights and actionable calls so that you can grow your business. Your app event data is analyzed to discover statistically significant correlations between something like spend and other characteristics of your users and your app. And then machine learning is applied. And Firebase can target an audience that's deemed most likely to spend either with remote config or a push notification. So take note that machine learning is most powerful when you have a high volume and a high variety of events that are important to your app. So the more meaningful and, co and contextualized you instrument your app, the better our machine learning can train the models and the more helpful the results are going to be for you, and in this case, maximizing revenue. All right, let's look at a real life case study to visualize what all this means um, as you're trying to build the best possible ads experience and effectively monetize your app. Let's take a look. So, Rockbyte makes the hit game Deep Town, which I'm sure all of you have heard of already. And in this game, you mine for metals and gems using robots with a variety of skills and abilities. And as you might expect from a strategy game, it has a deep skill tree and a robust in-game economy, which includes both items that you can purchase with real money and items that you can earn over time. Now, Rockbyte wanted to optimize their app for revenue, like we all do. And this is a study of what they did and how it all worked out. For some background, Rockbyte uh, Rockbyte's Deep Town involves two types of in-app currency. There are crystals, shown at the top here, which you can buy with real money. And there are chests, which you can purchase with crystals. Previously, the team at Rockbyte was doing experiments based on in-house heuristics for how to organize this shop for each user. But all of their experiments were inconclusive. Using a, f a combination of Firebase predictions and remote config, however, they were able to dynamically adjust the layout in the shop based on users' predicted behaviors. They tried and tested multiple options, but ultimately, here's what worked for them. If a user was predicted to not spend by Firebase predictions, predicted to not spend, they would show crystals at the top of their shop, which again, you can buy with real money. The result was an increase of 24% in revenue among non-spending non users. Conversely, if a user was predicted to spend, they would move chests, which you can't buy with real money, to the top of the shop, and put crystals, which you can buy with real money, underneath those. And that increased revenue among this group by 25%. Now, at first glance, this may not seem intuitive to you. If a user is predicted to spend, you might think that you're going to put the items that they can purchase at the top of the shop. But they tried and tested, and this is ultimately what worked. It just goes to show you how important it is that you have the ability to experiment and measure. Because intuition is great, but data is king. The CEO from Rockbyte was impressed, saying that Firebase predictions and remote config gave them the power to target users based on their predicted behavior and rapidly test different purchase flows in their beta app. Without Firebase, we would not have become profitable in today's competitive mobile gaming industry. 
That's powerful stuff there. It sounds like Deep Town's in really good shape now. They're in that enviable position where your engagement, retention, and conversion metrics are looking good. And now they can focus on acquiring the best users. All right, so let's move on to the last part of the journey we're going to cover today, which is to grow your users with high value users and to make sure they keep coming back in your app. First, let's tackle the problem of finding your high value users. So we all know this is really difficult to do. Many businesses have multiple efforts going on on this front, and they often increase in volume as your business matures. And generally speaking, when you try to find your high value users, you start by identifying an event or an action that's important to you, and you mark that as a conversion. And this unlocks attribution reporting, and that shows you what drove that user to perform the action you've deemed as high value. Thus far, attribution reporting and analytics for Firebase has only included ad clicks as an input. And yet, it's kind of hard to justify that only a click is going to credit an ad network or a campaign with a conversion, especially in our age of rich media where there's plenty of mediums that may not neatly fall into a click-only model. So I'm excited to announce that within the next few weeks, our view through attribution feature is going to be made publicly available. And what this means is that we're not only going to look at click data to credit a conversion to source, medium, and campaign, but also impression data. So you can have multiple lenses to judge your success by. Building a holistic, unbiased, and accurate attribution model is one of the cornerstones of analytics product. We understand your need that you want all of your advertising efforts evaluated for effectiveness by one engine and seeing the results side by side. To address this need, we're integrated with many different ad networks that we think you would tap into as you continue to build on and expand your growth efforts. We've been integrated with AdWords since our launch at I.O. two years ago. And a couple of months ago, we went to, public, to the public with our integration with DoubleClick. And in addition to that, we're also integrated with all of the major third-party ad networks that you all use. All right, so the last step, once you've found these high value users, is figuring out how to get them to continually come back in your app. So how do you do that? As some of you who already have linked Firebase and AdWords together know, Firebase audiences are pushed to AdWords upon linking so that you can create remarketing campaigns that target Firebase audiences. And late last year, we expanded on this integration. We wanted to leverage the rich audience builder functionality that you've come to love in our AdWords front end. So I'm excited to let you know that we publicly launched Dynamic Remarketing late last year. And this sends raw conversion and parameter data to AdWords so that you can customize and configure your audiences in the AdWords front end for remarketing campaign purposes. And we're really excited about this launch because I think it really showcases the flexibility of our data and for us to have the ability to meet you wherever you happen to be. All right, that's it for Steve and I. Russ is going to come back and close us out. Thanks, Mai. Thanks, Steve. You guys covered a ton of ground today. We announced a fundamental change to Google Analytics for Firebase that's going to let all of you take a more holistic approach to analytics. And this change is going to reverberate across everything we do. We saw it across our data export capabilities, BigQuery, Data Studio integrations, Crashalytics, now enhanced with breadcrumbs, how you can leverage A-B testing, prediction, uh, all in service of monetization, and across growth and retention. And with that, I want to thank you all for staying late, for coming out, or for tuning into the live stream. We definitely want to keep the conversation going. Uh, to do that, we would love for you all to stop by the Firebase Sandbox. Just look for anyone in a yellow shirt. We also have a bunch of related sessions for you to check out, uh, both a live one tomorrow and others on YouTube now. And we'd, of course, love to hear your feedback. So with that, thanks again for coming, and enjoy the rest of I.O.
Firestore. Oh, perfect. So I don't have to keep pulling, yeah. pulling that to see if the detection is finished. So right when it's finished, my client will get an update, and then I can then download the new image with the box around it, right. along with the confidence detection score. So that's really neat that you've managed to use the kind of architecture mm -hmm. to signal in both directions, right? You upload to cloud storage, and that uh, triggers the cloud function. So you, on upload, something happens, and it happens right away. And then coming back, once the response from ML Engine is received, you're using Firestore to basically give that real-time update to hit your phone right away as well. Mm -hmm. So you kind of keep that loop tight, even though you've managed to do this while all the all the while maintaining this kind of thin client. That's really nice that the way you've kind of leveraged the existing technology, you didn't have to write anything to make sure everything happened nice and uh, quick, but async. Yeah, one thing that's great about Firebase is I get those real-time updates whenever new data comes in that path. Fantastic. So I guess zooming out a little bit, you know, you've built the mobile app that builds a custom machine learning model, you've collected your data, you've annotated it, you're, you're training and you, you're serving at scale to your mobile client. Uh, what did you find to be kind of the most interesting part of all of this? I would say definitely learning to tie together all these different tools. So there's a lot of different things I use to build the app from end to end, from yeah. TensorFlow object detection um, to cloud machine learning engine, which had a couple of different components. It had training, serving, and online prediction. Mm -hmm. um, and then the client piece using um, some Swift SDKs and the Firebase SDK for cloud functions. Yeah, I mean, just along the way, you're hitting Python, Node, Swift, JavaScript. Oh, JavaScript is there. Uh, even a little bit of Bash with the gcloud oh, commands. Right. Yeah. Right. Outstanding. And so on the whole, what did you find to be most challenging kind of out of all of this? Um, the most challenging part was getting all of the data into Google Cloud Storage because there's mm -hmm. a lot of different pieces that needed to be there from the, the pre-trained model checkpoints, the TF records, and then that config file, which tells object detection where to find these different pieces. Right. And these are all coming kind of from different places and yeah. just getting it all arranged. Yeah, I can see how that could be challenging. And I guess, was, it, was there some fun parts as well, hopefully, along the way? It was. It was pretty fun to build. Um, one thing that was kind of funny was as I was, I, I labeled all the images myself. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a day Hard where work. I, I know it's it a tough <laughs> job. Um, so there was a day where I had pictures of Taylor Swift on my computer. People walked by, were probably wondering what I was doing. Yeah, uh, just perusing <laughs> photos all day. Right? Exactly, generating nice. those bounding boxes. Um, and the most fun thing was definitely the final result of seeing on the iOS app um, the prediction with the bounding box come back in real time. Definitely, yeah, that's a long journey. Mm -hmm. it, it was. Awesome. And as I understand, you've actually open sourced your code on GitHub. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all available on my personal GitHub repo, and there's instructions in the README if you want to build the same model yourself. Awesome. So it's, that's so great that our audience can go out and build their own model. Um, and I want to thank you so much. You know, really appreciate you coming in today and, and chatting in the studio. Thanks for having me. Great yeah, to be here. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks for watching this episode of Cloud AI Adventures. Today, we saw how to go from raw data to training, to a mobile client. You can use Sarah's GitHub repo to not only recreate this, but extend it with your own data, a different model, or a different client app. For more details, we've included links to all the resources we discussed in the description, so check it out. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please like it and subscribe to get more episodes right when they come out.
Good evening, everyone. Welcome, and hope you're having a great time at Google I.O. so far. I'm Avnish Mitaturi, and I'm a product manager at Google, working on Google Pay for online payments. And I'm Tony Chen, software engineer, also working on Google Pay. And we're here today to talk to you about what we've been working on on Google Pay to improve online checkout. So I'm sure a lot of you here are already excited about the potential for e-commerce, and rightly so. In the US alone in 2017, we saw retail sales near half a trillion dollars with the highest year-on-year -year growth in the last six years. And we're seeing similar growth trends globally. But this growth is happening despite the fact that online conversions haven't really improved. From all the estimates we've seen, conversions across desktop and mobile devices has been largely flat over the last couple of years. And it's not hard to see that cart abandonment during checkout is one of the leading causes. When users go to checkout online, they see long checkout forms, 15 plus form fields to enter their card information, their billing address, their shipping address, logins, passwords, and the list goes on. When users see all these forms, it's not surprising that they drop off, especially when they're in a low speed data connection on mobile devices. So we think there's a huge opportunity here to really improve online checkout. And that's what we hope to do with Google Pay. The start of this year, we unified our payment and checkout experiences across all of Google under a single brand, Google Pay. Our vision for Google Pay is to en enable users everywhere to pay with their Google account anywhere they're signed in. So Google Pay is more than just an app on a device or a button on a website. We're building it as a platform integrated as a core part of a user's Google account and available to them everywhere they're signed into Google. In this session, we'll spend some time to share some of the changes we've made over the last year as we've launched Google Pay. And then we'll talk about how you can implement the Google Pay API. And finally, we'll also share some of the product enhancements that are coming up. So looking back a few years ago, we launched Android Pay, and we started our journey with enabling easy in-app payments using cards that users had provisioned on their device in the Android Pay app. We launched this feature in 12 countries and saw great adoption from thousands of developers. But we heard from you, our developers, that you wanted more. You wanted access to many more users, paying with more payment methods, and in several more countries. And so we went back to the strengths of Google. Our billions of users across multiple popular products around the world. Our users have saved hundreds of millions of cards to their Google accounts, making purchases on apps like the Play Store, YouTube, or even just shopping the web using Chrome. With Google Pay, users can easily make payments with their payment methods stored in their Google account anywhere they're signed in a consistent and seamless payment experience. And Google Pay is already the way users pay across Google. Users see Google Pay today when they check out um, um, on the Play Store buying an app, renting a movie, or just on Chrome auto-filling a, uh, a checkout form. And not only is Google Pay present when users bu uh, buy from Google, but it's also being incorporated into several new services for transactions that users can make with third-party merchants. For instance, you'll see Google Pay powering checkout for merchant experiences with an Android messages for merchants that have used rich business messaging. And also Assistant enable transactions on the Google Assistant or on web actions, including AMP pages. And in keeping with our vision, we've extended our Google Pay APIs to external developers so users can pay with all of their cards in their Google account when they're on your sites or apps without any additional setup or having to download a new app. We launched earlier this year with payments enabled on Android devices, both native apps and on the mobile web using Chrome's implementation of the payment request standard. In the last few months, we've already seen great adoption from several developers around the world. Take a look. Users can already use Google Pay on a range of merchants, from order ahead apps to sites, uh, on, to retail sites, 
travel, transportation, ride sharing, and many more. We have merchants live across the world from the US, Brazil, Russia, the UK, Australia, Japan, and many more. And merchants with a global user base can enable Google Pay for all their users with a single API integration. For instance, Deliveroo, a leading order ahead app, launched Google Pay for their users in over 12 markets. And Uber is rolling out Google Pay for all of their users globally. And our early developers have seen great results uh, from their integrations. For example, Hotel Tonight saw that Google Pay users converted at a 65% higher rate than users on their regular checkout flow, thanks to the easy payment experience. And as I mentioned earlier, our new Google Pay APIs enable many more users to pay with all of their cards in the Google account. And so when StubHub updated from Android Pay, they saw a 7x increase in the number of unique users paying with Google Pay. And when Airbnb updated, they saw an 11x increase in daily transactions from Google Pay. And our APIs also enable merchants to build streamlined onboarding experiences for their users. For example, new Airbnb users, when they set up the, uh, the app, can completely skip the payment method flow, payment method setup flow, and complete a booking with Google Pay without ever having to enter any payment information or billing addresses. We're now taking a huge step to make Google Pay available to many more users and to developers on the web. Last week, we announced that Google Pay is now available across the web, from Android to desktop, and yes, even on iOS devices. Through one integration with our JavaScript libraries, merchants can enable Google Pay, Google Pay globally, available to all of your users, regardless of what device or browser they're shopping on. We've also focused on making our APIs really easy to integrate. I mean, been really encouraged by the positive feedback we've seen from developers. For instance, the Iconic, an online fashion retailer in Australia, reported that it took just one of their developers a week to enable and launch Google Pay. And in keeping with our mission to make integrations as simple as possible, we've also partnered with leading e-commerce platforms to make accepting Google Pay on the web even simpler. For instance, if you're a Shopify merchant, all you have to do is go to your uh, merchant settings page in the payment provider section, and with a single click, you can enable Google Pay. And Shopify launched just a few weeks ago, and in that time, we've already seen tens of thousands of merchants enable Google Pay. And finally, we partnered with several leading payment providers, gateways, and processors around the world to enhance security and make it easy for their merchants to add Google Pay. These providers have already enabled Google Pay in their SDKs and merchant solutions, and we have many more coming soon. To show you now how Google Pay works on the web and how you can integrate the Google Pay APIs, I'm going to hand it over to Tony. All right. Thank you, Avnish. Can you switch to my iPhone, please? So I can't really walk very far with this. So I'm going to quickly walk you through what the web experience is going to be like. I'm on a merchant site right now. I'm going to buy something and check out with Google Pay. Now, as you all know, Mother's Day is coming on up, and I haven't bought anything for my mom yet. As a father of two, I normally would try to buy something for my wife first. But every time I try to pick out clothes for her, somehow they always end up getting returned. So I think my mom will appreciate this nice green sweater. So I'm going to go ahead and add it to the cart. I'm going to click Checkout, and up pops a Buy with Google Pay button. I'm going to open this, and this shows our payment sheet. Our payment sheet is what uh, shows the available cards and shipping addresses associated with a particular Google account. If you happen to be logged in into more than one account, you can easily toggle it like so. And as you can see, this is a test account, so there aren't any cards set up. I'm going to go ahead and switch it back so I can easily check out. Now, I'm going to ship this to my mom, so I need to add her shipping address. And sometimes I really have a tough time remembering exactly what my mom's shipping address is. But it's a good thing that Google Pay shows autofill suggestions from the Google Maps API to make even filling out this form super simple. 
Now that I'm done, I'm just going to go ahead and click the Continue button, and now we've just made a purchase. Oh, the same. So Google Pay also remembers the last selected card and shipping address to make your next checkout easier. For example, if I open up、uh, the Google the payment sheet again, you'll now see that my mom's shipping address is now the default. Users will see the same consistent user experience across all major browser platforms, such as Safari, Firefox, and coming soon Microsoft Edge. One other thing to note is that this merchant page, even though we built this just for I/O, we're going to actually release this to the public and to all of you developers, so that you can play around with our APIs without first having to integrate. We built this nifty little developer console. On the top right, I don't know if you noticed, but there was a little bug, little icon, and you can easily manipulate the request. So, for example, if I wanted to not collect shipping address for whatever reason, I can change this to false. And if I, for some reason, can't support all the available card networks, I'll easily remove one like so. And then I'm going to click on the Google Pay button, and now you'll see that the shipping address is no longer available. And my previously selected Visa card is no longer accepted. Can you switch back to the slides, please? So for that、uh, site that you just saw, go to g.co/pay/demo. Now, now that we've walked through what the web experience is like, let me walk you through how easy it is to integrate with the Google Pay API. With these four simple steps, you can enable the same payment experience that I just showed you for all Google users. The four steps are as follows: You're going to download some JavaScript, check if the user is on a supported browser, add the Google Pay button, and then open up our payment sheet. So first things first, you're going to add the script tag to your site. As soon as the script is loaded, you're going to construct this payments client object by passing in an environment field. We support two environment fields. Test and production. In environment test, you don't have to register with us. You can actually play around with the APIs yourself and integrate into your site. In environment test, we do show the users real data. However, whenever they make a selection, we actually return you a fake token. If you're working with,、uh, if you're integrating with one of our supported processors, we'll actually return you a token that you can actually charge on in their test environment. Once you complete the integration and you're ready to handle real payment, come register with us through our self-service portal, and then flip the environment to production. So now, now that you have the payments client constructed, the first API you're going to call is is ready to pay. Is ready to pay returns a simple boolean telling you whether the user is on a supported browser or not. At Google, we really focus on optimizing for conversion. So, rather than you showing yet another payment option. You should only show Google Pay if you think it'll help improve your checkout experience. So if is ready to pay returns false, don't render the Google Pay button. In the near future, we're going to make an enhancement to the is ready to pay API, so you can ask for ready to pay Google users with an existing payment method. Now that you know that the user is ready for、uh, making a payment, you're going to call our second API, create button. Create button returns a simple HTML element that you can append to the DOM of your site. We highly recommend that you should call this API over constructing your own button with static assets, so you can take advantage of all of the improvements that we make to the button over time. For example, in the near future, we're going to automatically translate to the translate the button to the user's locale in order to improve click-through rates. Another thing that we recommend is that you should use our default color, which is black. However, if you happen to have a, a site with a dark theme, we provide an alternate white color that you can use. The minimum that you need to pass to this Create Button API is this on-click event listener function. So once you add the button to your site, you, the user clicks on the button. You're going to have to call. You're going to call our load payment data to actually open up the payment sheet. The first thing you're going to do is construct this payment data request object, which is just a set of payments configuration used for this particular transaction. 
For example, if you need to collect a full billing address because you want to do an AVS check, or to collect a phone number so that you can contact the user, you can easily configure it like so. We highly recommend that you collect as little information as necessary from the user, as we've seen conversion rates tend to drop whenever you ask the user for additional information. One other thing to call out in this request object is this payment method tokenization parameters. This object may have a long name, but all it is is a set of key value pairs that we're going to forward to your processor. So be sure to check your processor's integration guidelines to, make,、uh, to find out what they need from us. Now that you've constructed the, the request object, you're going to pass it to load payment data. That's going to open up a, our payment sheet. The user is going to make a selection, and we're going to return to you a payment data object. The payment data object consi consists of metadata about the user selection so that you can use it to render the order confirmation screen. Also within the payment data object is this payment method token. The payment method token is what you're going to actually use to complete the transaction by passing it to the processor. One thing to note is that security is already baked into our product. Our payments sheet is always opened within a separate pop up window to eliminate、uh, user clickjacking or any other security vulnerabilities. What that means is if the if site happens to be compromised, no malicious content can be overlaid onto our payments sheet. So, it won't confuse the user by obscuring their data. And what that means is a Google user's data is always kept in their control. So, what that means for you as a developer is that when the click event happens, you must call load payment data synchronously. Don't make network requests to the server or any other asynchronous calls in order to avoid having the pop up window blocked by the user's browser. And that's our entire integration. So it's super simple. I'm going to prove to you how simple it is by doing a live implementation from scratch. And all I'm going to do is basically copy and paste from the deck that I've already presented to you to show the entire integration. Can we switch to our, my Pixel book, please? So remember, folks, this is a live implementation. There is a possibility that things may not work. Just in case, I have this cheat sheet that may help me out, but hopefully, I won't need it. All right, so I'm going to do this、uh, implementation on JS Fiddle, which allows me to enter JavaScript on the fly, and then it'll print out onto this result page on the bottom right here. So on the left, we have HTML, JavaScript's in the middle, and CSS on the right. As you can see, we've already downloaded the script tag for pay.js, and we've already constructed the payments client with environment test. So, I'm just going to expand the JavaScript section a little bit just so that you have more room to see. And the first thing we're going to do is call is ready to pay. So, is ready to pay returns a simple Boolean that tells you whether the user is on a supported browser or not. So, I'm going to print out the response of is ready to pay. Response.result. I'm going to update the、uh, site. It's taking a little time to think about it. And try it again. Wow. This is art. <laughs> Let me try that. What's up? Ah, thank you. I changed this based on、uh, someone else's suggestion. <laughs> and now that totally screwed me up. Thank you for catching that. All right, let's、uh, print that out again.、Uh, all right, run it again. Great, the result shows you that we're on a supported browser. The next thing we're going to do is call create button. So, create button returns a simple HTML element that we're going to use to embed into our site. So, I'm going to add the append the button into the site. And then, let me see. I need to fill in this click event listener function, which I'll leave blank for now. Updates again. And here you go. Here's our black Google Pay button. 
Now, by default, as I mentioned, we always use the black color. However, if your site happens to have a dark theme, you can, auto you can easily change the button color to white, like so. And then you'll automatically get this white button. If you're happening to developing on a responsive page, or, on a, or if you just don't have real estate and you need a narrower button, you can easily change the button type to short to get a shorter button. And as I mentioned earlier, you don't need to fill in any of this at all. By default, we will always use the black button and the standard size. So now we're going to call payment data. By, we're going to call load payment data by constructing this payment data request. So I'm going to copy the request object from the, these two slides. And then I'm going to merge them together. And then we're going to fill in the, we're going to call load payment data on the button click event, which I left empty. And then to show that everything is wired together properly, I'm going to fill in this process payment function. So the process payment function is going to take in our payment method token. And the token itself is a JSON object. So I'm going to call uh, json.stringify so that you can see the content. All right, here we go. Button click. I'm going to wait a little bit. Click on the button. Up pops the payment sheet. You make a selection. This always seems to happen. All right, update again. It's going to work the second time. Here we go. And here is the exact token onto the result pane. Thank you. Can we switch back to the slides, please? Thank you. So like I said, super simple. You can complete the entire implementation within a matter of minutes. Oop, wrong button. So I've just shared with you what we've been working on the past few months leading up, to into, leading up until this launch. Now I'm going to share with you a couple of things that we're going to be launching soon to enhance our offering for both users and for you, the developer. Let's start with the user experience first. As I mentioned before, we want to have the same consistent payment experience for all major browser platforms. However, we're going to try and optimize wherever we can. So for the browsers that support native UI, such as Chrome with payment request, we can offer this nice native payment sheet experience on mobile websites. Similar to a pop-up window, this native sheet is impossible to clickjack because the sheet itself is completely separated and detached from the Chrome app itself. But unlike a pop-up window, this payment sheet is a streamlined purchase experience because it allows the user to stay in context of the payment within your site. Soon, we're going to be expanding native support from, from mobile onto the desktop with the payment handler spec. So payment handler works by installing service workers into the user's browser. A service worker is just a JavaScript interface between our payments sheet and the native UI in the browser. When you, you don't really have to understand what a service worker is, nor do you really have to understand what Payment Handler does. Because when you integrate with the Google Pay API, all of this will happen automatically. We're going to do all the heavy lifting for you. So let me walk you through uh, a, a quick preview of what that's going to look like on uh, Chrome desktop. Can you switch me to my Pixel book, please? So as you can see, we're on our merchant page again. This time, when I click on the Google Pay button, up pops our payment sheet within this nice, secure native frame. Very similar to the mobile experience, this thing is not, uh, you cannot clickjack this. Also, because it's embedded nicely into the pop up window, you can tell that it's part of the same sheet. It's native and secure. It's not part of the website because you can see that the native sheet itself is laid, overlaid right on top of my toolbars. So I'm going to click Continue just to show you that it works. And there we go. We just completed payment with Payment Handler. Let's switch back to the slides, please. So as you can see, we're going to always look for new ways to improve our payment experience. Now, for developers, this 
Um, this payment handler example is a great way to showcase of what our mantra is, which is we want to ensure that you only have to integrate with the Google Pay API once. And after that, you're going to be able to continuously benefit from all the improvements that we make without you having to change any parts of your integration. When you integrate on Android, for example, we can make updates through the Google Play services to the, to the 2 billion active Android devices. However, this has always limited us to client releases. Now that we switch to the web, uh, now that we launch on web and we switch to this new JSON interface, we're able to take advantage of the continuous server pushes so that we can bring new features and improvements on a daily basis. And as we look to expand Google Pay to additional surfaces, we want to bring the same consistent, unified integration experience for all developers. So I'm happy to announce that we're going to be extending the same JSON interface and bringing it from the web to Android, AMP, Actions on Google, and more. So let me walk you through a couple of these examples by starting with accelerated mobile pages. Now, we've seen tremendous adoption of AMP from around the world. AMP by design is a restricted set of HTML with limited JavaScript support. By working closely with the AMP team, you'll soon be able to enable Google Pay by using these standard AMP components. All you need to do is drop in the same JSON payload as you would to load payment data, and you'll be able to easily render a Google Pay button within your AMP page. The button itself will ha automatically handle opening the payment sheet and returning you the payment method token. And as we all know, payments is no longer limited to just websites and native apps. If you happen to be collecting payments through Android messages or through the Google Assistant, you'll soon be able to also enable the same Google Pay exper experience with the same JSON interface. Consistent and easy to integrate on all surfaces, we're making Google Pay as easy to integrate everywhere as it is for users to pay everywhere. Now, if you're interested in learning more about how to collect payments on Android messages or through the Google Assistant, go find my buddy Sean, who will be at the Google, Assist uh, Google Assistant Sandbox from 12 to 2 tomorrow. All right, Avnish, take us home. All right. Thank you, Tony. So we've shared a lot of details with you today about how you can add Google Pay to your site to improve conversion. We're really excited to see how you'll integrate. We know there's a lot of information out there. We've sort of nicely organized it into two websites there. There's one for, uh, so you can learn about how Google Pay can improve things for your business overall. So that's g.co slash pay slash business. And if you're ready to start integrating, just dive right into our developer docs there. So Tony and I are also going to be available right after the session in our sandbox that's located at uh, Dome G. So you know, please stop by, ask questions. We'll also have members from the Google Pay team available tomorrow if you can't make it today. So stop by, ask questions, try a few demos out. We also, if you want to learn more about Google Pay, we also have two more sessions tomorrow. Uh, the first is led by our Payments UX team. And it uh, walks through like design principles, how you can optimize conversion using Google Pay. And for learning about how you can enable transactions via the Assistant, you know, check out the session on adding transactional capabilities to your actions uh, tomorrow afternoon. And that's hosted by our Assistant team. Finally, we have a hackathon coming up next month for those of you on the West Coast. It's in San Francisco. It's in June. Uh, you know, so you can sign up at the link there or stop by again at our sandbox if you'd want more information. We host developer events globally. So if you'd like to see an event near you or if you want to stay tuned for upcoming events, you can uh, you know, sign up for your developer documentation, and we'll keep you posted. And that's it. Thank you so much for attending. And enjoy the rest of Google I.O. Nice.
was another great day at Google I.O. 2018, and it isn't over yet. Come back at 8.30 p.m. Pacific time for our live concert with Justice. They'll be debuting their new song, Stop. Tomorrow, we'll be back here at 8.30 a.m. with more sessions, sandbox demos, and special guest interviews. See you back here in one and a half hours. We'll leave now with Justice's new music video, Stop.